Welcome to Web Security. And uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you. Welcome you to the class. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We are going to, um, at least I'm going to try to make it as fun as I can. Uh, so let's get started. The number one thing I want to go over before we get started, okay, and I think let's just get this out of the way so we can just focus on hacking and having fun. Um, it's uh, a little bit of my philosophy uh, that you're going to see uh, as we go through the course, as well as some uh, caveats that I think you should keep in mind as we go through this. The first thing I'm going to do and I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, impress upon you is this information that you're going to be learning in this course can be used for wrong and for good. OK, uh, one of the reasons why I want to teach this course, besides the point, uh, besides the fact that a lot of people have been asking for something like this from from myself. <clears throat> Is that uh, as we as the world becomes more and more prevalent in each of our lives because of the devices we have, mobile, and all these things that are now coming in line with IoT and all that, I think it's more important than ever that we uh, understand at least a little bit about security, even if you're not, you know, trying to go into uh, the field and become uh, a penetration tester or anything like that, right? So even if you're not a pen tester, I think it's really important to understand the web. I think it's really important to understand security because, you know, you're, you're dealing with these systems. And um, if you're not thinking about security, then uh, then you can understand that that's a, that's a risk. But beyond that, uh, I do want to tell you that you are responsible for your own actions. OK, so I'm not going to tell you what you should or should not do with this information. I'm going to assume that you're going to do good things with it. OK, so with that being said, I'm going to push forward. And, uh, and then we're going to just get right started in the course. Now, what are some of my philosophies about the web and uh, about web security uh, and bringing those two things together? You know, I, I think more and more, and uh, I think we saw a lot of it this year and maybe in the previous years because of Facebook and, you know, whatever. There's been a lot of uh, data breaches, at least according to the news, honestly. Um, you know, you can believe what you want. But here's the thing. The web, uh, when you think about it. In the past 20 years, we have um, created a technology that has united more people than ever, right? We have created technology that we can share information like never before. And this is information that no government and uh, crosses, you know, this goes across borders. This really gets to the heart of the matter of uh, what it means to have a free society and I think free information. So I think the first thing we need to remember about the web is what the web is supposed to be for. And the web is, is a place where the whole world can come and connect together, okay? And never before have we been able to do this, okay? So I think we should be very careful uh, in the next few years. And this is for, maybe this is something for you to think about. This is more on the more on philosophy side of things, you know, before we get right into the meat and potatoes of the, of the course. But the web really is a remarkable thing that we have. And I think we should really be careful and take care of it, okay? Because um, it, it's gonna be important in, in the coming years. And, and again, when you really think about it, everything that we've been able to share, you can pretty much go online and find any information that you're looking for, whether it's a video on how to create a house or how to tie a tie or a, a grandparent seeing pictures of their grandchildren. So the web is really an, um, you know, an amazing place. I don't know how else to say it, but I think we should really be careful. And I think to give that control over to any government agency or any other single entity without really thinking about what uh, what we're giving away, which is pretty much our right to communicate, uh, I think that's a huge mistake, okay? So with that being said, let's get started into web security and uh, let's have some fun, okay? Uh, so the first thing, uh, let, let's go over what's gonna be included in the course, what are we gonna cover, and uh, what are some of the things that I wanna get across to you in this course? The first thing is the attacker mindset. Um, and this really goes to the, goes to the matter of uh, if you know most of us are web developers and uh, we're, we're pretty much working with systems or you know, we're, we're having to use code base that's gonna be published on the web. And the, um, the truth is that if you're not thinking about web security uh, when you're running the system, then the system is probably vulnerable, right? So. Over here in this uh, in this class, we're going to be uh, going over some attacks, okay, and then we're also going to be going over some of the defenses uh, for these attacks because in order to defense against the attacks, we also have to talk about them, okay. So we're going to be again going over the attacks, and then we're going to be going over how to defend against them. Uh, we're also going to be uh, going over what are the mindset that attackers are uh, thinking about, and uh, also what are the skills that they have and the skills that you need to have in order to defend against these attacks. Okay, 
Um, now, why is computers, um, why is uh, security hard, especially on the web? Well, the first thing is there's a lot of buggy code out there, right? There's a lot of code that has been published over the years. And uh, if, if you think about how the web was constructed, which is at the beginning, it was just for academics. And it was for academics to be sharing code in universities. It was for to be sharing links, documents. But over the years, we have really created um, something much bigger. And the web has evolved into something where we have videos. We have created full-fledged applications on top of this uh, protocol, which is HTTP. And uh, that wasn't really what it was meant for when it was created, right? So this has created some uh, interesting engineering uh, problems that uh, some people have exploited uh, in order to, um, you know, to take advantage of the system. Now, another reason why security is hard, especially in the web, is that social engineering is very effective, you know, and, uh, and this is true for any type of security, right? So the fact that there is so much information, okay, in one place, uh, the fact that it has become such a large vector, um, meaning that, you know, right now there are more websites uh, by a mile than there are applications, right? So because there's all this information on the web, and at the end of the day, there's people behind this information, uh, pretty much it makes it vulnerable because social engineering and the fact that you can uh, convince people or get information from people and then use that information on the web to gather more information, then that becomes kind of a self-fulfilling, like a cycle that uh, that's pretty tough um, to, to guard against at you know, every scenario. And, you know, the most obvious thing also is that there's a lot of money to be made, right? Information is power. And, um, you know, just the fact that, like I said, the web has pretty much the biggest repository of human knowledge uh, in the world makes it uh, makes it kind of a, a huge target for, uh, for exploiting. And uh, there's a lot of money to be made. So because of this, you know, uh, security is really, really hard, especially when it comes to the web where you don't have control over the full system, right? Uh, now let's let's think about some of the vulnerabilities, right? When you think about the web, what are some of the vulnerabilities that you, you know of? Okay, uh, there's ransomware. Okay, and we've seen a lot of this when it comes to cryptocurrency or systems being locked down, you know, whole websites, and um, you know, having to ask money in order to um, release a database or whatever. Uh, but ransomware, okay, ransomware, it's uh, it's an attack surface that people have exploited, key loggers, right? So if you can deploy some type of code on someone else's machine, you can uh, maybe install a key logger and uh, then, you know, figure out, you know, username, passwords to, um, to their accounts, bank accounts, whatever it is. But, uh, you know, key logger is something else that we've seen on the web. Uh, crypto mining, okay? Uh, and we've seen some of this stuff. Um, I, I think it's not a, as big a deal as people make it seem. But, um, you know, we, we I've seen attacks where people are installing just, um, you know, code that mines cryptocurrency. And, you know, that's, that's an attack surface, I guess. Uh, DDoS, so denial of service. Uh, on the web, like I said, someone can lock down your uh, your computer or your website and um, you know deny you the service of it. If they have your password, if they have your information, then uh, you're pretty much um, you know at the mercy of the of the attacker at that point. Also, there's spam. Uh, so someone can spam your service. Someone can spam your server, uh, and pretty much you know do whatever you know they want to do. And with spam, there's a lot of um, you know attacks that can come from that point of view there's also blackmail um so camera hijacking because the web uh, over the years you know we've tried to evolve it and make it a full-fetched platform um you know developers have been asking and have been wanting to create better applications that are um published on the web and we don't have to so that that way we don't have to go through you know app uh app development um you know kind of processes or uh, be subjective to any platform. And like I said, the web is a place where we can all do this. So developers over time have been asking for uh, more and more low level APIs. So if you've worked with, uh, you know, maybe uh, WebGL or uh, any of the Canvas APIs or maybe the camera API or like WebRTC, uh, all these things that, you know, or even the file system, over time, these things have become more and more um, more and more useful, okay, for building applications. And we have been wanting to 
put these applications online. So these APIs have become available um, and through the browser, we've been able to use it as developers. But then this also opens up a lot of um, attacks that before, you know, again, this is not something that the web was made for. So it, it creates kind of a vulnerability on that end. Also, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of potential for data theft. Uh, I don't know if you've heard where you are, but you know, banks. Some banks have you know have been um, some data breaches have happened in banks, and you know maybe some um, some more personal data uh, for political reasons, or you know anything along those lines can happen on the web or any place that there's a lot of information. And uh, again, as the web becomes more and more um, the the place where applications are hosted. Uh, then this is, I think, you know, just going to keep on happening. And uh, for that reason, that's uh, more of a reason for us to learn a little bit about security and how we can defend against some of these attacks. So let's just go over some of the stats. And again, I just want to, you know, we're just going over some of the overview stuff so we can get kind of an idea and get on the same page about uh, what we're going to be learning about. But here's just some stats of um, number of um, records exposed. And these are just stats I pulled as of uh, the year 2018. Uh, and over the years, you can see that it's been growing, you know. So, you know, more and more attacks are happening. Um, but again, uh, also the um, the records exposed are less or depending on, you know, you can see a spike over here in 2016, 2017. Uh, but again, the, the main idea is that if we're not guarding against these things, then um, they're bound to happen, okay. And as you see in the class, um, there there's a lot of vulnerabilities still. And uh, as we tried to make the web uh, backwards compatible, right? So there's still people that are using Internet Explorer 6, 5, whatever. Uh, and not everybody has computers that are up to date, right? Or as um, devices that are connected online in all parts of the world where everybody doesn't know how to use them, then uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities on that end as well, right? So there is... Um, there is this tension between us wanting to put the information on the web so it's accessible, but at the same time, uh, secure the information so that um, only the right people, right, uh, have access to it. And as we put medical records online, or if we put more of our personal information online, then uh, you know, then this tension continues and uh, it becomes more of an attack vector uh, as time goes on. Okay. So what is web security? Okay. Let's 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 think about this for a minute. Okay. So if you get nothing else from this course, let's think about, um, you know, this is probably the most important uh, thing to understand. The same origin policy. The the thing that the browser and specifically, yeah, specifically the browser, um, you know, when, when you open up a browser and you enter, you know, the internet for, for lack of a better uh, term, the same origin policy uh, and what the browser is trying to do is it's trying to isolate sites from each other while running in the same browser, right? So if you know about processes and tasks, okay, and about how computers work, the browser is just a process, okay? And within this process, there is a lot of uh, tasks, okay? And the task is the thing that allows us to navigate to different URLs, different websites, um, you know, get data from the websites, load data, images, videos, uh, text, whatever, um, and uh, the thing is, when you open different tabs or, um, you know, as, as you have different things open, for example, let's say you have your bank account open and at the same time you have your Facebook account open and maybe Spotify or Netflix or whatever else, uh, you can see how, you know, these apps um, are operating in the same browser window, but they should not have access to each other's information. Okay. Now, this is where attacks can happen. And uh, because, again, you, you're, you're dealing with, um, different secure access levels, right? So one, um, one, um, service, for example, or uh, let's say Facebook, you can upload pictures to Facebook. So Facebook, at, you know, or, or music, or, you know, you can even write text or videos, and this needs access to your computer files. Okay. So on one end, you have, uh, maybe services that need access to your file system. On the other end, you have, uh, um, services that have information about things you watch. Uh, on the other end, you have information about things you listen. Uh, and, and all this information, again, is different access levels to your own uh, computer resources as well as to your own personal resources that you have on your computer. So it's not just the processing uh, resources that your computer has, but also the resources that you have put in your computer, right? So if someone gets access, for example, and can install a script on, uh, on your computer, and through that script, they can execute some type of code. 
uh, which is done through JavaScript, then at that point, you know, you, you can find yourself in a position um, where an attacker has uh, complete access to your to your to your system. Okay, and uh, and again, if you're a web developer and you're creating uh, websites and uh, applications online, then uh, you know this is again this is something that you need to be aware of. Okay, but what that's what essentially web security and that's what we're going to be really talking about in this class how do we create processes that are isolated and at the same time can protect the data integrity within their own processes okay and that's uh that's probably the most important thing to understand out of out of the class so let's uh let's continue here so there there are two types there's a few types of securities right so there's server app security so the the idea is that attackers can run arbitrary http clients and uh, they can send anything to a server. So if we have the server client model, right, where a client can uh, ask for resources from a server, right, and let's say you, let's say you go into Amazon or Netflix or Facebook, right, when you enter your login credentials, then those websites actually send back from the server something that's personalized to you and your own history on the website, and uh, your history will be different than someone else's history. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, any client can send to the server, let's say you upload a picture, okay? And then let's say someone else visits your Facebook account. That picture is going to load for them as well. So now the the whole thing, because we're sharing this information, is someone, you know, has some malicious code on that, um, you know, on that resource, and that resource gets loaded onto other computers, then th those computers can be infected as well, okay? So again, because of this, you want to be careful. Um, and again, that's what makes it even more of a, a security risk on the web because on the web, there's really nothing stopping us from uh, accessing pretty much any resource on the web. And since there is so much, anything can, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of potential for something wrong to happen, okay? There's also client app security. So prevent users from being attacked while using web apps locally. So as applications become more powerful and as computers become more powerful, uh, we are seeing now that you know you can store a whole database on the browser or you can execute um, some pretty powerful even machine learning algorithm algorithms on the client side. Okay, so as computers become more powerful and as we start building more powerful applications and these applications can live on the client fully and operate on the client fully, then uh, these applications have access to client resources. Okay. And if they can then go ahead and communicate online and pass this information around, then uh, again, this opens it up to a lot of uh, you know security um, risk potential. And uh, also, we have to think, how do we protect the user from social engineering? So because we don't have control of what the user might you know, input, what the user might you know, decide to load, and the users might actually have no malicious intent when they're uh, maybe copying some code and or a picture and then just pasting it pasting it on their website if they got that picture from a, uh, from a website that's been infected then that picture can infect many other websites without even the user knowing this and again if you are on a, on a service that you're providing this type of uh, this type of functionality for your users then you need to know these things okay and uh, also we're gonna be talking about how um, you know how uh, ads and pretty much things that can follow you online and uh, have this omnipresence um kind of you know as you as you visit more and more uh websites and as you we want to deliver a more customized okay and a more tailored experience to each user uh this also means that we we need to track behavior across not just different websites but uh, across devices so how do we you know how do we balance that tension between being able to deliver a tailored experience uh, while at the same time protecting the user uh, privacy, okay? And these are the things that, um, you know, that th these are still some of the stuff that's being worked on uh, on the web, but uh, you can see how over time, you know, these things have to be resolved somehow. Uh, you can, you know, opt in to say, you know, I don't want any tracking. I don't even want JavaScript to execute in my browser, but then you lose some of that uh, functionality. And again, that's completely up to you as a personal user, but as a developer, you should definitely know that these things are out there and uh, you should definitely know how to defend against uh, some of these things. So let's continue on. So think about it. Uh, browsers, you know, w when we explain it this way, okay? And again, if we go back to uh, how the web started, which was just simply, I think it was document sharing, 
right? That's what, you know, when Netscape was created and when the World Wide Web was created, it was just academics trying to share uh, documents and information uh, from universities and things like that, okay? Over time, it has evolved, but now we have put browsers in this position where they're trying to run arbitrary code, right? So it's JavaScript and we have uh, a JavaScript runtime on every single device, right? So everything that can <laughs> pretty much uh, load a browser has a JavaScript um, runtime, okay? So right there on every single browser, there is a server running, okay? And this server can execute uh, any arbitrary code, okay? Uh, just like it would on any other server. Okay, and as again, as the browsers evolve and as we get access to more and more low level APIs, then we have more and more access to um, really low level resources, right? So it's not just resources across the internet, we also have resources right there sitting on your computer, okay? And, uh, and again, this creates a huge, 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 um, how can I say, uh, this creates a huge, um, risk uh, for anyone developing applications or any uh, any user using applications themselves if they don't know what they're doing okay so the web at this point has this extremely ambiguous goal to run any untrusted code securely on any device right so you being the app developer you can't control what the user essentially uh the runtime on their machine you can't control what they do even when they load your website even when they, and that's important for you to understand right so even when someone loads your own website on their browser because they have a javascript runtime running then they can do essentially anything to your website and we're going to be you know we're going to be looking at some of those examples on cross-site scripting or injecting uh injecting code but uh that's pretty much the you know that's pretty much what we're dealing with here okay when we're talking about the web and running random, you know, any type of code on on any machine, okay? Uh, and we also have, on top of that, this idea of different sites interacting in the same tab. So let's say you have an ad uh, company. So let's say you go to like Facebook or something, right? Or any other co company. And then on the side, you see some ads running. Well, those ads are actually uh, that ad agency injected a piece of code on that website uh to run and again if, if that and those two sites are two completely different sites that are you know one is loading resources from somewhere else and then the other side is loading resources from another place and these two resources are making up the whole site but the thing is that you know that you want to think about is that these two websites are running code from completely different places and you don't always have control of the code that's running Right, so that's the that's the idea, right? And that that kind of gives us a, a perspective of what we're dealing with. Um, again, as uh, the web evolves more and more, we have more and more access to low-level features. And low-level features, I mean hardware access. So as computers become more and more um, powerful, uh, and then mobile devices, and you know the fact that users can be mobile and uh, have these really powerful computers, kind of in the pockets of everyone, and Wi-Fi networks. And all these things, you know, come together to create kind of a perfect storm for uh, for hackers and uh, and people that want to uh, get access to information without permission, right? So that's um, that's something that you have to be thinking about, okay? While at the same time, we have this desire as developers to to create the best experience for our users, right? So again, we we get back to this uh, notion of the tension between creating a really great experience for the user while at the same time preserving the user integrity uh, for their information and uh, and making sure their applications do not cross those boundaries between you know protecting our users from uh, from anything that they themselves might do or someone else might do on their uh, on their behalf, right? So. So all these things, you know, when, when the web uh, was being developed, none of these things were being thought of. And uh, and we're going to see some of those things as we get into uh, the course that we can see that some of these APIs that we, we think about on the web are, are so outdated. But because we want to we, we want to make sure that we're not breaking any of the older websites that are still using a lot of this code. But at the same time, we want to create new APIs that um, that give us more access in a more secure way. Uh, the web is kind of left in this limbo state of um, having really old uh, buggy code that has vulnerabilities, but we can't change. While at the same time, uh, websites that are trying to you know push the boundaries of what's possible on the web, while um, you know not um, 
not crossing any boundaries. So again, it, it's really an interesting um, scenario that we find ourselves when it comes to the web and uh, to security. So let's uh, the browser. Uh, when we think about the browsers, right, and uh, the task that they're trying to provide is a really, really difficult thing to do, right? Because even malicious sites, okay, any website, even good and bad websites, here's everything that uh, that we have allowed them to do now, right? They can download content from anywhere. So anyone can pretty much write any website on the URL and, uh, and then you're downloading content, right? The fact that they're rendering uh, even simple text from somewhere else, uh, those resources are being rendered and, and and that code is being executed on your machine, okay? And on every user machine. So that's pretty much, um, you know, that's just the way the web works, right? That's just the way JavaScript works. So that's just that's just kind of what we're working with, okay? Uh, we can also spawn worker processes. So we can, you know, and with web services and uh, service workers, now we can have code that's running on the background, right? And using even more resources that uh, the user is even less aware of, right? So if you have these websites and on mobile, it's even more, you know, even more of a of an issue because some of these websites even know where you are in the world at all times, right? They have your information, they have everything about you, right? So you can literally be in at the pool or at the beach in some remote island. Okay, and just by the mere fact that you're connected to the internet, someone else can know this about you, right? And if they have your information or your user's information, then again, you can just see how this is, um, you know, again, I honestly, I, one thing I want to make sure that we don't do is we, we don't, we do not want to create this fear mindset. Okay. We're just trying to go over what the web is. Okay. And these are just the facts. This is just, it, these are great things that we all want because we all want to deliver that great experience. But again, this great experience opens us up to these um, these things that could happen, right? So again, you can opt out, you know, live off the grid and uh, go back to TP HUDs, or you can decide to live, you know, in this world. And and again, it's only going to keep moving forward. And I think we can get a great experience, but you know, part of this great experience comes with uh with a little understanding of uh, what we're dealing with. Okay. Also, uh, because sites can cross communicate, uh. Any website can pretty much open up any sockets to a server and keep that socket open, right? So that connection can stay open for a, a, a long, long time, you know, essentially forever. If uh, if a site really gets, um, if, a, if an attacker really gets access to uh, a client's website or a user's website, and uh, once, you know, the information that flows from there, or let's say someone um, logs into uh, a public Wi-Fi, but then that Wi-Fi is actually um, an attacker, uh, spoofing some Wi-Fi or masking some uh, some uh, some Wi-Fi, then all the information that goes from you know your machine to to another machine, all that communication can be intercepted, and uh, and someone can actually steal this information. And you know we've we've seen a lot of this stuff happen with uh, not just attackers, but sometimes the attackers are people that you don't even expect, right? The governments have done this. Uh, we've seen this with uh, the Snowden files. We've seen this with the Julian Assange stuff. And again, you know, most people are unaware of how this happens. But um, this is just some of the stuff that could happen, right? Uh, this also the web. Um, we can display media in huge number of formats. So, you know, you can open up PDF formats. You can open up a uh, video MP4s. You can open up MP3s. You can display and uh, play HTML. So there's a lot of protocols that the web has to um, pretty much um, account for. Okay. Uh, again, you can run custom code on the graphics processing unit, so someone can really get access and and start controlling the hardware and the software that your your computer runs on, right? And they can essentially run your computer out of RAM, out of um, you know, they can do if they have access and it's a malicious attack, they can pretty much control your whole system. And uh, at that point, you know, if someone doesn't know how to defend against this, then you're at the mercy of, uh, of that person. Uh, and you can, again, this is, um, you know, this is just something to know, but you can also save and read data from file systems. So yeah, if someone can access your database or, uh, you know, private files in your computer, if they gain access, uh, yeah, this, this is something that could happen and you should be aware of. So again, these are some of the stuff that we're going to be covering in the course. And uh, it's important for you to understand just a little bit of uh, what we're going to be on, um, of, you know, the stuff we're dealing with when we're dealing with web security. So essentially, we, we come to this uh, fork in the road where we have different visions of what the web 
was intended for and what we actually gone ahead and done with the web, which is again completely unintended, but because it's on um, it has been such a great um platform for uh, delivering information over the years, I think, um, you know, this has been just a natural progression of things. And little by little, we have come to understand, you know, some of the stuff that um, that's good and some of the stuff that's not so good. So, again, at the beginning, the web, all it was intended for was simple document viewing, right? It was just meant for uh, text file and sending information. You know, you have uh, an, a, uh, an IP address. And if someone, you know, before even search engines, if you didn't know someone's IP address or where a resource was at, um, you know, a website essentially, then you just didn't get there. But now because of search engines, SEO and all these things, you know, things have become a lot more uh, accessible, uh, you know, to the point that we have these, from, we've gone from simple document viewing to powerful application platforms, okay? So the web today is a completely different um, thing than, than it was at the beginning, okay? so. The third goal of this course is learn how to architect secure systems, okay? So now that we know what we're dealing with, okay? And now that we know a little bit of what we're going to be, um, what, what we need to be tackling in order to understand what web security and how to really, you know, defend against all these things, um, this is how I'm planning to structure the course, okay? So the part one is browser security model and the same origin policy. So in the part one of the course, we're going to talk about how the browser, okay, is structured, how the web, uh, what what actually is the browser, how the browser functions, and the security model that was implemented on the browsers and pretty much all browsers. So the standards that the, um, that the specs have um, have put out there for uh, for the browsers to implement. Okay, and we're also going to be talking about the same origin policy and why it's important uh, when it comes to web security to follow this policy, and also how we can bypass the policy and how someone can attack this policy for cross-site scripting or injection attacks. Or uh, any any of the other attacks that we're going to be covering. Part two is client security. Okay, attacks and defenses. So we're going to be talking about how to secure uh, data as data is being uploaded from the client and being uploaded to to somewhere online. Okay, and then how is this played on on some other end? So again, if this data it's coming from the client computer or it's or, or some code is running. Okay. On, on a client's uh, on a client's machine, how can that client be protected? Especially if you're the web developer that's uh, delivering the the service or the experience um, the, of that client. On part three of the of the class, we're going to be talking about server security. Uh, and again, we're going to be covering the attacks first and foremost. I'm going to be showing you what are going to be some of the attacks that someone can do. Okay, and then we're going to be going over some of the defenses uh, to those attacks. And again, we're going to be covering uh, some of the specs and some of the technology that have been coming online, uh, such as authentication and TLS, also HTTPS, and uh, um, a little bit into uh, cryptography and how you can um, secure not just the client, but also when someone is uh, making a request on, uh, on your server, that um that you know that you can uh, guard against some of the attacks that can happen on the server side, and then uh, the last part we're gonna be also and and this actually covers part one, uh, two and three. Uh, we're going to be you know as we cover the attacks and the defenses, we're gonna be covering how to write secure code. Okay, so in the attacks, we're gonna be actually going over live code, and I'm gonna show you some of how how like you know how to um take advantage of vulnerable systems. And then we're going to be covering how to defend against these vulnerable systems so that you can actually go ahead and, uh, and defend them for yourselves. And, um, and you can actually go help if you're interested in, uh, in the more depth and actually becoming a pen tester, how you can, uh, you know, how you can become and do this yourself and actually, um, make sure that no system is vulnerable and where to look for these vulnerabilities yourself. So the first thing, so now that we've covered, uh, essentially, a little bit about the web, kind of what the web was intended for and uh, what it has evolved into. Let's go into the the three main pieces of uh, what we're going to be dealing with when we come into web security and uh, what are going to be these things and why these things are important to, uh, to understand. So the first thing is HTML. And again, I know this might be a review for some of you. And if it is, I'm sorry. It's just that you might have never heard of it from a security standpoint. And I think it will be uh, enlightening for you to uh, 
to listen to this part of the course, uh, even if it seems like a review. So again, I, I was able to pull out this, uh, pull up this, um, this image from uh, back in the day. This was Netscape, and uh, I think this this kind of gives us an idea, right? Because sometimes we we tend to forget exactly where the web started. But uh, just just remember this, okay? This is really what browsers were were like, okay? And uh, all they had was simple buttons or links, you know, that link to places and uh, and and just some like text and image. That's all. That's all you could do at the beginning in the web, right? Uh, now it has evolved into a lot different. You know, now we can um, pretty much even have um, 3D experiences with uh, things like Oculus and uh, and Quest. So the web has evolved from this to imagine having a full immersive experience like 3D uh, personal computers, right? So I don't think anybody had that in mind when they created Netscape, okay? Uh, and maybe some people did, but you know, I don't think we we could we could have understood at that point the speed at which all that was going to come, and I think it's only going to progress even faster as we move forward, okay? So again, HTML uh, is really made up of uh, th these tags that um that the browser needs to understand, uh, interpret, and then process and render, okay? And that's where, you know, the code has to be executed at uh, on the client side. So when uh, when someone, you know, requests some resources from the internet, uh, this is pretty much what gets uh, sent back to them from a server. And uh, this is, you know, then the server goes ahead and um, gets this HTML, okay? And renders it to the browser. So Let's um, you know, from there, uh, what we understand is uh, it, it brings us to this natural conclusion is how do we access things on the web? Okay, and uh, we access them through these things called uniform resource locators. Okay, and these are URLs, and the URLs are made up of a, a few pieces. Okay, and let's go over each piece now so that we understand um later on when we are accessing resources from the internet how these resources come um how how we can access them and then how the web actually goes ahead and renders them and processes them and interprets them. So the first piece is the HTTP or the S or any other protocol that you might be using. So there are different types of protocols. Uh, in this class, we're gonna be talking about HTTP because uh, that's you know the, the main protocol for the web. And um, this goes over the TCP uh, protocol, but uh, it's pretty much built, you know, it's hypertext uh, protocol, which is again, if we look back to this uh, to the screen, this is pretty much it, right? So it's uh, it's uh, the protocol that displays um, images, uh, videos, text, that that type of thing, right? So like that's what the web understands. And if you give it this document uh, in this form, uh, then it will render it in a way. All the browsers have um, implemented the standards in order to render uh, the web the way that we uh, that we see it today. Then the next thing is the host name. So the host name is uh, pretty much um, because we have a DNS in the middle and uh, we have these uh, really simple domain names. Later on, what happens behind the scenes, and we'll go over this in future courses, is that uh, it gets um, translated into an IP address. But that's pretty much what the host name is. It's uh, where this resource that you're trying to access lives, right? And uh, the host name is pretty much a really simple way for people to pass around uh, information and say, hey, you know, here's where this resource that you you want to get is at, right? It's, in this case, we're using example.com, but you can just imagine facebook.com or any other thing. Um, that's pretty much what we're saying when we're typing in the whole thing. Then the next thing, which is usually excluded from uh, from most uh, from when we type in a URL, but it's always included implicitly when the actual search happens, which is the port number. And uh, for most resources online, it's port 80, uh, if you're going through uh, the regular you know, uh, URL. But uh, again, a port number is just uh, where on the server does the resource lives. And um, you know, again, I think, um, well, for, for most things online, it's port 80 is the, the port that, uh, that things live on. Uh, then after that, anything that comes after the host name and the port, uh, followed by a slash, that whole part becomes the path, right? So again, although things live on that host name, we can actually um, link to different pieces of that host name. So different parts of that host name, uh, if we want to access a certain resource, that's not just the main homepage, right? Uh, and that's the path, right? And, and again, most of these things are uh, done 
implicitly. So if you visit the homepage and you don't you don't include the path, well then the path is included for you by just uh, a forward slash and nothing after it, right? And that's just the path that um uh, that you have access. So that would be the homepage or the index page. Then uh, anything followed by a question mark is the query. So this is one way to pass around information uh, from the client to the server. And we'll see when we uh, submit forms and things like that. Forms take advantage of this aspect of the of the URL. And uh, they can pass around, again, so sometimes it's something very simple like a user and a year. Sometimes it's uh, the way we want to display the information. So if we're trying to sort it, descending or ascending, we might pass the stuff within the URL so that we can then access it in a in a meaningful way from, from the server side. And then um, anything followed by a hashtag, uh, this is called anchor tag. So because, and again, this can be used in videos, but also in websites. When uh, when you want to bring a user to a specific point within a a, um, a URL, right? So within a, a, an HTML document, if you want to, let's say, bring a user to a certain piece of that document, maybe halfway through or something, then uh, you can create an anchor tag and uh, include it in the URL. And then what the URL will do is it will bring that person uh, specifically to that point in the document that you specified. Okay. So, and this is pretty much how all URLs are constructed. Uh, some of them have all these pieces. Some of them have just some of the pieces. So every, everything pretty much needs to include the protocol, the host name, the port and a path. Okay. And uh, again, some of these things are included implicitly. So just because you didn't include the port or a protocol uh, behind the scenes, it still gets included. Uh, but that's pretty much what everything needs. And then again, this is what a full uniform resource locator looks like. And this is how everything on the, uh, on the web is accessed. Okay. So now that's an important thing to uh, keep in mind. Um, you know, and this, you know, from this point, then we get to this point, which is uh, what gets returned from the server. And again, as long as this, and I guess uh, at the begin at the top level, it gets specified as a doc type HTML. So that way that the browser knows, hey, you know, this is something that I can render. I understand this thing, and then the uh, the browser parses uh, this information, and um, and again, and then it shows it and displays it to the user. Um, so pretty much, uh, an HTML document is made up of a lot of tags that uh, that the specs, you know, so the committees have um, gone ahead. And they've specified these tags that um that all browsers pretty much um follow, um and you know that's pretty much what every single HTML document is made up of, right? Images tags, video tags, audio tags, canvas tags, link tags, style tags. Which again, these are going to be pretty important because this is how uh pretty much code is executed on the client side. So this is how uh JavaScript can be executed with uh link tags or uh, script tags. Um, this is how we can load in uh, CSS tags. This is how we can load in image tags, and uh, we can, we're going to be looking at how these uh, these tags can become um, vectors for uh, for attacks. Okay, and uh, how they can be exploited to run code that was not intended to be run, or uh, code that accesses uh, things or resources that was not intended to be accessed. Okay, and uh, but pretty much that's pretty much how um, how the document is uh, is made up. Right, so every HTML document is made up of tags, and um, the tags are again, these are just resources. So every single video will have a source, an audio uh, file will have a source. Canvas uh, won't have a source, but it'll access resources within you know the machine. An image tag will have a source, a link tag will have a source, a style tag will have a source, a script tag will have a source, or it will be inlined in uh, in the actual document. So with these tags, for example, a, uh, we can include CSS. This can be external, so a link tag that uh, that has a reference uh, through an href uh, means that you can load in external files into this um, into any website, right? So not you know there is like yeah there are some things that could happen through CSS as a vector tag, but uh, most of the attacks, uh, most of the things that um that you will be encountering, and um, we're going to be covering in the in the course will be through JavaScript because JavaScript again is that runtime, uh, that execution runtime that's on every single device, uh, pretty much anywhere in the world, right? So because every device has a browser um, and every browser um, can run JavaScript, then that's, uh, that's this is pretty much the, the largest uh, vector for, for attacks, okay? And uh, we can see how JavaScript can modify the HTML document. Uh, we can also load JavaScript externally or we can inline it as you see uh, down here in the script, uh, within the script tags, okay? But um, 
you know, honestly, JavaScript is a lot of fun. Okay, so yes, we are going to be covering how JavaScript. A lot of people like to rag on it. A lot of people like to talk smack about JavaScript. But again, remember, JavaScript is the language of the web, right? So JavaScript is pretty much the number one language that's executed around the world. So it's really, really important to understand JavaScript. And uh, because of this, uh, and because a lot of people still don't understand JavaScript completely and it's misunderstood, and because it was a language that was written, I think, in 10 days when it was written, it does have uh, some things that are uh, that make it maybe not the best language when it comes to security. Uh, maybe it's not like Haskell or something like that that's, you know, a lot more thought of uh, and super mathematical and it's dynamic and, you know, you can pass functions around as closure and all these things. So there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in JavaScript, but it's a fun language. It's flexible. It gives us immediate feedback. It's also pre-installed on every device in the world. So again, it gives us the most flexibility and uh, it gives us, it gives our applications the best chance of, uh, of living uh, without going through any app development process, right? So you don't have to go through uh, a marketplace. You don't have to, you know, ask permission. You can pretty much every single browser that's already installed can already uh, run, run JavaScript. And because of this, um, pretty much any website that we can create, uh, we can run, just host it online and it'll run on any machine. And that's an incredible thing, right? That it really is. When you think about it, that is uh, one of the most uh, amazing things that we have ever created. And that's one of the things that I think we should protect. But again, it does open us up to uh, some uh, risk vulnerabilities. But, uh, you know, again, some, just something that we have to deal with and just something to note. Uh, it, it's also um, uh, dev environment is pre-installed too. So it's easy to start writing code. So you, we're going to see uh, we have an inspector built right into every single browser. Uh, and because of this, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that we cannot, we definitely cannot control what the users do, even when they load one of our websites into their, uh, into their machine, because at that point they have control of the website and they can pretty much inject anything they want or, um, or send something to our server or, you know, any of these things that we have no control over. So once we have uh, rendered on the, on the client's machine, some code, then at that point, they pretty much have access uh, and it's running on their machine. So they also have access to a runtime. And again, this um, they can send some information to our server and our server has to know how to handle all these things. So Node.js, uh, on the other hand, is, uh, is JavaScript that runs on the, on the command line. Okay, so not just does JavaScript run on the client side, so not just is it installed on every single browser. Uh, as of a few years ago, uh, you know, on the scene, and now it's it's been a while already. But uh, then came Node.js, and Node.js pretty much is uh, JavaScript in the command line. So this is a uh, backend language, uh, backend um, yeah, language, kind of uh, like a server side language, like Ruby or Python. On uh, not that again, I'm comparing JavaScript to any of those languages, but just again, just to uh, illustrate the 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 concept is that uh, JavaScript is um, you know, a language that runs both on the client and on the server, right? So it's 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 probably the one of the few it's the only language right that the browser understands and um and it's also a language that can run on the back on, on the back end right so this because of node.js uh this brought us a uh, built-in functionality for the file system so through node and um, because of the server side language uh, we have access to again uh the file system we have access to http dns oh we can open up sockets we have a uh, crypto access, we have pretty much access to the to the full machine, right? So we have access to the full server uh, through Node.js. And again, this makes JavaScript, again, very, very powerful. Uh, and the fact that it's running on every machine, again, just all the more powerful. And uh, and again, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I personally love JavaScript, so I'm a little biased, but you know, this is uh, what we're going to be covering. So I, I hope you're strapped in because it's going to be fun. So stuff that belongs in scripting languages but not in the browser is what we can do with Node.js. And for this, uh, Node.js is uh, it's a great language. And I think um, everyone will do uh, well to uh, to learn it. And we have a few courses. Uh, so you can, uh, if you want to learn a bit more about Node.js, then check out some of our other courses. Uh, also, Node.js added a module system. So we can, just like we did in the browser, we can um, load resources externally. Um, we can also execute binaries uh, through Node.js. Um, so again, th this just made JavaScript even better. Uh, the fact that we can write it on the client and on the, um, and on the backend. And then, um, you know, when we talk about JavaScript, 
because it runs on the client, it runs on the server, and uh, and pretty much anyone can write a package and then you know publish it, and then some other uh, some other server can load this package externally, and you know you all you you don't always have control of who's loading the resources, who's publishing it. Uh, and who's running the code or where it's running, what context. So because all these things are sort of arbitrary and it's such a large vector space, um, JavaScript has a lot of APIs that uh, we're going to be covering in the course. But these are the things that, you know, make it kind of um, a, a, a great space to do some hacking. OK, so the JavaScript APIs can come from a few places. For example, they come from the JavaScript language specs. So this is what ECMAScript and the TC39 committee actually focuses on. And uh, you can read up about any of the specs from JavaScript and the language itself. Um, but then also when we execute JavaScript on the browser, then that comes with the whole set of APIs that are just browser uh, contextualized, right? So when anytime, so if you use jQuery or uh, React, then that's JavaScript on the browser side. And then that JavaScript has access to uh, things that's not necessarily accessible through the server. So for example, we have access to uh, mouse events, forms, uh submissions and fetching apis and all these things that are not you know are just um part of the dom but not necessarily part of the server right and then when we go to node.js we have things that are part of the server but not part of the dom uh like for example creating servers uh we can you know create uh, an http client we can uh access the file system we can you know do all these things that are part of uh server side languages but not part of our client side privileges. Uh, and examples of this are array. So an array um, is something we can use on both the client and the server. Uh, Document.create element. So an array is part of just the part of the JavaScript language itself, right? So that's part of uh, the language as a whole. But then we have things like document.create element. That's just part of the DOM API, right? But then we have fs the read file, and that's something we can do on the server side, but that's not something we can do on the um, on the client side, at least not explicitly. There are ways around this, uh, but again, we we there, we we have to exploit a, a piece of JavaScript that wasn't specifically made for that. And that's again, that is what we're going to be covering in this course. And we're going to be covering how to attack those vectors and then how to defend against those attacks. Um, and again, you know, these are some just some, some of the older browser APIs. And I want to end this uh, part of the section here, uh, and then we're going to be actually going over uh, and getting started on some of the attacks uh, on the browser side. So window that open, uh, we can create pop-up windows. We can um, pretty much create things that are, for example, link. We can submit, uh, move the windows around. We can resize the windows. We can um, you, we can share uh, in real time through web, uh, WebRTC uh, information. We can even you know get camera access, microphone access. I mean, it's really the wild west when it comes to JavaScript, and in my opinion, it's a lot of fun, but it's also uh, very risky and uh, does open uh, people up to a lot of risk if they don't know what they're doing. Um, on you know, and again, because JavaScript is in every single device, you can kind of get an idea uh, where we're gonna be uh, dealing with. So, anyways, uh, I hope you're excited about what we're about to get uh, about the journey we're about to take. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, so again, if you need to go over this, uh, introduction again, I know we covered a lot, uh, we're going to be going, uh, kind of at a fast pace, but I want to uh, cover a lot in this course so that, you know, you feel by the end of it that you know how to, you understand the theory behind what we're talking about. You understand the practice. So how to, you know, and then you understand the attacks and the defenses that I want to teach you. So that way you can actually go ahead and implement it. You can go ahead and get a job if you need to on uh, as a pen tester, or if you want after this class, then you can take a more in-depth class into uh, web security or just security as a whole. And, uh, and you know, I just hope it uh, helps you out. Okay. So anyways, I'm excited and uh, I'll see you in the next class. Okay. Let's go over a few attacks uh, before we get into it, just so you can see how uh, dangerous this can be and how you can, uh, or someone, uh, can perform some of this and then how you can defend against it. Now the first one uh, that we want to cover is the session hijacking attack. Okay. Now I'm over here in uh, one of the browsers logged in to Netflix. Okay. And again, this is just a regular Netflix. And what the attack is going to try to do is it's going to 
uh, show what happens if someone gets uh, access to uh, a user session and how they can take over their identity on the web. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and open up the, um, the console and then we're going to go over to the application um, server, the application tab on our server and then we are going to, so again, remember on the left side, we're logged in. On the right side, we are on an incognito window. Okay, so we're definitely not logged in and uh, it has nothing to do with, um, with, with the account on the left side. But what we're gonna do is over here, we're gonna come and then we're gonna grab these two, uh, these two cookies that Netflix has set. And, um, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to just copy them over into uh, this other Netflix account. And again, let me just refresh this account so you can see that I am not logged in, right? So although we have these two cookies, this is not an actual valid, uh, this is not a logged in account, whereas on the left side, we are logged in. So I'm going to go ahead and just grab these two cookies, okay? And then I'm going to paste it. I'm going to paste the first one, and then I'm going to paste the second one, okay? Perfect. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to refresh this page on the right side, and let's see what happens. So as you can see, now on the right side, okay, without actually knowing what this user's, uh, let me just pause this, without actually knowing what the user on the left's uh, login info is, okay, all, all we had access to was their cookies. And uh, on the right side, if someone uh, were to inject some malicious code, and if someone were to pass the, this information around into their server or get their hands on it, then you can see how they can, you know, in this example, we showed something pretty benign, which is just logging into a, um, to a Netflix account. But you can imagine how this can be used to either log in into your Gmail or a bank account or even some uh, some company information. So again, these are uh, this is what happens with uh, with session hijacking attacks. And in the in this course now, in uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering the defenses and how this attack actually takes place. Now I want to show you another attack just so you, it, I, I really want to drive home the importance of uh, protecting you know not just your identity online but your users' identities online if you're a developer. So over here. Uh, we're going to do something very similar. So on the left hand side, I'm going to make this window just a little bigger. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to bring this down. So on this page, okay, we have two, two servers running. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you, uh, the code. Uh, one is the victim server and then the other one's the attacker server. And what we're going to, uh, show is we're going to demo, um, imagine if on one side we had a secure bank, you know, this, imagine this was a bank. And on the right side, we have uh, an attacker that was able to um, to implement uh, not just a session hijacking account, but through through the cookies, they're able to post a form uh, to the server, to the victim server. And because the victim is logged in on one uh, or their accounts, then they can perform actions on behalf of the user. So let's see how that works. So, and again, one of the things we want to um, we want to make sure that uh, that we're looking at is. Over here, we're, we're actually logged in to two servers, okay? So this is a cross-site scripting attack, and we're going to cover this more in detail in the, um, in the class. But, uh, you know, you don't have to be logged in into the same server at all. So these are, imagine these are two completely different servers, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, and uh, what we're going to do, it's over here, we're going to log in as if we were a, uh, a user of this bank, okay? And we can see that, uh, that again, just like a normal bank, uh, you, you have your balance and then you have this form over here that you can transfer money to someone else. Okay. Now the attacker, what they've done is they have actually, um, imagine if someone gave you a link or, uh, if so someone was able to get you to click on, on a link that gets you to a different website. Now, once you're on that different website, uh, imagine that this form was actually hidden. Okay. Now we're, we're showing it not hidden over here to showcase the example but this will be on a different site and uh, the user wouldn't even know that this would be actually happening. And with JavaScript, we can actually um, automate this whole process. So over here, we have a client that's logged in or at some point they're logged in. So they have a session running with, uh, within their bank. Okay. And now they've, you know, they've, they've kind of clicked away from that bank and now they're onto another site. And on that site that, uh, that the attacker sent, uh, that the attacker has hidden this form. Okay. And uh, what they're going to do is we're going to perform the attack just so you can see how, uh, how it happens. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer $500 to another. Let's say in, the, in this case, uh, we're logged in to, um, we're going to use 
the the Alice user cookies to send uh, five hundred dollars to Bob. Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and click on transfer. Okay, and again, imagine if this was hidden. So this is not something that's actually taking place with the user knowing. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to refresh the actual bank website. So next time Alex comes and uh, logs into their account, they're gonna see that their balance is zero. And what we've done is that we have actually, okay, and if we, we check over here on the network tab, we have actually performed an attack and I'm gonna refresh it, okay? And because this person, at a previous time, they were logged in into the, let me go over here and then log in into the network tab. So you can see, um, so yeah, over here in the network tab. So because this website, and uh, actually what we want to do is uh, just click on the application tab just so we can see the cookies, and then over here as well, okay? So because this attacker has access to this session ID, okay, and then the session ID is not protected in any way, anytime someone on any other website, okay, as long as the session ID is, uh, is valid, okay, and the attacker, if we look over here at the attacker form, okay, we can see that they're making a request, a post request to this uh, local host 4000, which is where the bank website is, uh, is hosted. Okay. Now, when they make the request, since this person was actually at some point, and this request, again, can come from any website. You don't have to be logged in. It doesn't even have to be from the same bank account. This is just the way the web works, okay, and how cookies work. And what I'm going to show you is how you can defend against this attack. But because of this, okay, any request, okay, that gets made to this server over here, okay, what the website is going to do and what the, um, what the client is going to do is it's going to include any of the cookies that are uh, on that machine. And in this case, right, because this, uh, this although it's the same user and we have the, this cookie, but we're on a different website, then when, when we actually go ahead and make the transfer amount, okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and see that the transfer got made. And uh, not just the transfer get made, but included with the transfer, okay, we have actually gone ahead and included the session cookie, okay, even though over here we, we don't have any access to it, okay, because we're on a different domain, it got included because at some point that user also had uh, logged in into their bank account. So again, these are two ways that uh, session hacking can happen, and I wanted to go over the, the attacks, and now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go ahead and set up the attack, see how it works, and see why it works, and how we can defend against it. Okay, now that we have gone over the session hack, um, okay, now that we've gone over the session hijacking attack, what we want to do is we want to understand how did that attack happen, what about the web makes it vulnerable, and how we can defend against that attack. So, what's the first thing, okay, when, when we talk about the web, what exactly happens when you type in a URL, okay, and that's the first thing we need to understand, and that happens at the DNS, at the DNS level. Okay, so the domain name system, and that's what the DNS is, okay? So anytime that uh, we're in our computer and we're typing a URL on the, um, on the URL um, search to, uh, input, okay? So if you go to Google and you type in a URL or something like that, what's going to happen is a few things are going to happen. Uh, every URL that you type in gets forwarded, okay, or gets uh, translated into an actual IP address, okay? But at first, we don't know what that IP address is. So let's say you're going to example.com, okay? So the DNS resolver, which is usually issued to you by your ISP or uh, a router or something like that, uh, this DNS resolver, it's recursive. And the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, from your computer, you're gonna say, I'm gonna, I want access to example.com. So you're gonna go from the one to the seven over here, okay? But the first thing is the DNS resolver doesn't actually uh, is not in control or doesn't know what that IP address is. So it's like, okay, I see that you want to go to example.com, but first I need to know where that's located. And I, I don't know where that's located. So the, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a root server. And the root server is going to come back and tell you, uh, is like, I, I don't really know where that is either. Okay. So what is, uh, what's the root server? Uh, what's their functionality? Well, the root server's functionality is to a sub-recursive resolver's query, which includes a domain name. Okay. And the name servers respond by directing recursive resolver to the TLD server. So what the recursive server is doing at this point, the root server is going to say, hey, I can see that you're trying to access a .com domain or a .net or .edu or whatever. And it's going to tell you, why don't you go and ask the TLD server? Okay, so it's going to send you and going to redirect your DNS resolver to a TLD server. Now, the function of a TLD server 
is to maintain information for all the domain names that share a common domain extension. So a .com or a .net or whatever comes. Um, so it's going to start from the right to the left. Okay. So once we get issued um, from the TLD server, it's going to tell us, okay, you got the .com. Okay. Uh, but I still don't know that uh, where example.com is. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and send you to an authoritative name server. And the authoritative domain server is down that we have the TLD extension and that we have um, taken that IP, okay, where this is going to be located. Now we have everything we need in order to ask the authoritative domain server what the IP address of this specific um, URL that we're trying to access is. And the authoritative domain server contains information about a specific domain name it serves, right? So it can provide a recursive resolver with the IP address for that server found on the DNS record. Now, if a domain has a CNAME record, it will provide the recursive resolver with an alias domain, at which point the recursive resolver will have to perform the whole DNS lookup to, uh, to procure a record from the authoritative name server. So all this really means is at this point, now that we have the authoritative domain server, in this case, example.com, is gonna come back to us and say, hey, I'm example.com, I'm the authoritative name server, and I actually know what the IP address of uh, example.com is. So now we can actually translate that, uh, that the way it was written, which is human readable, right? Example.com into the 1.1.1.1 IP address that we're looking for. So essentially what happens when you type a URL so pre and press enter just to recap is that the client has the DNS recursive resolver to look up a host name, okay? That DNS recursive resolver sends a DNS query to a root name server, okay? Now the root name server responds with the IP address of the TLD name server, okay? The DNS recursive resolver sends DNS query to TLD name server, okay? So now that we have the root name server, okay? Which again, keeps a record of all the TLD name servers. And then after that, the TLD name server is gonna send us to a DNS recursive resolver to, a, to an authoritative domain. And that authoritative domain is gonna come back with the full IP address of the of the domain we requested, okay? And that's how a DNS uh, domain name system works. And that's the first step, okay, in any query that happens on the internet. And that's important to keep track, okay? That's important to understand because if you remember at the beginning of this class, we talked about how browsers work, okay? Now we're going into how the network works. And the first step, okay, from your browser to the internet and to access any of the files, any of the resources that are hosted on the internet, this is the first step. So it's going to go over our DNS, uh, um, our DNS resolver. Okay. Now your DNS is usually something that uh, it's like a router. Or if you're, let's say, on a Starbucks uh, location or at a coffee shop or somewhere public that you log into a Wi-Fi network, then they have a DNS that you, you know, anytime a query comes in, right, it'll go through their DNS resolver, and then they'll, uh, they'll bring back to you what the actual IP address. So all the DNS resolvers work in exactly the same way. They go to the root server, TLD server, and then the authoritative name server, and then they return back to the user, the actual resource that the user uh, asked for at that point. So let's talk about really quick, some of the attacks that happen at the DNS level, okay? Which is at the very, very low level of, um, of our first interaction with the web. So the first one is DNS spoofing. So let's think about how this happens. Let's say you are at a public coffee shop, okay? And then someone, an attacker over here, ins in in uh, injects a fake DNS entry, right? So whenever we, we're gonna go ask the DNS, hey, where's example.com? The DNS server is gonna say, hey, I know where that is. And it's gonna point back maybe to, an, to, a, to, a, um, to a client that the attacker controls, okay? And then what the attacker is gonna do, they're going to request whatever the client requested on their behalf, to the to the real website and then what they're going to do is they're going to return that back to the client but within because the attacker has inputted themselves in the middle okay they can spoof that address that they get back from uh from the dns so that real ip address they can spoof it and say hey you know what the ip address is it's me again so because the attacker is going to say hey it's me again next time we go and ask for something back from the dns it's not going to go to the real website which is what the dns should have resolved is gonna to go to the attacker website. And at that point, the attacker can clone the website, not just clone it, but then inject code into their um, into that DNS entry, into that resource that they got from the real website, and then return it back to you. But what the client doesn't know is that this attacker in the middle, they have actually injected some code that didn't come from the real website, it came from a way, uh, fake website. 
And that's what DNS spoofing is, okay? And that's what we need to be really careful when we uh, log in into public um, public um, <coughs> Wi-Fi's. This is something that a lot of people do. So if you know, you should be careful. Uh, and uh, there there are tools to check the DNS spoofing. Now again, if you're in a reputable uh, place and you know this place, um, you know it's not so much of a thing to worry about. But this is the first place where attackers come and uh, and something um, you know where they can start injecting code into your code base right so again dns spoofing is just cache poisoning so the dns once it resolves uh an ip address it caches it, okay so the next time we're gonna go ahead and ask other resources from uh from this real website it's just gonna say hey i, I know where that is but it's gonna go to the attacker because the attacker spoofed their ip address and say hey i'm the ip address okay but now the attacker knows what the real ip address is but you don't right so then they can perform all the requests on your behalf and then at that point then they can inject any code uh, on the website so the next one is dns tunneling so dns tunneling is a little bit different than um dns hijacking so what happens is let's say you're on premise right so you you're behind a firewall uh, of some kind right so you have a business and uh but there is uh, a computer that logs in into the into the um, into the network of that business, maybe uh, a VPN or something. And what happens is, as we're sending packets over the web, so as as we're sending information over to, um, you know, we're, we're asking resources online, so we're going to different websites, we're going to maybe log in into a Dropbox or a Gmail, or any other website that you log in. As those requests are going out, the, we can attach packets to the request, right? So the packets are what's going to be uh, be encrypted and then decrypt it at the um, at the other end of uh, of this website. So if you're using uh, if you're sending traffic over HTTPS, this uh, all the traffic is um, it's pretty much encrypted at that point and it's secure. But if someone is in your network and has some malware, then they can use the the DNS as a, a transport layer, which is not what it's intended to be. But because DNSs uh, perform so many queries, uh, then they can attach to each of the queries a little packet that actually gets out of the network and then goes to an attacker's uh, infrastructure. And uh, once the attacker has that information, then uh, they can extract information from inside the premise or um, you know, pretty much at that point, you're, you know, it, it's a vulnerability attack and uh, any data that, uh, that the attacker set up on, on the infected machine can come uh, through the DNS uh, as a transport layer and the attacker can get access to it, okay? Another attack um, that we want, uh, well, this is one that we just um, went over. And it's, it's pretty similar to DNS spoofing, but whereas DNS spoofing and DNS hijacking, where they differ is that DNS spoofing actually uh, attacks the cache of the DNS, right? So if you remember when we perform our DNS um, resolver, the resolver at the end, once it gets the IP, is going to say, hey, next time you ask for the same uh, example.com website, I'm not going to go through the whole um, song and dance, right? So it's not going to go through every step of the going over to the TLD, the root server, and then the authoritative name server. It's just going to look at its cache first, and it's like, oh, I already know what this is, so I don't need to go through all that, and then it's going to return the resource, right? It's going to just return the IP address. So that's where DNS spoofing, the attacker, attacks the cache. In DNS hijacking, the, the attacker does not attack the cache, but instead, uh, instead, it injects himself or herself in the middle and then every single time someone asks for a resource is going to say hey i'm that resource and then it's going to perform that um that um that request on behalf of the user and then return whatever the user um wants so it's very similar to dns spoofing except that it, it, it's happening for uh, multiple domains so this could be something that uh if actually happens um then that attacker could essentially uh snoop on the traffic on all the traffic going through that network and uh and then they can do whatever they need to do or whatever they want to do uh to the to the response of the um, of the user now the next one uh the next um is nx domain attack so the nx domain attack this is not so much about injecting code on a um to to a user on the response this is more let's say your business hosts a website right uh, maybe like PayPal or something like that, or any other website for that matter. Uh, what the um, attacker is going to do is they're going to do a denial of service attack. So they're going to they're they're going to uh, inundate the DNS server, okay, with requests. 
So now that they have access and they know the IP address of the DNS server, they're going to ask it for records that don't exist, okay, in an attempt to cause the denial of service um, for legitimate traffic. So although there is, a, a, although most of the people that are going to that website uh, are, are, you know, just regular requests, there are these other requests that are very hard to detect the difference uh, within the DNS because they look just like regular requests. But um, the difference is that these now service attacks, they're asking for resources that are not on the server. So because they're asking for resources that are not on the server, when the DNS tries to resolve that, it takes a lot longer than when it actually finds a resource, right? Because it's going to look, and then it's going to look through the whole kind of um, map of that whole website. So depending how big that website is, this can take you know a, a, a way longer for, for that response to happen. And then uh, because it's a denial of service attack, it can even be distributed. So if it's distributed, then that DNS uh, for whatever that uh, URL is, is going to get then inundated with fake traffic. And when a regular request comes in, then they're not going to be able to um, to get the response back. And it's going to be, it's going to either time out or uh, some, you know, or it's going to be a denial of service on the, on the host uh, access and uh, and they, you won't be able to um to response uh to respond with an actual um to with with your actual website right and that's how the attack takes place and uh the phantom domain attack the, the main difference is the attacker sets up a bunch of phantom domain servers right which either request very slowly or not at all they're going to uh ask for resources that they know are on the server that take up a lot of, uh, so let's say it's a three megabyte file, right? It's a three megabyte um, image or something. So what they're gonna do is they're going to request that image um, multiple times, thousands, you know, millions of times, depending how they set it up, the attack. And then they're going to, um, they're going to try to make the same attack, which is denial servers. And this is, you know, this, this can happen um, for companies, big companies. Uh, you know, maybe you've heard in the news uh, how companies are getting hacked. This is one of the attacks that someone might perform on the DNS at the DNS level. And then the botnet attack, getting any one of these attacks and then creating an, uh, an automation for them. So a bunch of bots or a bunch of servers that once we have access to the DNS and the, and the actual IP addresses, then we can just go ahead and automate all that. And, um, and instead of coming from one machine, right, and trying to inject code, then the attack will come from many machines. And, um, and essentially is going to try to overwhelm the, the host server. And then the host server is uh, either going to um, create a denial service so it won't be able to host itself. Okay, so moving on from DNS attacks. And again, I hope that um, going through those attacks, I know we went through them quickly because it's important to know them. And you, you might not think when, you, when you're creating your website that uh, we need to start at that level. But again, if we don't understand the whole process of you know, how the whole web has been created, then uh, that's exactly where we become vulnerable to uh, these types of attacks. And, um, you know, more and more, again, as we have this tension in the web of we want to create just simple document, right? Just very simple standards that uh, everyone can adhere to. To On the other end, we want to create the web so that it's actually a very powerful platform with uh, many built-in APIs that most applications uh, that we create uh, don't, you know, hinder the user. Uh, we also have to become aware that you know, with with that power, we we open up the web to a lot more um, to to a lot more attacks. Okay, so I think web security in the in the future is going to become, if not more important than network security, just as important, just simply because the way the web is moving, is moving in a direction that uh, websites are not simple documents anymore, right? They're uh, they're they're full fledged applications, and as computers get even more powerful and a lot more of the processing can happen on the client side instead of on the server side, then uh, we can see how these attacks uh, really can, uh, can affect a system once someone either has been able to inject some type of code or run some type of code on your machine uh, on your code base, right? So um, now that we know the first thing that uh, happens when you type a URL and press enter uh, on the web, let's move on to, which is the first step is DNS, then what happens at the HTTP level, right? So we know the DNS and the resolver and the attacks that can happen at that level. But then let's talk about which is what most of this, um, most of the rest of this class is going to focus on, okay? Which is HTTP and uh, which is the protocol of the web 
and pretty much when you write an HTML document, it, this is where it gets uh, transported from, from the HTTP protocol, right? So let's go over the HTTP pr protocol, let's see how it works, and let's see uh, some of the vulnerabilities that are built in into that protocol, and uh, how we can exploit some of them, and then how we can defend against some of it. So HTTP is actually a very simple protocol, and I'm gonna go ahead, and I'm gonna go open up my terminal over here, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, curl and we're going to curl a very simple um let's just curl or oh, let's see here http as uh www.twitter.com let's see here uh did i write that correctly i put four w's it's three w's okay here we go so when we whenever we go to a website okay it's going to issue an http request over uh, a tcp socket right and in that request if we focus on this side of the request over here the request is going to be using. Uh, it's going to have a few things to to make the re request happen, and anybody can write a uh, a very simple HTTP cl uh, client, and uh, and all you need is pretty much these things here. So you need the get uh, the type of request it is. This is a get request. What well, we're requesting the path is uh, the path is just the home page, right? So this would be a different path if it was a different home page, uh, if it was a different resource on uh, on that domain. And then the, the version of the protocol. So in this uh, case, we're using the HTTP pro protocol and we're using version two. So you can imagine if we're trying to uh, get a, uh, a video, it might be different MP4 or something like that, but it's gonna become, uh, it's gonna come, uh, that request is gonna come over HTTP as well. And then we actually have to identify what the host is. Uh, in this case is um, twitter.com. And, uh, and the user agent in this case is um, curl. But uh, otherwise, it would be like Mozilla or uh, Chrome or something like that. Okay, then the response we get uh, from that it's uh, also very similar. Okay, so I'm gonna make that request again just so we can get the full version of Twitter, and not truncate it. And then what we're gonna be going over. So we're over here. So in that response uh, that we got from Twitter, we got a 200 response. Okay, and we did the same thing. Curl v and uh, HTTP uh, Twitter.com. Then uh, what happened is, um, so in the response header, let's let's go over what response we got. So we got an HTTP, remember the request is using HTTP2, so the response is gonna come back as well with an HTTP2. Uh, so again, the, the, the request and the response at, um, at that level, they, they're gonna match. Uh, then we, we have a few headers over here, cache control. We're gonna go over some of this. Content length, so the length of uh, the response that we just got, right? So this is pretty much the, um, the Twitter website, uh, the HTML uh, content. The content type is text HTML. Again, uh, this could have been MP4. This could be um, maybe a torrent web, uh, torrent uh, URL, which actually brings the packets from many different sources. So it's a different type of a protocol. In this case, we're using HTML. The date uh, when this was performed, uh, any expiration uh, for this, uh, and then last modify. So if we're doing any caching. Uh, it's gonna say on um, you know it's gonna say hey cache this website uh, again we hear uh, we see here that is has a header that says no cache um, and then um, we see a, a few more headers that are setting cookies right and then we're gonna go we're gonna go over all this and uh, and that's pretty much it right so we get an HTTP response uh, a few headers and then after the headers we get uh, the payload right so pretty much the response okay so let's um so that's pretty much what happens when uh, when we make an HTTP response, right? So the request, like I said, uh, you, you get you have to um, specify the method. This is a get method, and there's there's a few. The most uh, common ones are uh, get, post, and put. Then the path, in this case, is the home page. So we're just gonna uh, put a slash, and then the version of the protocol. Uh, we can use over here HTTP 1.1, which still on the web a lot of websites uh, use. But uh, we saw that uh, you know we already have HTTP two, and I think uh, HTTP three is even coming down the pike. So and then the rest um, that we uh, the, the the next thing we have to um, include in the in the header in the in the request is any headers that we want to uh, include. So the host developer um, So that's that's not uh, optional. That's uh, mandatory. So we we get, we have the path over here of what we want, but where of what host? Well, okay, of Mozilla.org. Okay, so we're gonna go to developer.mozilla.org, and then we we want the homepage of that, and then that's what we're gonna resolve through the DNS, and then any other headers um, that we want to include uh, in the headers, we can include cookies or uh, a few other headers that are uh, pretty common, and we're gonna go over those um, as well. 
And then some uh, the response, it's again very similar to the to the actual request. It's gonna bring us back what type of response it is. So the the version of the protocol, right? The status code. Uh, so if it's a 200, it's like, okay, you know, we, we got a response back. That was everything, you know, everything went well. The status message, which is okay. Uh, again, the, these, these two things can change and depending on uh, how they change, uh, it, it tells uh, um, something different about the response that we got. And then any headers that, uh, that want to be included in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the response. So the response and the request, they, they both look very similar. And again, like you saw, uh, there's not really a lot of magic. Uh, anybody can create an HTTP client and start making requests to uh, to a server. So again, if we remember, you know, the, the main model of the web is a client server model, right? So that client as the server for resources and the server replies, right? Um, it's pretty simple. It's human readable text protocol. So if, if we look over here at, uh, at, um, at Twitter, this is, yeah, HTML. But uh, essentially, you know, you can just write uh, from any um, from any uh, from any text editor that that you like, and you can just start, you know, kind of uh, hacking away and uh, writing HTML, and then sending it over the wire. Uh, it's also extensible, so just add HTTP headers, and um, you know, as you can see, there, you know, the more headers, and over the years, we've kind of included more and more headers in the um, in the spec. But uh, you know any any header that a browser wants to accept, uh, they can pretty much or or a um, or a client or a server wants to accept, they can just write it in. And uh, as long as you know what the headers are and you send the header, then uh, that uh, that client can respond and actually understand the header. So it doesn't just it's not something that's written in the spec. Uh, anybody can pretty much add uh, any headers they want, and uh, in this way we can um, we can. Um, we can make it not just uh, um, some, something that's standardized, but also something that's extensible and something that we can uh, grow uh, depending on the needs of any individual client. It's also, it's also stateless. So two requests have no relation to each other. So remember, as we're sending packets over the wire, um, pretty much, um, as you can see, the, the, the get and uh, so the method, the pattern, the version of the protocol, uh, that's pretty standard. The host is pretty standard. Um, so everything has to be included every single time we make a request. You know, there is no state uh, that we um, that we actually have embedded within the HTTP protocol protocol itself. Now we can add it, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna go over one of the ways to do that. And cookies is, is one of the ways. But again, that's that's not something that's part of the protocol itself. That's just something we add to the protocol in order to uh, to actually have state and, for example, login or anything like that. And as we saw. You know, because of this, we, we can perform certain attacks like, you know, session hijacking and stuff like that. But um, but again, it's not part of the HTTP protocol itself. It's something that we can just tag on to it. Uh, and it's a, a transport or protocol agnostic. So the only requirement is uh, reliability. So, you know, over the transport, you can pretty much send anything you want, right? Uh, in, in this case, we're sending a, a simple HTML document. But, you know, as you can see uh, on YouTube or any other video site, we have videos. Uh, you can send PDFs, you can send whatever, whatever you want, you know, so it's pretty much uh, protocol agnostic and uh, the web uh, in, in the state it's at, it really serves a lot of, uh, it serves a lot of uh, extensions. So it's not just uh, a simple uh, document viewing uh, platform anymore. It's, uh, it's become a lot more than that, right? So like I said, um, now we, we mentioned that HTTP is stateless, but obviously we do interact with stateful servers all the time, right? So when we log into a website, and we come back to it and that site remembers our login information without us having to re-enter it, then, you know, how is that happening, right? So if we said it was stateless, but at the same time, we know we log in into different websites and the sites somehow remember uh, that information. So again, we're going to get into that as we go into cookies. So stateless in this case means that the HTTP protocol itself does not store any state, okay? Uh, if stateless desire is implemented as a layer on top of the HTTP protocol, it's not something that's baked in. Okay, so that's very important to understand. Um, now let's go over some of the HTTP status codes. Uh, and again, if I were you, for me, the first time I remember learning this, uh, I didn't really know. Uh, now as a developer, you get uh, pretty um, used to some of these codes. You get accustomed to seeing one of them, or uh, some of them more than others, but I think it's helpful to understand, um, at least have a, a basic understanding of what each of them, me uh, each of them mean uh, um, on the web. So we have, uh, the, the ones that are in the range of the 100, 
they're pretty much informational status codes. Uh, in the 200 range, they're success codes. So we saw that we got a 200 uh, success okay. So that's pretty much when we make a request and uh, everything goes well and we get a 200 back. At 300, uh, it's a redirection uh, URL. So that tells our, you know, when we're dealing with the DNS uh, resolver, it tells the resolver, hey, the, this page has been moved uh, and you can find it over here. And then usually it'll tell the DNS where to go to find that, that page at that point. At 400 error, you know, I think everybody's um, used to this, uh, seeing a 404. This is uh, on the client side, there was an error. Um, and then a 500 error uh, is on the server side. Uh, so the 400 and the 500, they're both uh, errors on, um, on the resource that we tried to access, uh, except that the, uh, the only difference is that the 400 is on the client side, the 500 range are on the server side. So let's go over some of the success codes. 200, okay, it's uh, the request succeeded. Uh, here's another one that's uh, common and, and you might see, especially if you're dealing with, um, let's say you're, you're sending a whole video over the wire and uh, you wanna start the video at actually um, minute one. So there's no reason to send uh, anything before that. Uh, so a 206 partial content request, uh, you can do a partial content request uh, for a specific byte range. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is useful when you're dealing with large files and you only want to send in the packet from a certain byte range to a, to a certain byte range. And then over, over a period of time. So as you're buffering in that video, maybe you start at minute one and then you start buffering in the, the rest of the video. But, uh, so the partial content, uh, byte range. It's useful for those content uh, for those contexts where we're trying to send over the wire something very large, right? And you don't want to just send a gig over the wire, but what you want to do is maybe send uh, intervals of uh, 10 megabytes, maybe or something along those lines. Okay, then we have the HTTP redirection codes. Uh, we have 301, which means it's been moved permanently, so the resource has a new permanent URL. Uh, we have a 302 uh, found which means the resource has been tempor temporarily resized at a different URL. So the main difference between the 301 and 302 is one is permanent, one is temporary, and then the 304 is not modified, so the resource has not been modified since uh, it's been last cached. And uh, and again, the, the important thing to note here is that, let's say something gets back at 301, and it says it's been moved uh, permanently, then our DNS can cache uh, whatever we get back from, um, you know, we're gonna go ahead and then make that next round trip and as for that new resource based on what the 301 uh, returned to us, and, and then we can cache it, right? So the 304 tells us, hey, you know, that resource that you uh, that you got back, you know, it hasn't changed since last time. And then uh, what we can pretty much do at that point is just hit the cache and not have to make all those round trips. Now, the, let's go over the HTTP clan error code. So the 400 is a bad request. So it's a malformed request. Uh, let's say, um, let's say you're, coming over here and then you want to use HTTP version 14 and like let's say that doesn't exist so it's gonna tell us hey that's not something I recognize so it's uh yeah so that's just you know it's just not gonna go through um or let's say you're sending some information that the protocol doesn't uh understand or you sent it in a, in a weird way uh so it's mal malformed and it's gonna it's just gonna spit back it's like you know the server doesn't recognize this and uh here's a 400 error for you um so a 401 unauthorized so this resource is protected, needs to be authorized. So again, this is um, this is not so much that you made a bad request, but you're trying to access something that uh, at that point you didn't have access to. 403 forbidden, the resource is protected. Uh, so again, very similar to the unauthorized, um, except that uh, the server um, says, hey, this, this is protected, you know, so you're, you're not getting access to it. It's not that it's necessarily, uh, you don't have authority, it's uh, simply saying that um, you know they're just denying access to that resource uh, with the 403 error, and then we get the 404 not found. So that means you know it's it's not so much a malformed request; it's just a request um, that uh, that resource you're trying to access. It's uh, you know it doesn't exist. And again, we we went over some of the attacks that can happen uh, with this, but that's pretty much the um, this is one of the ways that we can mit mitigate those attacks on the on the server side. If you see that you're getting a bunch of 404 requests from a certain IP or uh, from you know or that they're formed in in a very similar way and uh, you keep getting back uh, these 404s not found, then then you that might be a clue that you know you're being attacked uh, because um, the requests are you know you know someone's asking for stuff that is obviously not there and they keep asking for it. So uh, either you know you cut them off or um, you figure out a way that um, you know you cut off that IP and uh, and then at that point you you can uh, shield yourself from that specific attack. So let's go over the server error codes. 
And again, this is more of the codes that you will see once you're doing the development and as you're developing something, uh, th these are some of the, the, the error codes that, uh, that you might be getting. So you might get a 500 internal server error. So maybe they're like the, the server is not online, right? And then you made the request as a developer. I know this has happened to me. And uh, you, you see on the terminal, it's like, well, that's uh, you get a 500 back. And you're like, well, what the hell is going on? Well, maybe the, the server is not online, right? You get a 502 back gateway. So the server is a proxy uh, and the backend server is unreachable. So very similar, except that um, the server is going through a proxy and then the backend server, it's uh, it might be offline again, right? So then, then you might want to redirect the user back to uh, to another server proxy or back to another server that's uh, that's actually online. A 503 uh, service uh, unavailable, the server is overloaded or down for maintenance. Um, again, this can happen if a DDoS attack is happening or uh, maybe you're just doing a simple maintenance, right? So uh, these are some of the, if you see a 503 on the, on the response um, of, of the request you made, then uh, that's one of the things that can be. And uh, the other one uh, that's pretty common is the 504 gateway timeout. So again, if someone asks for a very large file and on your server, um, you don't have a way. So let's say you, you don't have a socket connection open, right? Or the connection times out, then, um, then it, you know, it, it'll wait like, I don't know, like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever the server specifies. So if the server specifies that, uh, you know, after 20 seconds, like cut, cut, cut this off, right? Like it's taking too long and we have other users to serve. Uh, so it'll just respond back with the 504. Hey, that resource you're trying to get, uh, just took too long. And, um, you know, the server just, you know, wasn't able to get it in the, in the allotted time. Uh, and then again, th there are ways to get around this. One of them is that, uh, that, uh, range request. So you're like, okay, well you can set your server up. So it doesn't send the whole gig over. Right. Uh, so it doesn't load it into memory and then send it over. So the server can, you can set it up. So it's, uh, it's, it's set up in such a way that it's going to send 10 megabyte files, uh, every time it gets it. So, Hey, as you get the 10 meg files, start sending it over. And, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, reproduce that file. So we're, we're going to just, you know, cr create that file, uh, piece by piece on the client side until we get the whole file, right. Until the, until we send the whole one gig, but uh, at least you don't get a timeout error. Right. And at least you don't get a denial of service from the client's perspective. So, uh, you can still serve your users and send large files over the wire. So HTTP headers, right? So be, be so again, now that we know what, uh, what actually happens when, um, when, when we make that request, right? When we type in a URL and we press enter, uh, the first thing, okay. Is the, the method, the, the getter, then the path, and then the version of the protocol. But then we have this other section here, uh, that are called the headers. Okay. So the HTTP headers are very important in, in, in any request or response, right? They let the client and the server pass additional information with the HTTP re request or response. So this is one way that we can have, uh, that stateful, um, that, that stateful, uh, behavior that we're looking for. For example, you know, we, we don't want a user to have to log in every time they, uh, they visit our website. So maybe they log in once and then we send back a session ID and with that session ID, we can validate that they're the, the correct user, right? So that's uh, one of the ways that the server, um, and the client can send information back and forth and we can keep some sort of state that's not, uh, you know, included within the HTTP protocol itself. Right. And, and they're essentially the way they're set up. It's, uh, it's essentially a, uh, a, a, a map of uh, key value pairs, right? So you see the key over here, it's called host. And then the value of that it's whatever you see on the right. So on the left side, you get the key, accept language. And on the right side, you, you, you see the, the value of that, which is uh, in this case, French, right? So, uh, and again, that's, that's pretty much how they're set up. Um, and again, one of the great things about headers is that they allow for experimental extensions, uh, to HTTP without requiring the protocol to change. Right. So without us having to actually go through a committee or the committee actually, you know, coming to terms with something that they want to add to the spec, um, any client and any server can, um, can send, um, or, or respond with any headers. And as long as they understand their headers, then, uh, then HTTP kind of says, you know, I, you know, I, we don't really care. Uh, if you guys understand each other, then, then that's fine. Uh, so, so here are some useful HTTP request headers, uh, that, um, that, uh, that you might, uh, come across. So the first one is host. So the domain of the server, right. And, uh, and we saw that, uh, over here. So the host header, uh, that's, uh, that's actually a, uh, one that's, um, mandatory, the user agent. So depending if you're like searching from, let's say, uh, Chrome or Firefox or Safari, 
the, that user agent uh, will change, uh, which is the name of your browser and operating system, okay? Uh, and it's composed of those two things. So the refer, let's say, um, let's say you clicked on a link. Uh, so part of that request, when you click on one website and then go to another website because you clicked on a link, that, uh, that request is actually going to have attached to it a refer uh, header. So that uh, on the server side, you know, if, if they want to track it, who's sending, you know, most of the traffic to them, that the refer uh, header, it's one of the ways that, um, that that's done. Uh, also, the cookie header. So you saw in, uh, in the curl example over here, you saw that we can set, uh, we said that over here, uh, we have the set cookie, set cookie. You know, so, so over here, Twitter is setting a bunch of cookies that uh, eventually are going to, um, you know, that they're, they're using for either let's say, uh, ambient authority. So, you know, to check if the user is signed in or not. So again, setting cookies is another, um, very common header. And then the range, uh, header that uh, we spoke about. So, you know, in that, uh, in that sense, what you're saying is, Hey, I just want a specific, uh, subset, you know, I, I don't want the whole file. I just want, uh, from byte X to byte Y, uh, and just fetch that for me, please. So that's, uh, that's what that is. Another one is cache control. To, so you can specify if you want something to be cached or not. Um, you know, let's say a resource that uh, that you send to the user doesn't really change it's the same image or something. So maybe you're like, hey, you know, cache this image because uh, they're going to be asking for a lot, and we don't necessarily want to. You know, every time we serve it, it's going to be the same image. So once they have it, just cache it. So that way, the um, the client knows not to ask for it again. And once they cache it, then they can just get it from the cache instead of asking the server constantly what uh, that, that same image that's or that same resource that's not necessarily going to change. Uh, so if modify sends, um, very similar. So only send resources if changed recently. So again, we saw that some of the headers that the, that the server can send, it said, you know, it hasn't changed. So if it sends that header, it's going to say, oh, okay, great. So like, just get it from the cache then, you know, like we're, we're just going to send you the header back without the resource because we expect that you have the resource um, in the cache already. Uh, the connection, so you can actually control TCP sockets. So this is one of the ways that you can keep a connection open. And um, and again, maybe uh, you've seen like WebRTC or something like that. So they keep a constant connection open. And, uh, and in this way, you can uh, have um, VOIP, uh, that functionality of like video and audio uh, from two different computers over their wire, right? And then keep that connection open for as long as like the conference or the call is uh, happening. So that's uh, that's the connection uh, request header. The accept header, uh, which type of content we want. So if we send that uh, accept header uh, and we're saying, hey, we're expecting back HTML and we get back like something else that's not HTML, then we can know it's like, you know, like that's not what we were expecting. And then we can just discard that. Uh, accept encoding. So let's say uh, we accept like GZIP uh, and we're, we're sending back kind of a, a large file, maybe a React application that's pretty, uh, pretty large. We can gzip it, and as long as the um, as the client accepts the encoding of gzip, then uh, then all as well, right? So you can create this encoding header. Uh, another one is accept language. Uh, again, as you can see, th these are not standards, right? But uh, but they're common, and uh, the, but all all that all that's necessary is for that client and that server to understand these two things, and uh, and pretty much HTTP doesn't really care at that point. And they're like, fine. Uh, as long as uh, both the client and the server understand each other, then they can allow you to um, to attach any headers to any request, okay, and to any response for that matter. So yeah, okay. Now let's go over some useful HTTP response headers. Uh, date. So when the response was sent, the last modified when the content was last modified. So again, these are pretty much uh, self-explanatory. But uh, you know, as you're debugging and as you get more into web security. These are uh, some of the ones that you really are going to come across and they're going to be helpful uh, to help you debug or um, find out where, where there might be uh, potential vulnerabilities. Uh, the cache control header, so it specifies whether we want to cache a response or not. Um, and again, we're going to go over this in one of the attacks that, uh, that I'm going to show you. The expires header, uh, discard the response from the, from the cache after this specific date. So you can just you know delete a cookie or something uh, along the line. So, you can do it through the expires header. The very, uh, it's a list of headers which affect the response used by a cache. So um, we're gonna go over this in more detail as well. And then, then the set cookie header. So uh, the actual response. So let's say you log into Twitter and with that, uh, and then let's say the login was successful. So then the server 
can actually set a cookie on the response that it wants uh, the next time the client makes another request to that same URL, it wants that cookie to be included, right? And then that was one of the ways that we were able to perform that, um, that um, the, um, not DNS hijacking, but um, cookie hijacking attack that you saw from the bank account, right? And then we were able, because the user had at some point logged in into that bank account, and then uh, an attacker was able to get a user uh, on another website, and then behind the scenes, they were running um, um, a, a post request to the server. Uh, they actually um, made a, um, a an action that the user or, or the client in that, in that case was not intended to, but the attacker was still able to perform it because the header, um, the, the server at some point sent a cookie back that said, hey, whenever you... Uh, you perform um, a request back to, to the bank. Um, you know, just include this uh, this header, uh, this cookie, and and we know that you have already been logged in. So again, if someone gets access to that information, you know, we uh, um you can see how it can become very very dangerous. Uh, or in your website, let's say you have um, some information behind some uh, paywall. So only uh, only people that are uh, that are paying customers should be able to access that information. And someone gets access to a session ID or something. And then they uh, they take on the identity of that user. At that point, you know, there's really nothing the server will see uh, different because all the requests, any any client can make the request. And as long as um in the header they include their correct information, then the server has no way of knowing that this was a malicious uh, request. And then at that point, you know, that that person is kind of a host. And again, in in the banking example, banking example, it's a little bit more uh, clear why this is dangerous, but. It can happen in any case, uh, and you know, pretty much anyone can take. Uh, once they have access to uh, your cookies or that session ID, um, you know, it becomes very, very difficult to um, to to defend against it. Uh, so, some more useful uh, HTTP response header is the location. So, the URL to redirect the client to. So, again, if we get a 301 uh, response, uh, usually with that response, you get a location uh, response as well that tells you, you know, it's been moved over here. And then at that point, the DNS resolver. We'll make another round trip and then try to get that IP address uh, for where that resource has been moved. The connection again uh, on on the, um, the 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 server and the client. So sometimes the the client wants to keep the TCP connection open, but the server is like, uh, no way, you know, like we, we don't want to accept that. So the server can actually uh, also control that. Uh, the content type, um, the type of content in response. So again, very similar. Uh, if the client was expecting HTML and the server can actually specify that. So if there's any mismatch in those things, uh, then you know, then then that can uh, actually issue a uh, one of the errors that we went over and say, you know, this is not uh, this wasn't what we expected back. Um, so yeah, the content encoding, the language and the length, uh, the content en en encoding on the server side, it's again, let's say the client says, hey, uh, you can send if if you have a JSON, send it back in JSON form. Let's say. Uh, and the server's like, oh, you know what? We do have it in JSON. We don't have to send the HTML back. And perfect. And so they send it back in JSON response. So there's a way for the um, for the client and the server to communicate over what the information is going to look like. Uh, the content language, again, this is just a header that you can use for inter uh, nationalization. So again, one of the ways uh, that you can do that. And then on the server side, you know that if you get the content language header, uh, you, you, you know that the server knows how to respond to that. And then the content length is the length of the response in bytes. So usually, uh, with this, you can say, you know, let, let's say you're expecting something that's um, a certain length uh, and no more than that. And uh, and then all of a sudden, you get a file that's way bigger than expected. Uh, and then again, that should raise uh, some uh, some red flags as far as uh, you know, it's like well, what what's been included in this response that made the file so much bigger than it's supposed to be, right? And then again, it could be a code injection attack or uh, which we will cover later with XSS. Um, but again, that's that's another thing that you can look at for the content length. If you're expecting a certain length and then you get something different, then uh, it could be a red flag that uh, that something you know was uh, injected that was not supposed to be there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty much for HTTP. And um, that's, again, that's the second part. So when we go on the web, remember, the first thing that happens is we, we go through our DNS. Then um, the DNS, the way it's sending all this information is through, through the HTTP protocol. That's uh, pretty much the, the way that we're going to be uh, accessing resources online. And then what we're going to do in the next session, we're going to cover some of the big vulnerabilities. And we're going to start with cookies. And then we're going to move into different attacks. Now we're getting to cookies. And um, 
this is where it's going to start getting a little bit more fun. We're going to start practicing some of the attacks and uh, checking out some of the defenses. So now that we're, you know, over the DNS part and the HTTP kind of prerequisites to understand how all this works, now we can get into cookies. And to be honest with you, I don't really know how the web, um, how, how they, you know, who sits in the standards committee and comes up with the name cookies. Who knows? Who passes it? Who knows? But cookies is, is what we got. And cookies are very interesting because cookies were actually, um, you know, they were written in such a, a long time ago when the web was actually starting and it's not at all what it is today. But they have become such a uh, big part of the web that uh, although we have a spec today, there are a lot of sites that use cookies in, um, in how they were first implemented. And uh, it creates a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, but again, they, they, they really are such a big part of the web that they're kind of used everywhere. As you can see, uh, Netflix uses them, uh, Google, I mean, pretty much every everybody, right? And because we know that HTTP is stateless, uh, cookies is one of those ways that uh, we kind of keep state around and uh, we can um, create this idea of uh, omnipresence or, um, you know, and we're gonna go over what that means, uh, but pretty much is a way to keep state uh, from request to request uh, without actually uh, relying on the protocol itself, which uh, by itself does not have a way to do that. So sessions, uh, let's let's go over sessions and what are sessions. So cookies are used by the server to implement uh, pretty much sessions. Okay, so and a session again, uh, depending on uh, who's um, we're, we're you know. Depending on your use case, let's just say uh, a session can last as long as uh, the browser is open, or maybe a session can last as long as uh, until the user logs out, right? So there, there are different types of session, but the idea of a session is that uh, some some information is going to be remembered for a period of time past uh, and over over a period of request, right? So it's more than one request, and some information is going to uh, be remembered from uh, one request to the other request, right? So that's that's pretty much what uh what we want to think about when we're thinking of session. So the goal is that the server they want to keep a set uh a set of data related to the user scoring browsing sessions, right? So again, uh we see this in logins and shopping carts. So let's say you add something to your shopping cart and uh, and then you want to remember, hey, you know this user uh, maybe they click the back button or maybe they remove something. So how do we remember that uh, when a user, let's say, adds something to their shopping cart, then goes to the checkout page, but doesn't check out and then goes back to browsing for more products. So where do we keep that information, right? Where do we keep the fact that the user already has some uh, some uh, some uh, items in their cart, but haven't actually checked out yet? And uh, what we want to do is we want that when they go from uh, adding the item in their cart to even browsing more products, we want to keep adding those products to the cart. While at the same time, when they go to the checkout, we want to make sure all those products are there. But those are all different requests. So again, cookies are used to uh, remember some of this information. And of course, at networks use cookies uh, to track um, users across different sessions. Uh, and you know, we'll talk a little bit more about ad networks. I personally love ad networks. Uh, I think um, they they get a lot of bad rep because of. Um, you know, I don't know, but bad uh, actors in, in the network, but that always happens, right? Now, the great thing about uh, user tracking is uh, it's it's the way that, uh, let's say, for example, when we go to Amazon, Amazon can deliver a unique experience to each and every single one of us, right? And I think over time, uh, if, you know, if if we do this correctly, uh, user tracking, to, in, in my point of view, and again, every, anyone can have their own point of view, but I can just tell you the way I see things. And the way I see things is that because of user tracking and because um we were able um to to have our identity online right and track our behavior over time services that really care about their users and about delivering better experiences they can deliver those experiences really tailored to what the person wants and over time the experiences and the user experience uh can become uh such a, such a wonderful thing right and they can deliver experiences that are far far and above what uh what can be delivered when there is no tracking uh available right so again that's just my little um middle um you know side note on that but again uh but uh user user tracking uses cookies as well so th this whole concept of that we're talking about here is called ambient authority so ambient authority um is uh to regulate who can view resources or take actions right and again the the idea is that who can do this through many uh, requests, right? So as many requests are happening, so let's say you're going from uh, in your Facebook profile, 
or you know some other profile and you know you're you're clicking around but at the same time you're staying logged in the way that happens or you know your Netflix account your Amazon account or wherever uh, as you're clicking around and you you're staying logged in that's because of this ambient authority that the um, that the server sent back uh, the set cookie response uh, in their headers and uh, and they gave you a session ID and because you have the session ID that um, that kind of um, follows you on on every request then uh, this is what ambient authority uh, this is what becomes ambient authority and that's the way that the server can recognize who you are and then at that uh, in, in that same uh, in the same way can keep you logged in right so but the idea is that uh, they can uh, ambient authority access control based on a global and persistent property of the requester okay that's just pretty much a technical term uh, for what we just uh, what we just uh, described and there are two main types of ambient authorities one is cookies and the other one's IP checking now IP checking is used less often but still uh, good to know uh, for example let, let's say you're logged in into a university library uh, site right let's say you're a student and you're on the network uh, but the university, you know, they don't necessarily want to keep, um, you know, they don't necessarily want to know which student or anything because once you're in the network, they can pretty much say, hey, you know what, they're in the network, they must be on the campus. So like, let's allow them access to uh, pretty much student resources or, you know, whatever resources that they want to, um, they want to um, give them access to. Well, IP checking, it's, uh, it's something that's included with, you know, pretty much every request. And uh, that's one way to uh, keep, um, keep track of at least at a, at a very high level of uh, where the requests are coming from and let's say that you know they're, they're not coming from uh from the ips that um that you know from the ip that belongs to the university or the library then you know that that, that request uh should be um should not be allowed but the, the main uh the main way uh to keep track is definitely cookies and that's what we are going to be uh, talking about more and more and uh the attacks on on cookies so let's go over really quick and I, I, again I, I think for me a lot of this stuff is interesting so I wanted to include it for you as well uh, because I think the more we understand this we, we kind of know why these things happen and uh, how it evolved over time to, to, to the state of, uh, of how we are today at least when I'm um, recording this video. So the history of cookies. Cookies were implemented in 1994 okay in Netscape and, uh, and they were at first described in this four page draft paper it, you can kind of think of it like someone writing on the back of a napkin and uh that's kind of how the, you know someone got it one of the browsers got it i think netscape and then okay cool let's just implement that and you know next thing you know a week later uh they were implemented so cookies you know this is all to say that cookies were implemented way before anybody was thinking about security anybody was thinking about how the web was going to evolve any of that so cookies you know bypass a lot of the modern day web securities uh standards that we have developed after that fact but that's because they were implemented in 1994 and they were implemented in a half-baked way too uh, on top of that. So because the web uh, has to be implemented in such a way that is backwards compatible, right? And, and again, you know, everybody I think over here knows the, the you know, the awesomeness it is to, you know, make your website backwards compatible for every single browser and the pain that it can cause when that's not possible. For example, let's not point any fingers, but Internet Explorer for a long, long time, uh, that, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot more better now with uh, Edge and all that. But for a long, long time, just to um, just to support Internet Explorer was a huge burden because, uh, you know, the, the standards that they had set up and the way that they implemented the standards was not the way other browsers were implementing the standards. So, again, you, you might get, you know, your website looking one way when you access it from IE. And then if you were not an IE, you got it a completely different way. And again, this this happened for a while until the standards kind of uh you know, they, 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 you know, I think they, they got the message and they were like, you know, guys, I, I think we have to um, we have to abide by the standards or at least, you know, get involved in this process of creating standards so that, you know, the user can get a, a the, you know, the correct experience and developers can can code against this, this spec uh, that we're creating for them so that, you know, websites don't look just 50 different ways. And, you know, developers have to just, um, you know, de develop in many different languages or, you know, whatever. So that's that's kind of what's going on there. So cookies really didn't have a spec for 17 years, okay? Uh, just pretty much until, I guess, recently, you can say. But for 17 years, since 1994, there was no official spec uh, for cookies. And I'll include some of the links so you can read the specs if you're really interested in that. But uh, I, I think they're incredibly interesting. And I think that, um, you know, they really are becoming better as far as the web security uh, is concerned. But, uh, but we're going to go over some of the main uh, pieces uh, that cookies have uh, and that are part of the spec so that you 
at least you know from a web security standpoint what you should be looking at and the things that you need to do to defend against some of the attacks that we're going to talk about. So let's, let's talk about cookie attributes. So the expires header on the cookies, uh, when we set cookies on the API that the cookie uh, spec uh, gave us, uh, has this uh, way that we can... Um, that we can specify when does it expire. So again, it pretty much says, you know, what, when do you want this, this thing to expire? You can expire after someone closes the browser. You can expire, you know, like 30 days from now. You can expire even 30 years from now if you decide, right? So a cookie can live on for a very, very long time, um, you know, or, or a very, very short time. But the expires, um, the expires uh, part of the API allows us to specify this. Then we have the path. So the path, at least it tries to. It, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't do it uh, successfully, and we're going to cover that. But for example, uh, what it tries to do is it tries to scope the cookie header to a particular request path or prefix. So let's say you are logged in to uh, to a website, right? And only when they access, uh, only once they're logged in and they're on a specific path. So for example, the slash docs um, path of uh, of the website. Only then will the response header include a cookie and if they're on any other path of the website then don't include the cookies right so that's what the path attribute on the api uh tries to um tries to uh tries to do right so again this is one really really weak way to uh for, for security to happen based on cookies but you know based on the path they are you know only certain cookies will be uh, accessible but we're going to see later on in xss attacks and in uh cross-site scripting attacks that someone can, um, like for example, you can get um, framed into an iframe and then someone can uh, access cookies that are not part of that path through the iframe, okay? Uh, even though they're not on the path, okay? So again, this is not, this is not uh, something that, uh, that actually works, uh, especially attackers know about this. So again, uh, cookies, uh, but the cookies do have this, um, this attribute. And then the domain, allow the cookies to be scoped to a domain broader than the domain that returned uh, the set cookie header. So you can you can say that the let's say you're in a specific uh, domain, but you can say hey you know I allow this cookie to be uh, scoped to um, pretty much a, like th the whole domain range, right? So not just a path, but I want it to be scoped to the full domain, even though it's uh it's being set on on a certain path. After it's set on the login page, any any page after that, like just include the cookies, okay? Um, so setting cookies. Uh, let's see how we set that. So again, it's just the header. That's all it is. And uh, all you have to do is um, to, to make the header, you just got to create the header. So the key of that is called set cookie. And then after that, um, the way you include the, uh, include the value of it, okay, is denoted by a semicolon. Uh, and then you can include um, as many values as you want within that set cookie header. Um, so you can, you know, within the set cookie, you can call it theme equals dark. So that would be the name of the cookie. And then the expires, uh, and then issue a date or any of the other attributes that we talked about here. And we're going to look at that uh, in more detail now, it just in just a few minutes. So again, how long can cookies last? Uh, size can set expires cookie to a very, you know, like very long, like thirty years. Um, at at some point, you know, some sites were setting cookies for a very very long time, and uh, some users, I guess, you know, you can say that they're like, you know, why why do you need to remember my identity for so long? uh when i'm only logging in and then logging out like it's not a site that i'm like necessarily like you know like if, if there's no use case but they were still remembering a lot of information about these users again that's just something that the that the server can um can specify uh when when expires is not specified then what happens is that the cookie uh lasts for the current browser session okay so that's the default behavior and that's uh at least i wanted to get that across so you know that so if you don't if you do not specify the expires um attribute then the cookie will last for as long as the as the session, uh, that browser session. So if they close the browser, okay, um, so they have to actually close the browser, okay. If they do not close the browser and they just click away, and uh, to another uh, or not even click away, they go to another website. That session is still active, okay. So that's that's very important to understand. Like they have to close the browser, right? They have to terminate the process. Remember we talked about the process in the beginning. Like that process has to be terminated. If it's not terminated, the cookie. Uh, is still active, okay? And then again, that that that's a vulnerability to uh, cookie session hacking, okay? So that's um, remember that, okay? So how do you delete a cookie? Again, this this kind of kind of goes to uh, how um, how old cookies are. So you you set the cookie with the same name and an expiration date in the past. That's how broken this API is. But again, that's what we have. That's what we have in the web. Uh, so you set cookie, then you set the key. 
uh, the name of the cookie that you want, and then you put, for example, uh, Thursday, the 1st of January in, in 1970 or whatever. You know, you can just put at, at whatever time, some, some, some day in the past from where you are right now, and, uh, and then that's how you delete cookies. It's, it's completely horrendous, but, um, but yeah, that's what we got. So how do we access cookies uh, from JS? So we, we saw that cookies get sent, okay, in the response header or in the client request. But uh, the, the way we're, we're, we're going to perform these session attacks is that cookies uh, can be accessed from, uh, from JavaScript, okay? And then that's how an attacker can actually, if they're, if they, uh, again, even if you're in a different domain, but the attacker uh, can make a post request to a server and a session is still active, then uh, the attacker can actually include in that request um, the the cookies of that uh, person and you know their whole identity pretty much, and then that re that server won't know that this was a malicious attack, and uh, it pretty much doesn't even care where where it originated from, and that's uh that's pretty scary, but it's I mean it's the truth, okay? That's just the way they are. So the way we access them, and we're gonna go over the code base, but uh, the way we access cookies through JS is document cookie, and then um. And then what you'll get back is uh, whatever it is, you know, name equals John, for example. Uh, and that's the way you can, uh, you can set cookies as well through uh, JavaScript. So you can set it with an equal sign. Uh, and then you can set uh, document.cookie favorite food equals uh, cookies. And then the path. So every, every time you, you, so this is, I, I want to make sure I emphasize that this is not like a regular object. So in a regular object in JavaScript, when you go document.cookie and then you put, you know, this name value thing, uh, and then you do it again. What the regular behavior that you should expect, uh, if you know JavaScript, um, is that it'll overwrite whatever we wrote before. But because the way cookies are, <laughs> because of the way that cookies are implemented in the browser spec, uh, the fact that these, the the fact that we're doing document the cookie and then um, creating uh, a value, okay, or assigning a value to it. Uh, and then down here in the next line, we're assigning another value to it. Does not replace this value because they're different cookies, right? So they're, they they have different names, and because they have different names, uh, the browser will actually treat it as different. Um, it, it would just get tagged uh, on to this uh, to this object instead of being uh, reassigned, right? So this is not um, this this is not value reassignments uh, or assignment. This is like literally the way cookies are set up. Uh, we are actually, uh, it's, it's more akin to uh, concatenating a, a cookie. Like that's pretty much what's going on. So the next time you go document a cookie, if you were expecting uh, favorite food uh, equals cookies uh, to be what you got back from that object, yeah, you'd be mistaken because what you're going to get back is both those, um, those values that we set, the name John and then the favorite cookie cookies uh, as your cookies that are set uh, for that session. Okay, so just again, remember that. Uh, so yeah. So document the cookie and then the name. So let's say we're got name uh, with uh, so again the the key of the cookie that you want to delete. So like this is how we delete cookies. So you go document the cookies equals then the key of the cookie you want to delete and then a date in the past. And then once you pass along and then you know you call document the cookie again. At that point you would have deleted the document the cookie uh, name John and uh, all you got back is just the favorite food cookies. So that's um. So yeah, if, if, if you were thinking that this is a um, value reassignment, uh, it's not, okay? You, you actually have to go ahead and actually delete the cookie uh, yourself this way in order for the cookie to, uh, to clear itself. So yeah, uh, now sending cookies over unencrypted uh, HTTP is a very bad idea, um, okay? And, and again, most websites nowadays, uh, if you get a TLS certificate or something, then uh, most of the communication is encrypted. But Anybody, let's say um, that someone is performing a man-in-the-middle attack, which is something we cover in the DNS section of uh, of this course. If anyone sees that cookie and they're snooping, they can use uh, they can use it to hijack the user session. Okay, so if you're, if you're sending these cookies along, um, kind of uh, as raw text as we saw in the request uh, header without any encryption, then anybody can pretty much um, that that's one way an attacker can assume identity over the victim. And uh, and then perform any any sort of attack at that point, right? So the attacker sends the victim's cookie as if it was their own, right? And that's how we were able to perform the bank attack, okay? Uh, and then at that point, the server will be fooled because the server doesn't actually see any difference from their point of view. Uh, the client made a request; it was a valid request. Um, 
to, to a valid resource and all the right cookies were sent, right? This is because uh, the attacker got access to those cookies. So, um, so yeah, the server at this point will get fooled. And, um, and that's one of the attacks that we're going to cover uh, now. So let's just go over it in, uh, in theory and then we're going to go see how this, uh, this attacker is done. So let, let's see over here. So the, the attacker ingests a script. So the attacker somehow uh, gets the user uh, gets gets either the user to click on a link that they own, right? So to one of the websites, uh, then the victim authenticates the server, right? So they they have some type of session live, right? So active, so they have some type of se uh, session active to another website, right? So then the server returns the page code with the injected script, okay? And then at that point, the victim's browser executes uh, the script and sends the session cookie to the attacker. And that's the attack that we're going to go over the bank attack. Uh, I'm going to go over in detail how that, that how that happened. But again, you were able to see how, although we were logged in into a different uh, website, the fact that we had logged in into that uh, previously to the bank and our session was still active, then uh, and then we we went to a malicious attack um, to a malicious site that had a script that was running. Uh, then the, the, the server was able to perform that attack uh, without you know without necessarily the the victim being aware of it, right? So. Let's, let's before we get into that let's let's go over some of the things that we can do to secure this and then we're going to go uh, and actually implement the code so session hijacking mitigation uh use secure cookie attribute so there is this attribute in the um, in the cookie api that uh if you use it, it prevent cookie from being sent over unencrypted http connections okay so if if someone tries to um get a cookie through http instead of https um then then that way so for example at, at first especially when submitting a form or something like that if this is not um if this is not set then the cookie will be sent uh unencrypted right and then anyone pretty much can see the cookie and then they can steal it at that point and then do whatever they they want to do right so that's um that's a no-no okay another thing that uh that you can do is uh session hijacking mitigation it's a uh, use the http only cookie attribute uh to prevent cookies from being read from javascript so if the cookie uh, HTTP only um, attribute is set, then uh, all these things that, you know, the, the way we were accessing uh, cookies from JavaScript, then uh, at least that's, you know, it's, you, you won't be able to do that. Uh, so that's another way to uh, mitigate against this attack. And then at that point, you know, the, then the server, at least uh, the attacker can't, uh, although it will be sending the request and you, you will see it from the response and the, and the request, it, it won't be accessible through JavaScript, okay? And then that's one way to mitigate that. Okay, so let's talk about how we can bypass the cookie path um, attribute that we talked about. So again, like I said, don't use this for security. It doesn't work, and we're gonna cover uh, we're, we're gonna cover an attack to show you how um, how we can bypass it. But again, it should not be used for security. Uh, the path does not protect against unauthorized reading of the cookie from a different path on the same origin, and this is the main um, attack vector. So if, uh, if 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 someone's on the same origin. As um as you so if it's a subdomain or something like that, then someone can iframe it and essentially uh hijack the cookie as well. So again, it can be bypassed with an iframe. Uh, then uh that iframe can be read with uh, read that iframe dot con uh, content document dot cookie. Um, so iframe dot content document allows us to read the iframe's document as if it was our own document. We're again we're gonna cover that in, uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but yeah. So that that's again that's not um if I think a lot of people used it in the past for um and 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 they have the misconception that this would allow for uh, for that um for this to work as a security feature because it's set on a certain path it's not you can bypass it and um and again it should not be used for security reasons um so again as long as it's the same origin policy that's pretty much uh and an, and an iframe can uh, can achieve this so therefore only use path as a performance optimization. Um, again, maybe you want to set the theme of a certain sub resource or like a certain, um, URL to maybe a dark or light mode or whatever, something very like something that has to do nothing with, um, with security. And, um, and again, as an optimization rather than as a security feature. Uh, so yeah, our cookie path, uh, secure. No, uh, there is no solution against this attack. So if you're using this cookie path and you thought that this was secure, again, there is no solution uh, there's no way to make this secure so it's always unsafe to use okay um so again so now let's let's talk a little bit about what is the main problem right so we we know that we we have um that we want um 
a, a request to, to have this ambient authority, right? Because we want to keep some type of state across different requests. But um, the, the problem is that it's unclear. Uh, what, once we have ambient authority, right, through cookies, then it becomes unclear uh, for the server to know which site initiated a request, right? So consider uh, this HTML embedded on attacker.com, for example, right? And then the browser hopefully includes bank.example.com cookies in all requests. And that's the attack I showed at the beginning where a person had logged into their bank account, but then uh, they, through either a link or somehow an attacker was able to get them to run uh, a piece of JavaScript code on their behalf and submit a form, then they were able to um, to um, create a bank transfer in, um, on behalf of that user. And we will cover that, uh, that attack in a second. In detail, I'll show you the code for that. Um, also, yeah, so that was a cross-site um, cross request forgery, uh, CSRF for short. Um, so the attack which forces an end user to execute unwanted actions on a web app in which they're currently un uh, authenticated, right? So if you're authenticated on a different website and, uh, and someone, and then you navigate to a different website, but you're still authenticated on that uh, website. If someone performs a, uh, a post request, uh, then those cookies will get uh, sent um, unless, again, you mitigate against that. I'm, I'm going to show you right now how to, uh, how to mitigate against that. So normal users, uh, CSRF attacks can force the user to perform requests uh, like transferring phones, funds, changing an email address. So again, if you're logged into um, maybe uh, Gmail or even WordPress, for example, then, uh, then this can be, um, you know, th this can be a lot worse because once an attacker has access to, uh, to your identity, if they log into, for example, as an admin uh, credentials and then they log into some WordPress website, then they can, uh, you know, they, they can do SQL injections or attacks that um, have a different level of, uh, of security access that are way more um, more dangerous than a simple uh, a simple attack. Uh, for admin users, again, uh, it can force admins to add new admin users uh, on a database, for example, uh, or in the worst case, to run commands directly on the server, right? So you can run like shell scripts even. Uh, and again, this, um, you know, if, 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 if an attacker has this level of access at this point, uh, you're, you're pretty much host, uh, and, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of screwed. Okay. So like, don't let it get there. Um, but it's, you know, this is, um, you know, with the CSRF, uh, method, um, it, it's, it's possible to, um, to scale the access of, of an attack. So effective, even when attackers can read, uh, the HTTP response, as we saw, because the way the browsers works and the way cookies work and the way requests work they get sent the cookie anyways uh as long as the user has uh has been authenticated right so and this is that that concept of uh, ambient authority and these are you know these are some of the issues with it so 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 what what are we left with right so what's the idea can we remove ambient authority when a request originates from a different website so is that possible yes it is we're going to cover how, how to use that um and the way it's done is uh through another property that uh that cookies have called same site cookies so this came in the spec afterwards so after a lot of these attacks were being uh out in the wild and you know they were happening more and more often and they you know we, we were able to see the escalation of attacks happening then uh the spec changed uh and we created a new um a new property on the cookies um api spec that's called same site so the same site uh cookie attribute um is to prevent a cookie from being sent with the request initiated by other sites so again that attack that we showed of uh another user being uh, authenticated and then even though they're in a different domain those same cookies uh by by way that the request is uh it's um that the user is still authenticated the session still active then those requests would actually uh, still go on, right? So, and then there's um, there's three um, there's three levels or uh, three properties that um, three values that you can set on that property. The first one's none. So this is the default one actually, uh, which essentially says same site uh, equals none. This is the default behavior, and essentially what it says is uh, always send the cookies, right? So this is what we saw. So on, unless you actively defend against it, uh, there is no defense, right? So because the browsers by default uh, have it set to none. Um, now that the next level is some site lags. I know it sounds, uh, like, you know, lags, like it's, it's pretty relaxed. It's, it's, it's a lot better than none. Uh, what it does is, uh, and this is probably the, this is probably a, a good default to have. Uh, again, it depends, you know, how you're looking at things and the filter you're looking at it through, uh, the perspective, 
but um, I think none is fine. I think it should be on um, on it should be on the developer the burden to like protect this type of stuff because again, for tracking purposes and backwards compatibility, I do believe that same site uh, same site none is the correct use, uh, and only if you're a pen tester or again if you're a developer, then these things become um. Uh, Relevant, but I do not think that uh, users should have to worry about that. And again, because of I think the the more customizable the web becomes, uh, I think we can create much better user experiences. And for that reason, but again, uh, if it's if it's a, if it's an issue of uh, CSRF, uh, then maybe lax is the correct thing because you you would only want that um that experience to originate and and then happen on the same domain or the same origin. But we can think of other experiences which are cross-domain, right? And and if we're not just thinking of domains, but if we're thinking of the web as a full-fledged application where different sites are pulling from different uh, resources that can originate or they can be hosted on different uh, origins, then um, you know, I, I again, I, I'm I'm of the belief that with better tracking and tracking maybe is a bad word, but the the fact that we track user behavior across different websites. It simply means that we could create uh, much better experiences that are customized to each individual user once the, te the technology is there, right? So, but anyways, um, you know, that's I think that's uh, an opinion that we should all um, come to our own conclusions on that. But you know, uh, Lax uh, kind of does that, right? So Lax withhold the cookies on the sub resources requests originating from other sites and allows them on top level requests. So if you're on the same origin uh, domain, it allows it and um, if you're in another domain, then it doesn't. And then there's this kind of um, uh, same site equals strict, which is the most aggressive uh, setting you can set, which only sends cookie if the request originates from the website that set the cookie, right? So that's like e even subdomains on the same domain uh, won't work on this, right? So same site strict is, um, I mean, I, I, th I, I think it's pretty aggressive, but again, it's there. And um, unless you're like a bank or you have some very sensitive information, um, you know, maybe this is what you want to set, but uh, other than that, um, th there's probably, uh, not what, uh, what you want to set because if, if you do set it to strict, like, let's say, um, if you've seen any embedded, um, maybe Facebook comments embedded on different sites and then people can leave comments, but, uh, the comment actually, the comment box actually knows that you still logged into Facebook. So it, it comes from you yourself, your account, uh, right. That's a behavior that we, we, we kind of like on the web, right? And that's only a, um, that's only possible because of the cookie session that you have from your uh, from your Facebook account. But uh, if it was set to strict, if that cookie was set to strict, then that wouldn't be possible because um, that um, that code that's embedded on a different website, which is again the behavior that 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 use case uh, expects, would not work um, for this, right? So again, uh, very aggressive. I, I think lax is uh, is probably the best uh, security. Um, security wise, that's probably the best for cookies that are, um, sensitive. Uh, and again, the way you set it is, uh, on, on, once you set the cookie, uh, you, you put secure HTTP only the path, always set it to a uh, home because like we said, that's, that should not be used as security feature. And then you put the, as the last feature, same site equals lax or none. Again, remember none, you don't have to set it because that's the default. So that's kind of what it comes with when you don't set anything or strict, right? So you can put none lax or strict and then that's um, that's kind of what you have. So yeah, so the way to mitigate uh, cross-site uh, request forgery, it's, uh, and we're gonna cover it in the code. So we're gonna, we're gonna run over the same attack and then we're going to try to protect against it, defend against it uh, with, uh, with what we've learned uh, so far, okay? So before we get into that and I show you how to defend against the attack, some final thoughts on cookies. Uh, cookies are used to implement sessions. Okay. Remember, HTTP is not uh, a stateful uh, protocol; it's a stateless protocol. So we use cookies uh, to have this ambient authority and implement the the concept or the idea of sessions across different requests. Uh, remember, the, the server can never trust uh, trust data from the client. It's not that the client is untrustworthy; it's more on, on the way that the web is created, which any request can come from any client, right? So it's a uh, it's a very um, uh, flexible. Um, system that the way the web is created and because it's so flexible it also makes it kind of uh in some ways also very uh, vulnerable to attacks because it has to um it, it has to serve and um and, and and accommodate all these different clients that might be requesting uh different uh uh requesting uh, resources and uh it's not something that the server can necessarily control 
Um, so ambient authority is useful, but opens us up to additional risks. Um, and if you remember one thing, say your cookies like this, um, secure, HTTP only, the path, uh, same site lacks, and then uh, expire uh, maybe like 30 days, right, from when it's set. Um, again, you can always set the cookie again. So this is probably the best, um, the best defense, especially when dealing with cookies. And now let's go over the same attack that we showed at the beginning, and let's see how we can defend against it. Let's go over the attack one more time so we can remember. So remember, this person logged into their account. Okay. And let me show you the, the server code really quick for the victim. So we have um, pre pretty much uh, a table called users and balances. Uh, we gave Alice 500 and we gave Bob 100 and we can see their uh, passwords. So the first things, and then we just created a simple express uh, server. Uh, the first route we get, it's um, is the home home route. So what we're doing is uh, we're getting the session ID from the cookies. So if the user already has a session ID, um, we're going to get it from, uh, from the cookie and it's called the session ID. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see if, uh, if that session ID matches any of the, of the sessions that we have, uh, over here. And then what we can do is, uh, it's a mapping pretty much from, uh, from the user to the, to the session ID. And then that way we know that, uh, their, uh, their username and their password, uh, was correct. So if username, okay, so if we do find that their sessions matches uh, their session ID, then, uh, then we set their balances uh, for that username. So we get the balance for that username, and then we render out their profile uh, at that point. If, if we don't have that, then we have the index page where they can log in. Uh, then we have the login page, which again uh, tries to uh, get the username from the rec.body. So at this point, we're going to be sending the username through the login form okay so remember uh that's the the login form then the password uh will become the users and then through the the username um then we get it from that um that table so if the password okay that we get from the table matches the password that they entered what we're going to do is we're going to and this is so again this is the first uh way to um to defend against the session hacking attack um what you want to do is you want to create a session id that's uh, random enough, right? That every single user um, that that you can that you can compare it essentially against something that's on the server. But at the same time, if someone were to uh, to get that session ID without any context, then uh, then it's not something that they can use against the user, right? So for that, what we use is we're going to use the random bytes function um, that's part of JavaScript, and we're going to um, base sixty four encode it. And then that's going to become the next session ID, which is, again, that's just going to become the, the user session ID. So we're going to set the session ID. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to show you without the uh, secure true, the HTTP only, and the same site lacks. So I'm going to comment this stuff out just so we can see how the attack was performed. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to do it again. But uh, I'll change it at that point so that we can defend against it, okay? And then uh, all that happens in the logout path, it's, again, we're going to get the session ID from the cookies because if they're logged in, then we know they had a session ID. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and delete session ID from our, from our table. And then we're going to clear that cookie called session ID. And then we're going to re redirect the user back to the, to the homepage. And then the transfer route. So the transfer route is the following. So we have the session ID, which again, we're going to get from, uh, from the cookies. Okay. Um, and then, uh, what we're going to do is pretty much the same thing we did for the, for the homepage. So we're going to get the username from the sessions table. Uh, I'm passing it in that session ID. Uh, if, if it turns out that there is no user uh, name, then we're going to send a fail. So it's like, hey, you know what? That, um, that's, uh, that's not allowed. Uh, so again, that's if they don't have, you know, if they've logged out and then the attacker tries to, um, to send a post request, but at that point, then uh, that user has logged out already. So the session is not active. Then, uh, then we know that, you know, they shouldn't be, they, sh they shouldn't be able to transfer any, uh, any funds if they, they don't have a session active. Okay. Uh, if they do have a session active, then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, we're going to get the amount from the body that they want to transfer, and then we're going to send uh, we're going to get the two also from the body to who they want to send it to, and then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to de uh, deduct from the balances table uh, and that username the amount, and then we're going to add um, to the from the balances table to the two user the uh, the correct amount. So essentially, that's what we're going to do, and then we're going to redirect them back to the homepage. So that's uh, that's pretty much the um, the victim server. 
pretty simple express server uh, on the attacker server what we're doing is uh, we just have the home page and then the attacker transfer form uh, that's so so the reason I created the attacker transfer form and I'll show you the HTML for this right now is so that we can um, include it in a in a in an iframe and the reason for the iframe is that once we perform a post request on the um, on the form usually what happens is that we get redirected so because we, we you know we don't want the user to actually notice that anything it's happening because uh, we want to hide the attack so if we put it in an iframe then that's one way that um, that we can bypass that redirection at least on the for, for, from the perspective of the of the client right of the victim uh, and then for the app get uh, for the home page then uh, what we're rendering is, uh, is essentially any any random page um, and all we have in this page so I'm gonna go over here and then on the attacker page all we have is the iframe uh, okay so that's that's all there is but let me just go ahead and um, let's put in an h1 here and then uh, attacker site just so it's, it's really clear where where we are and uh, and yeah that's pretty much it and then the index file you guys saw that it's a pretty simple uh, page just with a login form and then the profile page uh, again shows the balance and then uh, has a form to uh, to make the transfer, uh, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, so let me show you the attacker uh, transfer form. So the attacker transfer form, it's a post request on the attacker's website. So remember, this can be this can be embedded into any any website at all, right? There is uh, like I said, the the way HTTP is set up, it doesn't stop us from uh, from making any post or get requests to uh, to any other uh, HTTP client. Okay, so at that point, we're going to actually uh, perform a post request to the local host, which is the victim's um, computer in this case, and then the transfer uh, path. And then uh, at that point, we're gonna just enter the amount uh, that uh, that we want to transfer. So I think if uh, if we put here, so let me just do this. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and run the attack again, so we can uh, so we can see it in action. And I'm gonna go ahead and restart the server so that we know that. Um, so we can see it working from the beginning to the end. Okay, so then I'm gonna go ahead and start the victim server up. I'm gonna start the attacker server on a different port, and then I'm actually going to start a. Um, I'm gonna use ng rock in uh, so that we can actually be on a different uh, domain completely, so that we can see the the full effect of the uh, of the attack. So I'm gonna refresh here, and then all our cookies. Uh, the cookie is still here from the previous uh, example. But then at this point, this cookie is invalidated, okay? Because remember, once the user, once a new session started, then uh, then that cookie will be deleted. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it over here, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll go to the network tab, okay? And uh, I'm gonna clear this stuff out, and then uh, yeah. So I'm gonna log in, okay, as Alice, and then uh, password, and then let's go ahead and see what got sent on the um, through the form. So it, as you can see. This was not encrypted, right? So anyone in looking in this uh, at this request can uh, can see the username and the password sent. Okay, uh, so that's that's one vulnerability. Then the other one, we see that in the response, we got a um, the session, we got a new session uh, given to us. Okay, so now that uh, that we have that, let's go over to the attacker um, site and then let's open up the um, let's open up the network tab as well. Uh, and then let's go ahead and uh, and transfer some funds. So we're going to transfer in this case a uh, hundred dollars to Bob, and then let's go ahead and click transfer. So we get the transfer. Um, we get the transfer request over here. So that's a request that uh, that this attacker website uh, created. And then let's uh, let's see what's included in the request headers. We can see that in the request headers we have the session ID, right? And uh, and if we compare the the ID to the to the cookie session ID that we have for that user right now is the same session ID right and uh, although it's originating from a completely different site okay so this one's actually coming from um, from a completely different domain right so different origin all completely right so that's a request to localhost 4000 but we can see that the refer is uh, actually localhost 5000 right so that's uh, a completely different website issuing uh, on the users we have on a um, a request and uh, one of the things I want to try out is I, I want I want to show you how you can actually do this through JavaScript so that you don't even have to fill out the form and you can automate the whole process or, or an attacker can automate a whole process um, themselves okay 
So what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and write a little script. Okay. And, uh, and then let me show you that in a, in a second. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and add a little script uh, to the attacker transfer form. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, what we're going to write is we're going to write document of forms. Uh, so in this case, we know we only have one form, but if, again, if, if you have access to the, to the form or if the attacker gets access to the form, then, uh, through JavaScript, they can give it an ID and then, um, target that form. And then what we're going to do is we're going to submit on the behalf of that user, the, we're going to click the submit button. I also added a value 100 and, um, we added, uh, the amount to Bob. And then what we want to do is we're going to come to the, um, to the attacker, let's see the attacker EJS. And then I'm going to put, uh, display. Uh, and I'm going to uh, call it none. So this way, uh, this, although we're, we're still going to be on the attacker site, what we want to do is we want to uh, see what would happen if the attacker was running this, uh, just so you can see how hard it is to spot from the perspective of the victim. So I'm going to refresh the page. Now we don't have access to, um, now if, if this was a completely different, you know, um, website that the user is on, then they would have no idea that we have uh, an iframe uh, form that's making a post request to a site that they can potentially have a cookie session still active, right? But if we do go to Atlas's account and then we refresh our account, we see that the current balance is 100. And I'm going to go ahead and refresh this again. Uh, and then if we go back to Atlas, so again, at this point, you see nothing happening, right, on this site other than so the user will be completely oblivious that a post request is being made. But if we go back to their account, we can see that their balance actually goes back to a uh, it's, it's actually decrementing, right? So the, their, their account is definitely being uh, affected, um, but they would have no idea from looking at this site that that's actually happening, right? And that's how it could be done um, with JavaScript and, uh, and a simple uh, JavaScript injection. Uh, and that's a uh, cross-site um, cross uh, request forgy attack uh, by using the session hacking uh, attack. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and... So stop the servers, okay? Then what we want to do is I'm going to go to the victim server and now we're going to apply the um, our um, to our cookies if uh, our defense. So and then we're going to see if the, that attack still works. So now to our cookie, what we're going to do is secure true. Okay, on the login path, uh, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, so once they log in, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, issue the cookie. We're going to put secure true. That way it's over HTTP every time. And it's not, uh, in unencrypted. We're going to put a HTTP only, uh, as well. So it's not accessible uh, to JavaScript. We're going to set uh, same site lacks. Um, yeah, instead of none. And then we're going to set the max age for, uh, for 30 days. Uh, and then again, uh, that's pretty much it. And then we have the logout uh, path uh, and then the transfer path. So for that, uh, let's see here. Do we need to change anything? No, I think we're good. So I'm going to go ahead and save um, this file. And let's go ahead and start up the servers. So the servers, again, victim server. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the attacker server. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, actually start ng rock on uh, port 5000. That way we're on a different, um, we're on a different uh, domain. I'm going to go ahead and reload this. So again, we should see that we're logged out. Uh, if I go to, if I go to, um, let's go to uh, the application tab. And uh, let me just delete this uh, previous cookie. Although it's not, uh, it's not valid anymore. Let's just delete it. So we're working with, um, with a uh, clean slate. All right, so we're logged in, uh, and I'll look into what the secure. Uh, oh, the the reason why secure true is not going to work right now is because we're uh, over HTTP uh, instead of HTTPS because we're on the local host. So again, that's um. So I'll comment it out for now. But as uh, as you can see, it's um. It, it didn't even let the cookie go through uh, because we weren't on HTTP. So at least we know that's working. Uh, okay, so now we have a session ID. Perfect. Now let's go and uh, go to our other uh, domain. I'm gonna exit out of here. Uh, so now we're on the attacker side. And if you remember, we, we have the div and all that uh, hidden, but uh, let's see. Okay, let, let me see the, um, let's, let's go ahead and see the, 
if if anything got uh got deducted. So nothing got deducted from this account, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and refresh it, and um, let's go ahead and go to the network tab, okay? And let's see what our uh, requests are sent. So now we, we sent a request to the um, to the transfer to the to the attacker transfer form, right? And then to the transfer uh, path on on the other domain, right? So on the four thousand domain, we, we we're sending a request to it, and uh, let's see what the request headers uh, has. So they refer the let's see if we see anything for the cookie. So the refer is that we have no cash. We see that there are no cookies being sent uh, anywhere. And um, yes, yeah, sex, uh, sex fetch. So same site. So same site is uh, since it's it's telling us since this is not from uh, since same site, we're not gonna actually uh, include um, the the cookie anymore. And uh, as you can see, even if we refresh this multiple times, right? Uh, we can see that we go back to uh, the bank uh, website and uh, then nothing has uh, this attack has not been uh, successful anymore. Okay, so there you go. That's how we um, that's what session hacking is. That's um, how we defend against it. And uh, as well, we went over uh, DNS, HTTP, and then uh, we're getting a much clearer view of how we can how we can go in and with just a few uh, simple defensive attack uh, defensive mechanisms really stop uh, attacks that uh, that can cause a lot of um, a lot of vulnerabilities in our systems and our applications and uh, protect our users in that case. Okay, so anyways, hope you enjoyed it. And then let's, uh, we're gonna move on to uh, different attacks now, uh, XSS and uh, iframe attacks. And then we're gonna uh, move over to the to server side attacks and then in injections. Okay, now in this part of the course, what we wanna cover is same origin policy. And this is important to understand uh, because this is fundamentally the security model that the web has implemented and once we understand this, we'll be able to uh, understand how is it that we can fetch different resources, not just from our own domain, but we, we will also understand how uh, other domains can fetch information from our own domain. So uh, resources that are not in the same uh, URL or domain, they can be uh, accessed uh, or not accessed. So we're gonna talk about some of the attacks and some of the defenses. And just so you can get an idea of some of the stuff that could happen, um, once we understand this, some of the attacks that we, we're going to cover in this uh, in this section, let's just uh, imagine that this is a login form, right? And uh, over here, what I've done is I've gone ahead and uh, implemented an iframe. So imagine that uh, this iframe, uh, so that some site you've iframed, and then an attacker, what they've done is that they've taken you maybe to a to a website that looks just like the bank website that uh, you used to log in into, right? And then you have the login screen and all that, but essentially. What they've done is they've they've iframed your bank uh, a website into their own website, and then essentially you couldn't tell the difference. Okay, now right here, what I'm doing is I'm showing that there are uh, just so you can tell that the iframe is uh, hosted on localhost port 5000, and then the 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 login form, for lack of a better term, is hosted on uh, port 4000, right? So we're we're trying to emulate here the fact that these two sites are completely different websites. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to type on this login form. And you can see how uh, an attacker can access the iframe and then um, based on what the login, based on the input on this field, it will show up. It will be reflected on uh, on this iframe over here. So let me just type a uh, username. And then as you can see, the attacker could be getting this information uh, as we type it in. So again, this is something that's um, that could be very dangerous. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the attacks to uh, mitigate against this, for example, I'll show you uh, really quick um, how we can actually decide that our site, we never want it to be uh, uh, able to be iframed. So before we, we talked about a defense that um, how, how we can defend based on cookies and same, same site origin. So setting that as a header uh, was, um, was one of the ways that we can um, mitigate against the uh, attacks that are session hacking attacks. But uh, another uh, type of attack, which is cross uh, site scripting, uh, which involves requesting resources that do not belong to the same origin and then um, accessing those um, so crossing this boundary over here uh, from one resource to the next and then uh, not just communicating but controlling this resource and making it do what uh, the attacker wants and again we, we saw an example here that this could be analogous to uh, someone even um, you know not just hijacking a session but uh, essentially really getting your credentials for uh, any website that uh, that you might be uh, logging into or a user of. Okay, so let's get into the same origin policy, what it is, and how does it work in the web essentially to create the web security model. 
So let's think about um, when we're in the web, okay, and we're, we're talking about web security, let's think about what should be allowed, right? So when we're thinking normally, okay, uh, as we're navigating websites and things like that, let's let's go over uh, a few scenarios and let's see if intuitive, uh, we can say, hey, you know what? I think this is something that the, should be allowed in the web or it shouldn't be allowed in the web, right? Uh, so let's let's go through the first one. Should site A be able to link to site B? Uh, well, yeah, I would say yes, because this is the main way that the web works, right? The web, it's made up of documents and those documents have links that link to other resources, right? So again, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. And this is essentially the way the whole web works, right? So the whole, the reason why it's actually called the web is because it's this uh, interconnected link structures that are connected to any, any other resource, right? So pretty much anything on the web uh, can be a link and can access uh, and can link to any other place on the web itself, right? So second thing, should site A be able to embed site B? Uh, again, you know, maybe there's uh, maybe there's good reasons for why someone might, well, might want to embed uh, something on their site that doesn't belong to them. So if you think of YouTube, for example, you can embed a YouTube video on any website, right? So they give you an embed uh, video and uh, that's actually a very, um, or, or any other um, video hosting website that uh, maybe you want to, you host it on their service, but then you want to show it uh, within your own uh, website context, again, a totally valid uh, reason for having this functionality be part of the web. Uh, another uh, scenario, which is, should site A be able to embed site B and modify its contents, right? So this is kind of what we were just uh, looking at in the previous example, where not just did we embed a website within another uh, website, so not just did we embed one frame within another frame, we were also able to change the contents of it um, so whenever someone types something in one, it kind of reflected on the other one, uh, immediately. Right. So that's, uh, th that, that again, that, that kind of gets us in like hot water because that, you know, there could be, uh, some reason why like that, that's definitely a vector which someone can, uh, can attack. Uh, but again, there could be, uh, totally, uh, you know, valid reasons for having that functionality be available. For example, if we wanted to create an API in real time and uh, we wanted to reflect to anyone who subscribed to that uh, endpoint uh, the changes as they happen in real time, right? That's completely valid and we see that all the time with uh, real time uh, services. So again, um, you know, it's just something that we have to, uh, just something that we have to know and, uh, and think about. Uh, the, the next one, should site A be able to submit a form to site B? Again, we've seen this in the past, um, in previous uh, lessons, that whether it should or not, it's definitely possible, right? So we, we definitely know that this is uh, part of the, from the beginning of the web, this was uh, implemented, and uh, we saw how we can, um, we can kind of um, attack this by, uh, with uh, session cookies, and uh, session hijacking can, can actually happen because of this feature. But again, it's, uh, it's been part of the web since the beginning, and uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. So, so yeah, this is something that, uh, that happens all the time. And, uh, and again, there are completely valid reasons why someone might want to automate a certain process on, uh, on the client side. And, uh, and for that to happen, we, we're going to submit a form on the user's behalf. So again, there's uh, completely different valid reasons for, uh, for this functionality to also exist on the web. Uh, the next one, should site A be able to embed images from site B? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. We, uh, we can actually. Let's say that we want to host our images on a CDN. That way, they can be um, they can be cached, and then our, we don't have to use up our own bandwidth, but we can still serve our own images. And that happens all the time for our big websites that have a lot of traffic, and uh, we want to you know make it as efficient as possible and optimize that bandwidth. So again, embedding images, and uh, even the next one, which is embedding scripts. If you've ever embedded uh, jQuery or you know any other scripts into your own uh, websites as you're developing, you know, this is again, just part of how the web works. And, um, you know, f as far as we're concerned, we, we, I don't think it's going anywhere because it's, you know, again, it's fundamental to how we build websites. And uh, as the web becomes more and more powerful, uh, I think this is even, um, this is just something that's going to become even more of a uh, prominent feature and something that we can really uh, be more useful. So again, I don't think this is going anywhere, but, uh, but again, this is again part of the stuff that we have to be uh, thinking about when we're thinking about uh, same origin policy, right? Because th these are all parts of the web where we're accessing uh, resources that are not necessarily par uh, part of our own domain, uh, but that we need in order to serve uh, our users' uh, endpoint. But again, 
because of this, uh, you can kind of see how all these things uh, can open us up to certain risk and vulnerabilities on, uh, on the client side. So when we're talking about same origin policy, if you remember one thing, remember this. This is the fundamental security model of the web, right? And, and it goes something like this, right? So this is kind of how, um, how the spec is, uh, is laid out. Two pages from different, from different sources should not be allowed to interfere with each other, okay? So if, if, there, if two pages are in different domains, then, you know, essentially, someone should not be allowed to mess with one other domain. But again, we have seen how with iframes or with cookies and things like that, uh, you know, we, we, we can get around some of this stuff, but this is the essential uh, security uh, policy that the web is trying to enforce when, uh, you know, when, when, they create, uh, when they created the spec, essentially. So if we think of the web as an operating system, um, it, it really will help us out in understanding how some of these uh, security features and, uh, came to be and then some of the stuff that we can do to mitigate it. So what is an origin? That's the first thing we need to understand. So an origin, uh, if we're thinking of the web as an operating system, it's very analogous to an OS process. Uh, so when you open up uh, an application on your computer, right, that spins up a new process on your, on, on your, uh, on your computer. And the web, in many ways, whenever you spin up a new tab or uh, a new website, that's kind of like a, like a, uh, a new uh, process. And again, on the web, it's called task. And we went over this in the, some of the first um, uh, lessons. But, you know, it's very similar to a process on, uh, on, on the computer itself. The web browser, um, you can think of it as analogous to an OS kernel, right? So this is where uh, pretty much we are going to load and have access to APIs that are part of the browser or uh, to the web itself, right? Uh, or to the origin, right? So if you are on, uh, let's say you open up iTunes or any music player on your computer, then that has access to the files where your music is stored, right? Or if you're opening up some other, um, some other uh, application on your computer, then that has access to the memory allocation on, on your device, right? So again, uh, the web browser is pretty analogous to this. Once we open one up, it's analogous to the kernel and through the kernel, we can, um, we, we have access to different APIs and uh, different services um, of, of the web itself, right? So sites rely on the web browsers uh, to enforce all these systems and security rules, right? So we're just like the kernel and how a computer when, um, you know, if, if some malware gets installed on your, on your kernel, then that's, you know, that kind of screws everything up because then your computer is compromised. It's the same thing on the browser because we are relying on the browser, uh, in this case, to act as the operating system and to enforce the security rules that the web, uh, that the spec is supposed to enforce, right? But again, um, the browser at the beginning was not intended to be this way, but it has evolved to this, uh, to, to kind of uh, this powerful uh, application that everyone uses and as we're trying to move applications uh, more away from uh, certain marketplaces to be uh, broader accessible, then we, we turn to the web and the web, uh, again, wasn't made for this thing. So just like an OS, if there's a bug in the browser itself, then there are these rules that go out the window, right? So we're, we're going to go over the rules that are the same origin um, uh, rules. But again, if there is, a, if there's an issue with, uh, with the browser or the browser gets compromised, right, or someone's able to execute some code on the uh, on the web on the browser then kind of these rules go out the window so what's the basic rule again the basic rule is this given two separate javascript executions right so th two different tabs two different domains one should be able to access the other only if the protocols the host names and the port numbers associated with their host documents match exactly right so and this protocol host or uh, port tuple is called an origin so let me just Again, let me just show you an example of what, what, what we mean by this. This right here, right? The protocol, the, the host, and the port. So this, this whole thing. And, and mostly what we see on, um, on the web are these parts. We usually uh, don't see the port number, although it's there implicitly. Uh, for most websites, it's port 80. Uh, once we have this thing, this is kind of um, only... So if, if this website is trying to access some other resource, it, what needs to match in order for that resource to go through or for that request to, uh, to go through and not get uh, blocked by course or uh, for, by the same origin policy, then the HTTPS, right? So if you're making a request from HTTPS and you're requesting something over HTTP, then that's going to get blocked. If it's uh, trying to access something from a different website, so a different domain essentially, host, then that's going to get blocked. Uh, and if it's on a different port as well, 
then that's going to get blocked. So all these things have to match for all those requests to go through, right? If you're trying to make a request uh, from within JavaScript. And uh, just to show that this is not very hard to, uh, if, if we were actually, if we wanted to, um, to create our own function that uh, checked if we, uh, just like the same origin policy. So if we wanted to execute this ourselves and actually create our own function, it's, it's not really that difficult, right? All we have to check um, is the URL protocol, right? The host name and then the port. And if all those things do match, then what we say is, yeah, this website's allowed to uh, request uh, a resource from um, from the, the resource they're trying to request, then it's allowed and uh, we should return it at that point, right? So we should return a response code of uh, 200 and everything is fine. If this, if, if one of these things do not match, then we know that we have an issue and then someone else is trying to access a resource. So this could be something that's behind a paywall or behind some uh, type of authentication. And then that way we know that uh, then they should not have access to this, uh, this resource, right? Okay, now let's go over the attack that we saw at the beginning of the, of the lesson and let's see how we implemented that attack, right? So the idea is, can, uh, can we send messages from a parent page to a child iframe or vice versa, right? So we need a way to get around the same origin policy to allow two different origins to communicate. Now that we know that the same origin policy is not gonna allow us to do this, uh, we need a way, uh, because again, there, there are very valid reasons for why we might want to communicate, uh, again, and, and one that comes to mind automatically for I think all of us will be an API, right? How do we access an API uh, that's on a different origin and, uh, and communicate with that API if we need some data or some resource that's, that's not necessarily something that we have ourselves, right? So this could be weather data and you're trying to access the weather API or anything like that, right? So first we're gonna talk about how we're going to um, execute this attack, right? So what are, the, what are the vulnerabilities in this? And then, then we're gonna go ahead and talk about some of the defenses for this thing. So the, the way the attack was executed is actually very simple. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the child, uh, the child um, code. So I, I, I'm gonna set up again two servers to to kind of showcase the um, that the, these are two different. Okay, remember two different origins, and the origins are the protocol, the host, and the port. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, one of them. The the child is gonna be on port uh, five thousand, and then the parent is gonna be on port four thousand. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to do this on the child side, okay, which is the, um, which is the page that's going to be iframed, right? So this is going to be kind of the, the page is going to get attacked. We're going to get, um, we created a div, then we get, um, then we get a handle to that div, and then we're going to set an interval and that interval, what it's going to do is it's going to accept, uh, through this window hash. And, and for a long, long time, this is the way that, uh, we were able to get around, uh, the origin uh, communication. So what we did is, if you remember when uh, when I talked at the beginning about the the way URLs are formed, we we can add to the URL at the end a little hash, and that actually does not refresh the page. What it does is it's kind of like an anchor tag, and uh, it takes you to that page on the tag. So what we can do is we can use that uh, part of the URL as a uh, communication mechanism, and then what uh, what we're gonna do on the parent side. It's uh, we're gonna create a, a, an input, right? So we have an input over here, okay? Uh, so we're gonna get a handle to that, and then we're also gonna get a handle to the iframe. So we're gonna iframe that child uh, page in here, okay? And remember, that's hosted on um, on port five thousand. Uh, so now that we have access to the input and the iframe, now we that we have a handle to those. Uh, over here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an event listener, and anytime something changes in the input, what we want to do is we want to change that iframe source. So remember. We can change also on the, because we're embedding this iframe, then we can change the source of it, which again, this is what, why the attack works and how we can get across uh, cross origin, uh, you know, like uh, across the origin domain policy that, uh, that we shouldn't be able to uh, do uh, because these two pages are actually on, on, different, uh, on different origins. But anyways, this is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna, we're going to include the regular uh, URL. So up to this point, everything is the same. But then what we're gonna do is we're going to add a hash, okay? And then we're going to uh, encode uh, that URL component, the input value, we're gonna encode it. And then we're gonna pass it as the source. And then over here in the, in the child component, if you remember, we have that interval, so we're just gonna pull, right? So we're just going to, uh, as, as soon as, like every, you know, every millisecond, we're gonna pull and see if that hash has changed. And if it's changed, then we're gonna change the context of that div uh, to reflect the change uh, that happened. So again, 
So this is the, this is the first uh, attack we're going to do, and then we're going to change the attack a little bit to show you another uh, method that uh, we can get uh, past this uh, the same origin policy. So I'm going to go ahead to the browser, and I'm going to refresh this, and then let me just make sure that on the attacker server, uh, yeah, so we've uh, actually commented this uh, the defense out as well. So at this point, and again, this a, a, a lot of remember, there's a lot of forms on uh, on the web, and a lot of uh, you know if if you're not actually being uh, proactive about is securing your forms and all these things can happen and again uh, it could be as simple as uh, you know just again a, a little simple message like we're, we're seeing over here that's being passed around but and it could be just some API data that that's exactly what you want but it can also be um, some credentials some user credentials that get passed around and uh, and again it's, it's a huge vulnerability if it does happen to be credentials because at that point then someone can not just take over the identity of the user like we saw in session hijacking then essentially they can own the whole account right they can own the whole um you know that that whole website and at that point they can do whatever they want so but anyways the the way this is working just so we can see that we're communicating across origins it's uh it's through the hash so if if you look over here i'm going to show you in the um, in the body itself that uh it's pretty hacky okay I, i'll admit it but this is the way it was done for a long time but uh, so I'm gonna put it over here. Um, let's say, uh, you know, cross, um, yeah, cross origin uh, policy hacked. So as you can see over here, we're we're seeing that the after the the hash, the everything is being reflected on the URL, but it's not being uh, refreshed as we would if we were to uh, change some of the path. So since we're essentially not changing the path. All we're doing is we're using this hash as a communication mechanism. Then, um, then we can see how we can hack the origin policy. Okay, so let's go back to the child and let's change it. So eventually, um, the spec got around and the committee got around to changing the spec. And then what what they did is because again, as APIs became more prevalent and uh, people wanted a way to access different resources or communicate across uh, different origins, we needed a better way that uh that was less vulnerable right and had an actual spec built out for it so what we're gonna do is uh we're gonna change on the child side now we're gonna add an event listener okay and we're gonna listen to a message re uh event so this is when the post um we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take um take advantage of the post message api okay so that's what i'm gonna show you now and the post message api what it allowed us to do is it allowed us to um, do exactly this with sites that are cooperating. So if you are building an API and you want to cooperate with people that have access to this API and essentially, you know, communicate across origins, then this one way that's uh, that's a lot more secure and uh, and there's actually defenses against this. Whereas this way that we were doing before, you know, if this is the way you're doing things or if it's, if a website is doing th uh, things this way, then it becomes very vulnerable to um, to um, Cross origin uh, policy uh, attacks. So we're gonna attack uh, attach an uh, a message handler, a message listener to the window event, uh, and then what we're gonna do is if event origin does not equal localhost four thousand. So at this point we're saying hey the only people that we want uh, to have access to this is uh, if if it's coming from port four thousand. And at, at at this stage you can pretty much set any origin you want. So you can change the host, uh, the protocol, anything at uh, at this point. Uh, because again, this is something that you're actually built. This is a spec that's actually built into the browsers nowadays. Uh, and then, if it's not from uh, from somewhere somewhere trusted, then uh, we're gonna do an early return. Okay, and we're gonna say, hey, you know what? We're we're not gonna actually share the data with them. Um, uh, but if it is from localhost four thousand, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say uh, div the text content uh, make it the event data. So we're gonna make it uh, something very similar to what we were doing up here. But uh, at this point, you know you can see that we don't have to use the, the hash or any of the this pretty much this hacky sketchy method and uh, we can use the the post message API which is much nicer uh, so on, on the parent uh, frame all we have to change is this line of code and then uh, once we have again that handle to the iframe uh, we're gonna do content window uh, and then the post message API so we're gonna say hey um, from that I message as a uh, as as we've seen uh, changes uh, events uh, being inputted, what we want to do is um, we, we want to get the, the input event. Yeah, so when whenever something changes in the input, okay, what we're going to do is 
we're going to post it okay so we're going to attach it to the iframe through the post message api okay and then remember the child is using the add event listener and they're listening to the post message so anything that comes in through the post message and sp specifically from uh the the 4000 port then they're going to say yeah that's that's acceptable and that's uh that's again that's where this uh website is going to be hosted on port 4000 so and then we're going to include with it the input dot value right so just uh send the value Again, at this point, we don't have to encode a URI component because then uh, the browser is going to take care of sanitizing this for us. And we're going to say uh, the, the only website that we want this to actually um, go to is to port 5000, right? So if, uh, if someone else maybe embeds an iframe and tries to change this, uh, they won't be able to, right? So if they, they try to change a message because the child is saying that uh, they, they want to accept only uh, messages from port 4000, and then the, the, the parent is saying that... Uh, they want to send only messages to port 5000 so they're essentially saying hey we want to cooperate with each other and uh, we know this is a uh, cross um you know cross origin domains but in in any case uh because we're using the post message api then uh it, it makes it uh kind of a um, safe uh, a safe api to use so this uh this form of communication across uh, origins so i'm gonna go ahead and uh let me let me just restart the servers okay and then we're going to um what well, well, we should see is essentially the same thing, but I'm going to show you how uh, now with this method, then uh, the users, we can achieve the same thing. So if we wanted to implement this, for example, for an API, this, this would be the right way to do it. And now we're, we're saying uh, cross origin, um, cross origin uh, request. Uh, but as we can see over here, the URL, okay, uh, is not changing. So, and everything is going through the post message API at this point, which is again, uh, a lot safer because this has actually been implemented in the spec and it's, uh, and, and safe to use. Okay. So there you go. That's, that's one of the defense against, uh, not just a defense, uh, but now that we have gone over the attack and you can see how, you know, the different, if someone embeds, uh, you know, a website within another frame and then, uh, there's an input field, then someone can use this post message API or the other method we're using to essentially attack that vector. Now, if you want to completely stop this from happening, uh, then what you need to do is uh, not, not you know, if, if what you want to make sure is that your website does not get iframed, and uh, because once it gets iframed, then it opens us up to a whole bunch of attacks that we, we can't stop. Uh, for example, someone changing the contents of the website, someone injecting JavaScript at that point, and it, it just becomes very, very difficult to stop. Then, uh, then what we need is a new header, and the header is called X Frame Options. Um, and then what you want to set it to is deny. Okay, so once we do that and we refresh this page, we can see that that page now is not being able to be iframed. And although we can type in here whatever we want, so even if someone was trying to uh, iframe us and uh, and get the data that uh, we were typing in in whichever inputs, then uh, at that point it won't matter anyways because uh, they won't be able to iframe us. And, uh, and no data will be uh, leaked into uh, the parent or the child. So again, that's the, the header for that. It's X frame options and, uh, and then just set it to deny. And, uh, and again, so if you're on, on the server, uh, you can set this yourself and, uh, and then you, you're pretty much set as far as, um, as far as that attack is concerned. Okay, so there you go. That's all. So that's, you know, that's one way, okay? If we wanted to communicate across origins, but you know, because of the way that the same origin policy is set up, we know we can't do that, right? So we need a way to get around. One way to get around is through the post message API. Uh, that's the way that you should be using. So don't use the other uh, API because again, that's, that's, uh, that opens us up to a lot of vector attacks. So we wanna use the one that's safer and that's the post message API, which what it does is it, it, it does a secure uh, cross origin communication between two cooperating origins. So as, as we said, it's very important to put who you want to accept messages from and who you want to send messages from okay so you can't you can't forget that part um uh, and then what it allows us to do is it allows us to send our uh, strings and arbitrarily complicated data uh across origins okay so because this is actually implemented in the spec itself and it's not some hack uh we can actually send a lot more information uh through this channel and um you know we can even send video uh, uh information and uh, a lot more complex uh, objects. So not just uh, simple strings, okay? Um, 
Now, another thing I want to point out here is I, I, want, to, I want us to remember that cookies do not obey the same origin policy, okay? And we saw that when we were uh, doing the session hacking attack, okay? And the, the simple reason for this is that cookies were created before the same origin policy. So they have a different uh, security model. Now, after cookies and, uh, you know, they were implemented in 94 and I think uh, uh, the same origin policy was implemented in 95. What happened was that, you know, people were catching on and they were like, wow, this, you know, Cookies really open us up to a lot of attacks, and if, if we don't have a secure way that uh, the websites can request uh, resources from each other, then um, then that's you know then the web was going to be kind of screwed. So then that's why the same origin policy came into being. So cookies are again more specific than same origin policy, um, and and again at the same time they can be less specific. So because cookies have and again we saw that with uh, you can say uh, you can say your cookies to the same site. Uh, and then, you know, because of that, then it can be read from JavaScript or it can be, it, it, it won't, they won't be included within the request headers themselves. Um, so that's one way to stop the, you know, passing around information across different uh, domains. But now that we have same origin policy and you can see how that can be bypassed, uh, then what we essentially need um, to configure this and make it, uh, make it safer, it's, um, it's that header which is uh, X-Frame options, and then just set that to deny, okay? And then that will allow us to uh, abide by the same origin policies, and then we can relax it whenever we need to. So we can deny, essentially, uh, any bad actors from requesting resources from our servers uh, if we don't want to send those resources. And at the same time, we have the capability to relax those, uh, th those policies and send information to anyone that we want to uh, so again, you know, we have, I think the best of both words, uh, both worlds when, uh, when, when we do it that way. Right. So, uh, one of the caveats that I want to talk about and one of the attacks that you should be aware of, uh, because of these, uh, these methods of the same origin policy, uh, besides the one that we talked about, I want to, I, I want to at least walk you through a few other ones that you might have seen out in the wild. And, um, uh, and again, because of the defenses that we, we talked about in this, uh, in this lesson, then you'll be able to be secure yourself uh, from it. Uh, so can we prevent a site from embedding our site? Uh, as we saw, yes, we can, right? Uh, now, what might be the reason for this? Like, why would you want a website to not be uh, embedded into your site? Uh, besides, you know, some of the stuff that we've seen already, well, click jacking um, is something that's uh, very dangerous. And because cookies are, um, because let's say someone can embed your site within their website, right? Uh, so over here in this example, we have this example.com and it's clickbait, right? So I see it on TV and then they want the person at this point to click on this button, right? But what they're not seeing is that this eBay website, it's embedded within that frame, but it's, uh, in, in this example, just so that uh, you can see, they, they've set the opacity to 10, but essentially you can pretty much set the opacity to zero, right? So when the person clicks that free button, they will actually not be clicking on the free button themselves, they will be clicking on the page that's on top of that, that frame that's on top, which will be the eBay site. And if they're logged into eBay, right? So if that session is still active and they buy that uh, that item, that's called the click jacking attack, okay? Which is different from session hacking. But again, it's because of the same origin policy. Uh, and if someone embeds that website then, and the way cookies are set up, right? Then at that point, three things have happened. They've hijacked the session. They've uh, click jacked uh, the, um, they, they've jacked the click. So essentially they've, they've and, and they've crossed over the origin uh, as well. So that's, that's, that's a very dangerous attack. And, and again, this, this is, happens all the time, right? Especially with, uh, with older browsers that are not aware of this stuff or they don't, they don't have the same security policies as the same origin policy or, you know, like, or against, um, if you're a uh, web developer and you're not kind of defending against these things, these things can happen to your users and they can be very dangerous. So click jacking, again, that might be one of the reasons why you might not want someone to embed your website. Uh, so again, it's very valid. Uh, but again, if you want, if you're like setting up an API, then, uh, then that might be something that you want. And again, uh, you just have to make that decision for yourself, depending on the needs that you have and the needs that your users have and your website have. So can we prevent a site from, again, embedding our website? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Uh, and I show you the, the header for that. Uh, another thing that I want to, um, to draw your attention uh, to uh, is this paper called Frame Busting. Uh, busting frame busting. Uh, it was um, it was uh, published by uh, Stanford professors. Uh, I think like ten years ago. And there's the URL here for uh, for you to uh, access it. 
So essentially what they were able to do is, uh, they, they, and in the paper, it, it goes over a lot of examples of uh, how someone was able to embed, um, you know, one website, an attacker was able to embed a victim's website within their attacker, and then they were able to perform all, so or all sorts of attack and, uh, and then cross that same origin policy. So they're able to bypass the same origin policy and really create uh, a lot of um, attack vectors that, that a victim can, um, can, can essentially be, uh, be a victim to, that, that another website can essentially be a victim to. So the, um, I, I, let me just walk you through some of the options for the HTTP header for the X-Frame options. Um, so by default, this is not specified, right? So this is something that you actually have to opt in into. Okay, so this is not something that's actually default in the in the browsers. So if if you're not aware of this, uh, then again, you know you're you're kind of at the mercy of someone uh, being able to embed your website and then doing whatever they uh, they want at that point. Uh, then the next option, which is the option I suggest uh, that you set if you don't want it to be uh, iframed, is uh, the deny option, which is the one that we went over uh, in this um, in this uh, lesson. Uh, so what this pretty much does is it doesn't allow the page to be iframed. And then the, the other option, it's uh, let's say you do want the page to be iframed, let's say, uh, but that you only want it by the same origin. So only by other sites that live within the same origin, right? So that have the same um, protocol, host, and port. So only only by those uh, path the, do you want it to be uh, uh, be able to be iframable, then uh, set the same origin, uh, send, set the header to same origin. Um, and then at that point, then that, uh, that, that will at least, uh, if, if you do need it to be frameable, but you don't want it to be uh, susceptible, susceptible to, to some of these attacks uh, by anybody, then just set it to same origin. Okay, so now let's talk about cross-site scripting attacks. Now these are, um, again, these are way more dangerous. Uh, so I, I think you guys are gonna have a lot more fun. And this is something that, um, you know, we're gonna go over a few examples on how dangerous they can be if someone's able to um, execute one of these attacks. On, uh, on a victim and uh, I'll show you some examples and then some ways to defend against it as we've been doing throughout the throughout the course. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you a very simple uh, type of um, cross site scripting attack. And uh, I have, again, let's go over here to our bank and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, log in, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the very safe sounding um, URL called XSS. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this link. So, and then that's going to execute an attack for us. So as we can see, uh, if we look over here on the URL, the URL changed from source. Um, let me ch ch close this. Uh, the URL changed from source to, um, to the fact that we're running a, a script tag, you can almost tell. Uh, and through that script tag, uh, the user was able to get the, that person's uh, session ID. So again, this is a different way, and then over here it shows the um, the script that actually ran once they clicked on that link. So, you know, essentially, um, just like um, we we were looking at for uh, cookie hijacking uh, with the cross site scripting attack, there are two types. Uh, there's the reflected type, and then there's a stored type. But uh, all, all that means is the following. Let's let's go over this for for a, for a second. So, uh, as we were looking at for cross site script uh, cross site. Um, request forgery, uh, what happens is that, you know, th there is only so much that, uh, that an attacker can do once they're not executing uh, code on the user's behalf, right? So they have to get them to click a link or something. But if an attacker actually gets uh, to run and execute code on the actual user's browser, then um, it really opens up the user or the victim to a lot more uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, so what we found out is that, you know, when, when we weren't run, running code, we couldn't do these things, for example, like we, we couldn't cross the, the iframe boundary, right? So it became, uh, it, there, there's ways to mitigate those attacks. But again, attackers uh, have found different ways uh, to get to run JavaScript on, on the page uh, in different ways. And again, once you're running JavaScript on the page and you're not going through cross-site uh, cross uh, request forgery, then uh, kind of everything changes. And so let's let's talk about what is an XSS attack and uh, how does it work. So essentially it's the following. An attacker sends uh, the victim some some link, okay? Uh, now that victim clicks on the links and requests a legitimate website. The victim's browser loads the legitimate website but also executes a malicious script, okay? And that malicious script sends um, some victim data over to the attacker, right? 
So essentially all it is, is they're, they're getting to run some script on, uh, on your browser. So it's a code injection vulnerability uh, that's caused when an untrusted user data unexpectedly becomes code, right? Uh, and we're gonna go over again some of those examples. So any code that combines a common, um, you know, with used data is uh, susceptible. So anything that's, you know, user input, again, we've talked about how, um, how dangerous it is to kind of trust user input. Well, again, uh, in this type of attack, that's exactly what we're going to try to, um, to do. Uh, in cross-site scripting attacks, the unexpected code is JavaScript in an HTML document, or another way to, uh, for, for this to happen is uh, an SQL injection attack, which a user, uh, through a user input, some type of form, right? They're able to submit a form. That form uh, saves some code to a database, and then that database eventually gets, um, gets um, executed and then shown to the user, and then that code that was saved uh, gets sent to every client, right? So if the attacker gains some ability to do anything on the target, then uh, you know they're they're essentially going to be able to get full access to the browser, and then at that point they can view, extract cookies, they can send HTTP requests, they can pretty much do anything, and uh, it becomes really really uh, dangerous. Um, so yeah, we just saw session hijacking with uh, XSS. That's the attack that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, the attacker can insert their code into the web page. Uh, we saw it through the URL, but uh, really they can you know they can send a link, um, they can through a form. They can submit that form. That form gets uh, saved, and then I'm going to show you over here on the on the server that I'm running right now uh, through the request query resource. Um, if if when that form gets sent, so I'm I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, okay. So I want to take you now behind the scenes just so you can see kind of what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this, and uh, I'm going to go to the browser. And what you can see is that in the source. Uh, and again, this could come through a form. This can come through many ways, but essentially what's happening is that the, the, that over here, I'm just getting the source in the server and then I'm not, um, I, I'm not trying to defend against this attack at all. So the user can pretty much input anything they want. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve it, uh, directly into the page, right? So over here, I'm just serving that directly into the page. Uh, and then you can see it being executed. And then what I did is I showed, um, what the execution was. So essentially the, that, that attacker can send that information to their server uh, and pretty much do anything else that uh, that's possible through the browser. Now, let me show you the first defense against it. So the first thing that we can do to defend against it, it's uh, there, is, um, there is this great uh, package called HTML escape. So if we go ahead, okay, and uh, we come over here and I'm going to comment this out and then, so we're still gonna get the source, but now we're gonna uh, run it through the HTML escape function through that package, and then let's let's see what happens this time once uh, once we run that code. So okay, continue. Okay, let me just go ahead over here. So now we're back, and uh, let's click on that link again. So this time you saw that the alert was not uh, was not executed, so the code was not executed, and uh, we see that the actual uh, code that uh, that I ran actually just gets printed out as a regular string. So that's the first defense. And uh, I would say that, you know, if, if you're in the server code and you have any user input, um, go ahead and run it through an, uh, an H uh, HTML escape uh, function of some kind. There are many packages, uh, but again, look for a package that does this for you. Uh, that way you don't run into uh, any trouble. Okay. So let's see also, uh, I, I was, as I was making this, I was going through some of the, you know, I, I kind of wanted to get a, a feel for how prevalent are, um, you know, how prevalent are websites uh, to these type of attacks. And as of, um, you know, as of 2019, uh, this is still, you know, about almost half of websites on the internet have some type of cross-site scripting vulnerability uh, that can be, um, you know, that can be attacked. So again, this is, if you're a developer, uh, I would say this is probably your, your main concern, okay, when it comes to user input. Uh, anytime you have comments, uh, anytime you're, you know, you're letting the user input some data that you're later going to display back to, uh, to other users, then, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a place where you should, uh, be on the lookout for this. And, uh, here's some, so if you're thinking that, um, that a platform alone, uh, guards you from this. So, you know, we can see that infected websites, uh, by platform distribution as of 2018, uh, pretty much every platform is susceptible to this attacks, especially the ones that allow you to, um, to install plugins. If you don't know what that plugin is doing behind the scenes, you know, 
maybe you've implemented everything correctly, but now you've installed the plugin that uh, allows for this type of attack, and all of a sudden now you're vulnerable again. So again, uh, I would, you know, I, I, I would, um, anytime you have user input, I would try to control that uh, yourself, and then uh, that way you can guard against it. So again, why, why are these type of attacks so prevalent? Uh, why are they the most uh, prevalent essentially? Is that, you know, data can be used in many different contexts. So the internet, like we've spoken about before, is this platform that at the beginning was not so, um, not meant uh, to be used for what it's used today. So the web has many different languages, right? So even within HTML, there are at least five contexts to understand, right? There's JavaScript, there's CSS, there's data, there's links, there is, um, I mean, there, there's all these things that HTML has to somehow render. And uh, when, when we're asking so much of uh, the HTML parser, uh, it, it essentially, you know, and we're trying for, to accommodate all these languages and contexts, then um, it inevitably uh, we run into these vulnerabilities. So if you just make, and again, remember, all, all you gotta do is you gotta make one mistake somewhere, right? So just one vulnerability and essentially, uh, especially in big apps, and uh, at that point you can be completely compromised, right? So it's not, um, it's not like you need to, um, you know, it's you need to again. All you gotta do is make one mistake, right? And at that point, your your website becomes vulnerable. So, like I was uh, explaining to you before, also there are two types of uh, cross-site scripting attacks. The first one is reflected. The other one is stored. The main difference is that uh, reflected is essentially, um, uh, in a, yeah, the attacker is placed into the HTTP request itself. Uh, so the attacker's goal is to find a URL. So either they're gonna give you a link or you know, it, some link in some form or some place. And once you click on the link, then the attacker is going to try to perform that attack, just how we saw in the in the example. Now, the limitation of the attack is that the attack code must be added to the URL path or the query parameters, and also that the server has to be uh, vulnerable to these. Uh, to so they 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 must not escape HTML. So sometimes uh, when we're using, for example, if you're using any um any uh a templating language, for example, like EJS. Uh, over here, the EJS allows you to escape HTML, and then that, uh, at that point, we're not, uh, you know, if we use the equal sign, we're escaping it. If we use the minus sign, uh, we're not escaping it. So I know that, um, you know, templating languages that you're developing in probably have some uh, this feature itself beyond HTML escaping it. So, you know, th those are two ways um, that you should be on the lookout for in whatever templating language you're using. Um, the, the other type of... Uh, XSS attack is a stored type, right? So the attack code, at, uh, when it's stored, uh, essentially what the attacker is going to try to do is it's going to try to get uh, the code persisted into the database, right? So for example, let's say you have a comment box uh, on some, you know, on s somewhere on your site, you have maybe uh, some comments or testimonials or whatever, uh, and then once the user, you know, inputs their their comments, whoever goes to that page after um, later on, then all those comments are going to load. Now, if within those comments, one of them has one of these attacks, so if, if they were able to store um, some malicious code into this comment, then at that point, again, you become vulnerable or the website becomes vulnerable to the cross-site scripting attack. So again, the attacker's goal when it's uh, stored is use any means uh, necessary to get the attack code into the database. Once there, uh, the server includes it in all the pages into the clients, and at that point, you're pretty much uh, screwed. So yeah. So now let's talk about where, uh, besides reflected and stored, uh, let, let's talk about some of the places that you need to be on the lookout for that you might have not thought about before uh, whenever you're allowing for a user to, um, to, to, to input some data that you're later going to serve to other users, right? So first of all, I'm, I'm gonna show you in two ways. I'm gonna show you first the HTML templates, and then I'm gonna show you what are the ways to fix this. So if, let's say you have a website and you want a user to upload an avatar, or you're letting them upload an avatar yourself, uh, through a link, right? So again, if you have image source, avatar.png, and then e even an attribute, so the alt attribute, the user can input anything they want there, um, then that is a place where, and I'm gonna show you some examples now, where a user can uh, can essentially um, attack, right? So this, this is a, a, a user data here. So whenever you see that, whenever you're going to render some user data that they input and then you later uh, render out, that's a place where vulnerabilities can uh, can happen. Now, what, what are the another fix for this? If you're not HTML escaping, but even if you are, uh, instead of using single quotes, change all your single quotes to an APOS. So that changes it to, on the server side, it'll read as APOS, but once it gets rendered to the um, to the DOM, 
then the DOM will render it back correctly into a single quote or double quotes. Now, if you want to change your double quotes, uh, you change it to uh, ampersand Q U O T colon. Okay. And uh, that's the way, another way uh, that if you have user uh, user data to, uh, to defend against it. Now, what about HTML attributes uh, without codes, right? So again, we have the image uh, and the URL here. Now, let's, if, let's say we have, again, we're allowing a user in this example to maybe load an Im image themselves, right? Or maybe they have a comment box and in that comment box, you're allowing them to, um, to include images. Now, if you allow them to include images, uh, maybe you're saying, okay, I've, I've escaped the, 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 double, the, the single quote, right? So because we know that when they're using single quotes, then they can essentially include uh, something like JavaScript. Well, also, when the, the thing about ASML attributes is that ASML attributes don't necessarily, it's not necessary for you to include uh, single quotes in order to execute the ASML attribute. Uh, you can also include ASML attributes, and this is just, again, part of the ASML spec, as uh, without quotes. Now, the thing is that if you do it without quotes, then you can have no spaces. So as soon as you have a space, then it gets treated as another attribute. But if a user, for example, does this, like unload equals alert, um, parentheses, document.cookie, parentheses, that's valid HTML, and then that would also get run as, um, as, um, as code. And again, there, there is no defend, there's no defense, uh, as we were like seeing over here, that you can change all single quotes or double quotes into um, HTML escape characters. So, you know, over here, you're kind of, again, uh, in trouble, right? So unquoted attributes can be broken out um, out of, right? So even if you have, um, you know, attributes like this, then again, there, there are many ways that uh, attributes can be broken out when, uh, when the DOM is parsing these attributes. For example, here are just a few that can cause troubles and HTML will still try to parse the page. Um, but again, uh, the best defense against this is use um, an HTML escape uh, package or uh, or a platform that uh, does this for you, right? So again, beware of HTML attributes with, with special meanings. These are the most dangerous ones. Uh, for most attributes, escaping attributes is enough. Like we said, uh, if you use a package, uh, you're usually in the clear. If you're if you're allowing users to input something and and you're escaping that input, uh, you're usually in the clear. But again. Beware of certain attributes like source attributes and href attributes because these uh, carry a uh, heavier weight uh, when it comes to the DOM and the DOM, again, gives special meaning to these attributes. So let's say you have script source and then um, you have some user data there and uh, right that, that can never be saved even if you escape the attribute because you're essentially allowing uh, the user to, um, because they're using the script uh, tag and the source, at that point, you know, you're letting them load in uh, any random uh, JavaScript and uh, and then it'll just run in the browser. So if you're doing something like this, again, there's really no defense against this. Uh, you know, just, just be wary, you know, when you're doing this stuff, um, you know, ask yourself, is, is it really necessary uh, to load in an, ex an external uh, script? And if you do, uh, and if you do find that it is necessary, then uh, figure out, um, you know, go, go through that code and figure out uh, where it specifically through some of the stuff that we've learned about uh, in the class, uh, where specifically you might find some vulnerabilities, all right? So also watch out for data and JavaScript URLs. And um, maybe for some of you that have not seen that before, let me show you uh, what I mean by that. So there is this, um, and, and again, this is just part of the uh, HTML spec, but mo most people don't even know that this exists. Uh, you can essentially uh, write in, in, in a, a link, you know, that's valid HTML and call it data uh, colon text HTML and, uh, and then pass it, uh, some, uh, some H1. And then that actually will get, uh, parsed and, uh, rendered as a uh, regular HTML. And then let me just show you over here. So, um, you know, if I'm just going to open this in a new tab and, uh, as you can see over here, the, that URL is, doesn't start with www, right? Dub, dub, dub. It starts with data, and then what we're doing is we're, we're, we're essentially treating it like an HTML document, right? So we have data, text, HTML, uh, and then we, we're saying he, this is the HTML I want you to render. And again, we see that it gets rendered as regular HTML, right? So if someone gets you to, uh, if an attacker gets one of your users or a user to, uh, you know, uh, to click on a link and the link is structured in this way, then that, you know, that's a potential way to uh, execute some uh HTML data that yeah, you might have not even been aware of that uh, that was possible through the href tag, right? The other one, it's uh, it's a bit more um, bit more common. I know most of us are, are aware of this, but 
in the href tag, you can also include uh, JavaScript uh, as instead of a uh, dub dub dub. So again, you, you know, href is not just www. Uh, it'll you know HTML will recognize these and uh, actually execute them, and then uh, we can execute uh, any any JavaScript code. And it's at that point, again, you're pretty much on um, right. So I just I just ran I just clicked on a link, and that link opened up uh, a text box with the text high. But it, it, you know, you you can essentially um, with what we've learned about you know at this point you know the user is pretty much uh, you know screwed, and uh, if there is no defense against this then uh you know it, you can have uh, a leak or uh, or or anything at, at that point uh on your site okay so what are the data uh and javascript links against i just show you uh this is how they're formed so you know again just be aware of this whenever you're allowing someone to um to input uh a link uh on your site that you're later going to render uh so and then let's go over also some other uh dangerous scenarios right so let uh, a user choose a URL. So again, I'm going to go over three scenarios here that I, I again, if you're taking notes, I, I would say these are the, you know, writer downers, uh, write these down because um, anytime, you know, I, I usually have a checklist when I'm, you know, writing code uh, and I want to check for vulnerabilities. It's kind of having a, like a pilot when they have a checklist or like a pre-fight checklist. So before you deploy your code, you know, make sure you go over these things. Uh, again, it, it'll like, you know, serve you well. And remember, all you need is one, uh, one, uh, one mistake, and then you're pretty much uh, screwed. So anytime you let a user choose a URL, uh, get JavaScript. You know, essentially, you're allowing them to get JavaScript execution, right? So uh, anytime, you know, even if you're just allowing simple links, uh, you're saying, you know, yeah, but I'm not including. Uh, I'm, I, I don't let any JavaScript be, um, be included. So like any script tags, essentially, is what I'm talking about. Well, anytime they, they have access to even a link in the URL, they can. Um, they can essentially the href uh, attribute. Uh, then that's that means that they have access to the JavaScript execution uh, at that point. Uh, anytime you let uh, users obviously uh, iframe, right? So including an iframe uh, at that point, of course, they have uh, you know access to the JavaScript execution. Uh, and anytime you let obviously a user just uh, load uh, a script tag, uh, you know through the source attribute again, you've given them access to JavaScript execution. And then at that point, you are pretty much um, you screwed. So one last thing about attributes. Uh, so let now now we're gonna talk about different ways that uh, that again that you, you might have not thought of that are not just simple use cases. Uh, and again, remember attackers have all day to think about this. Okay, so you got to be aware that you know they're gonna come up with uh, interesting and uh, creative ways to bypass. Even um, you know, even things that the browsers uh, and the specs try to cover. But again, the, the web is just too big, and these things are uh, something that it's it's in every single one of us as developers to uh, to be on the lookout for. So let's say you have something like this on mouse over, and then you're executing some function, uh, and then within the handle hover uh, function, you're gonna have some user data there, right? So yeah, it, this could be whatever, right? So on mouse over, you want to show maybe an image, or you want to show whatever you know a, a chart, a anything. That's going to be uh, essentially uh, executed here. Well, if a user has uh, access to the user data here, what they can essentially do is right here. So what they can do here is they can finish the uh, function execution early with the semicolon and then close it, and then run another function um, with any type of JavaScript code, and then again uh, finish uh, the the string and uh, you know, at, at this point, I don't know if, if you're catching over here. So anytime you let user data, if they, um, you know, if they can escape, so th this essentially is going to be the user data. So this is where, where it ends over here. This is where it starts. So imagine if what they did is that they, this was their input, right? So their input is going to be the following, right? It's going to end with, it's going to start with, uh, it, it almost looks like a sad face, right? So close parentheses, semicolon, and then their, their JavaScript code. So when the DOM sees this, what the DOM is going to do, the DOM is essentially going to say, okay, so this is the end of the handle hover uh, function. Great, perfect. Then uh, this is another function, and the DOM is not going to know the difference, right? So the DOM is just going to then uh, execute this as regular JavaScript as if it was intended, simply because you allowed the user to have, um, again, user input at this point. So again, something to be aware of, okay? So th these are the little things that you need to just, you know, catch and, um, and try to run uh, certain scenarios before, uh, at least on, on places where you're allowing this user input. So again, here's another example. 
let's say you have something like this, right? So let's say on, uh, on your website, you have let username equals user data here. So their user, right? So you're allowing their user to pick their username. Again, completely normal uh, website behavior, right? And then what you're gonna do is you're going to render it out somehow, right? So it's gonna say hi there, and then you're gonna render out their username. Perfect, right? Sounds good, all good, no worries there, right? So what if the user does this, right? So what if the user, when they enter the username and then they store it? So again, these now we're talking about stored XSS. What they stored is the following. This is gonna be their input. Their input is not gonna be just a simple uh, name. Th this is gonna be their input right here. John, um, close, uh, the, close the quote, then a semicolon, and then they're going to uh, execute some JavaScript code. And, and again, once this gets run, this part over here, this part over here is going to get run like regular JavaScript, right? Because we are not escaping it and we are going to render it out to the page. So the DOM is going to say, hey, you know what? This uh, change, this after this um, closing of the, um, of the quotes and then the semicolon, that means that, that, that that's a valid variable. Anything after that, now that's just, again, regular JavaScript. And since we're executing JavaScript at this point, then it's going to treat it like JavaScript because again, we had an early, uh, we had an early uh, uh, execution of the JavaScript, uh, and then you know because of the malicious code, then uh, this this piece um, you know again allowed it to run uh, the JavaScript, and you know it's, it's it became a vulnerability. So again, what what are some of these fixes for this? I would say that the most obvious one is uh, use a package that will allow you to do HTML escape. Make sure you're using a platform that allows for this. But again, change all your single quotes to um, you, you should just write a function that changes. And, and again, there are packages for this, but if, if you're not gonna use a package and you wanna write it yourself, uh, at least do this, right? Change all your single quotes to uh, ampersand APOS uh, semicolon and change all your double quotes to uh, ampersand uh, QUOT uh, semicolon. And uh, again, that's that's at least um, mitigates uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities. Uh, let's go over another example. So again, uh, same thing on the top, right? So you're gonna allow uh, some username, you're gonna allow the user to, uh, to you know, just, uh, pick their username essentially, right? But then again, let's <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. So let let's let's say this is what they choose as as the, as their username, right? So what they're gonna do is they're gonna escape the JavaScript execution uh, for themselves, right? So they're gonna say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is my username. My within my username, they're gonna escape your uh, current running JavaScript execution, and then they're gonna create their own JavaScript execution uh, context and uh, and and then run it. And then at that point, start the JavaScript execution again, so yours can start again. So again, what happens? Then the DOM, what the DOM's going to see is gonna, DOM's going to say, okay, that that, you know, this is where we're finishing one JavaScript execution. Now we're starting a new one. So again, it's like loading a new JavaScript on um, code uh, from externally or internally. But again, they just did it themselves. And then they're going to go ahead and then continue your JavaScript execution to continue. So then there is no uh, from the DOM's perspective, there is no. Uh, essentially no syntax error or anything, right? So this is gonna run completely fine. And then when you render this, hi there username, then what, what's actually gonna get uh, executed is the, the alert document that cookie it becomes uh, a vulnerability, right? So what's the fix for this? So another fix uh, to, again, to um, bypass this, it's uh, again, there are libraries for this. So I, I suggest use a library, for, but I at least want you to know what the defenses are so you can uh, at least be aware of them, right? So you can hex encode your user data to produce a string uh, with characters from zero to nine and A through F um, included inside a JavaScript string. So anytime you have um, user input, that's a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript string, go ahead and hex uh, encode it. Uh, what you will then have to do is that you would then have to uh, decode it as well. But again, there are libraries that can do this for you that can automate all this. And uh, at least, you know, you don't have to worry about it and you're, you're, uh, you're at least uh, writing safe code when it comes to XSS uh, vulnerabilities, right? So again, uh, in, inside the string, you hex encode it, and then once you are going to actually uh, render it out, you hex decode it, and what that will do is um, it, it, it will turn all your uh, all your strings into valid and safe HTML, right? So go ahead and uh, that's another defense for this. And, uh, and one last thing, uh, for uh, fix for uh, script elements, there's this new HTML tag called template uh, tag to store data that won't visibly render. Uh, so you can use that and uh, the escaping rules again remember this uh, they're simple um, and the same for HTML elements just HTML encode uh, and then again look into it here's a here's a here's a a, a um, here's a, an example right so you, you you get the template right 
uh, username, HTML encode user data here. So essentially what this tag does for you is uh, it does the, the, the safety check for you. And then all you got to do is, uh, let's say you want to render out that username, you're going to go ahead and get a uh, document, like element by ID, you're going to get that element. And then all you do is uh, you get the text content from it. And because it's inside this uh, template, um, actually it's template, uh, this template uh, tag, then that will be uh, safe to then uh, do anything you need to do with that data, right? So e even if you're going to store that data later on in a um, in your server and then render it out again, uh, if it's coming from a template tag, uh, which later on gets um, gets sent to your server, then uh, then at least you know the template tag can um, can can shelter you from uh, some of these attacks. Okay. So, anyways, uh, I hope that was uh, that was helpful. Those were um, that's. That's what uh, cross-site scripting is. We're gonna go a little bit more into uh, detail here in a few more um, in, in the next uh, presentation. But uh, again, write these defenses down. Now you know what some of the attacks are. And uh, yeah, see you in the next one. All right, so now that we know a little bit about what XSS is and some of the attacks that are uh, possible with XSS, let's talk about some of the defenses for it. So the first thing is, um, you know, where where how, how can this happen right how can XSS happen that's kind of what we've been discussing but let, let's go over it just to recap a little bit so remember uh this can happen from http requests from the user right query parameters uh form fields headers cookies file uploads uh and this is mostly the reflected type uh it can also come from data from database uh this is the stored type of XSS. so remember those two types that we talked about so you know again if, if it's from a database and we're using forms to store some data that we're later going to render to a user you know who knows where that data uh how, how it got into the database and essentially it's you know if, if you're worried about security um which it should be of course uh then it's it's not okay to just trust that um you know just trust that nothing can, can go wrong right or to leave that responsibility uh completely 100 percent to the browser right so we we actually want to take some some steps um ourselves to mitigate some of that uh and also it can come from third-party services which i i think it's the most prevalent um so like let's say you install some extension or using some library you know anything like that uh, especially as a developer where we we're constantly using a lot of libraries just to build our applications one of those libraries can have uh, a vulnerability and it might not be in a malicious uh way like it could just have been there and and again like it, it's just maybe not fixed and you know did this this happens i don't want to say all the time but it's happened before um so again uh it can come from uh third-party services and um you know so even if the server gets hacked and you've done everything on your end but then you're loading some library in uh you know at that point you know your, your users and uh, and your website can uh can become uh vulnerable to access attacks so uh the first thing the first defense that we talked about is escaping right so most of the um you know um and, and like let, let's talk about this and when should we escape um the, the code base right so if let, let's say we want to sanitize some of this code base whether it's reflected or stored uh when when should we do it okay when, when should you be uh escaping uh these uh these things so the, the the best way to think about this and again like this is more like a philosophy uh more than anything it's always on the way out right at render time uh and and why so like let's say if if your application is small and you're the only one working on it that's perfect right but again e even then you could be loading um you could be loading third third party libraries so at that point um e even if you don't know that you're working within a team essentially you are right because you're, you're trusting all these other developers that you're loading their scripts in uh that their code is also safe so one way just to mitigate this and then just think about it from from here on out the same way it's just always sanitize it on the way out right as before you're about to render just assume every like an, anything could be compromised and then just uh do, do do it before you're about to render um that way you can just you know it's, it's a good philosophy to adopt uh and then i would say just get used to thinking in that way and uh it, it'll you know it will at least get you in the habit of um of a good security uh model uh for you to think of so the other thing is uh use the default that comes with whatever templating language uh you're using uh earlier we showed how you can do this in uh ejs uh but even in react pretty much every language uh or every platform or every templating platform uh it's gonna have a way to escape it right so an ejs template uh here with the equal sign we showed how um how you can escape it remember if you put the minus sign then at that point it'll run the code uh, so but again all the major libraries bring this um and and again just use that as well right um instead of actually you know maybe like creating your own way or just hacking it 
just if you're using a templating language, know that um, some of this is already built in and then that should give you some peace of mind. Um, let's continue on here. So uh, another philosophy that I want to impress upon you is that remember that that uh, the chart I showed you where as far as attacks are concerned, XSS is one that's pretty prevalent, right? So one of the things, um, you know, it's, it's just one of the most common uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and one of the things that we could uh, do, it's um, like, how can we defend our sites, um, you know, in, in the presence that XSS is, is, is as, as big a vulnerability now as it's ever been, right? So remember, with XSS, the attacker code is running on the same page as the user data, right? So at that point, it's kind of like, anything goes right so they have access to the cookies or their private data whatever as as, as long as an attacker is running code uh on the user's uh browser at that point like you know it's it's kind of game over so how can we prevent this knowing that you know like let's just go into it thinking like you know what this is probably going to happen but even if it happens what can we do to prevent this so the key idea here is um uh, a concept that's um that's known in security as defense in depth okay so it, instead of us focusing just on like one defense uh, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to apply multiple defenses so that way um you know if, if the attacker gets act one like access to something then they still have to like get past other defenses in order to um in, in order to um to execute the full attack right so now the attacker again has to like find multiple exploitable vulnerabilities uh and then this makes it harder at least you know you m mitigate the, the damage uh one example where you see this uh all the time uh and it's becoming more and more uh, popular is uh two-factor authentication right so let, let's say you uh forget your code or um your password or something and you're trying to log in um you can reset the password and let's say someone has access to your email uh, so they they'll, they'll be able to authenticate it and all that stuff, right? But then maybe they also need uh, to have access to your uh, to your phone, and uh, and then they're gonna send you a verification code that goes only to your mobile number, right? At that point, the attacker actually needs to have both of those things um, in order to uh, take over the identity and in order to um, to execute the attack correctly. So again, uh, that's um yeah, so that's the key idea right there with uh, defense defense in depth. Um, also, uh, let's talk about defending the user's cookie, right? So one way we talked about it's uh, so now that we that we have this concept, let's see how we can uh, we can apply it and layer these defenses on. So the first one is remember we talked about cookies. So one way to just defend against this is make it just HTTP only. So if you remember uh, back from earlier sessions, it that stops the attack that we're seeing uh, right over here. So the one I'm showing right here. So new image source, and then where the attacker is kind of sending the the cookies out. Um, you know, through through the image and essentially, um, um, like essentially exploiting that vulnerability. Then once you make it HTTP only, remember it won't be able to uh, get read as JavaScript, right? So that's that's the first defense that everybody should be using now that we know about this, right? And then that that mitigates a lot of session uh, session hijacking and things like that when it comes to identity on the web. The next one is content security policy, right? CSP. So CSP, this is a new header. So previously we talked about ways to tighten up same uh, origin policy. Uh, now what we want to talk about is in terms in which sites could um, post forms to our site or load images, scripts or styles from our site. Okay. All right. So let's talk about content security policy or CSP. Uh, this is a new header that I want to introduce you to. Whereas before, um, remember when we were doing uh, cross-site scripting, uh, we talked about the same origin policy in terms of which sites uh, could post forms to our site or load images, scripts, or styles from our site. So, you know, anytime uh, anything was coming from another site, we would prevent it from with the same site uh, header, if you remember that. Uh, that's preventing other sites, right, from making requests to our site. And that, that seems logical because um, if you remember, when someone can kind of load a script into our website, then that becomes vulnerable. But uh, CSP is actually the inverse, right? So what we're doing, what we're trying to do with CSP is prevent our site from making requests to other sites. Okay, so now it's this is from our site making requests to the outside. Uh, and you might ask yourself, like, why why would we want to do this, right? It kind of seems like a good idea that, like, let our site make any type of request. But remember, what we're trying to prevent here is with uh, uh, XSS attacks, what's happening is that someone has code running on a website um, already, right? So the attacker has gotten their code to run on a victim's website. And then at that point, they can make uh, external requests 
for example, and then leak uh, some data, right? So that's that's kind of where you want to prevent that, right? So I, I, when, when you're dealing with an XSS attack, you, that's why CSP comes into the picture, which is you want to prevent your own website into uh, making requests uh, to the outside uh, to to other to other websites, right? So that's that's kind of the the inverse of what we talked about with the same origin policy, right? So the, this is a new header, like I said, and it's called content security policy. You set it in the response, okay? To re, uh, and it allows what it allows you to do is it allows you to control the resources the page is allowed to load, right? So CSP blocks HTTP requests which should violate the policy. So in this case, you're the one setting the same origin policy, right? So since by default, um, your website can make requests out to kind of anything and load whatever you want it to load, right? So through script tags, style tags, whatever. Um, at, at this point with uh, CSP, it gives you some control over what resources do you want um, to, like if someone's trying to make a request, right? So if you're trying to load um, something from an external request, then you get to control that. So let, let's let's see how we can do that. So the goal here is, uh, let, let's say we, we say, hey, you know what? Uh, only allow request uh, to happen if they're to our own uh, origin, right? So like, let's say they're trying to leak some data out through uh, through this through this attack here, right? So they're gonna use, uh, they're gonna load an image and then through that image, then they're going to leak out the document.cookies, okay? Perfect. Um, so what we can do here is we can set the content security policy and the default SRC to self. So now, even if they're trying to make an external request uh, and leak out something, then uh, it, that that won't be allowed because that's uh, to a different origin, right? So instead of again working in reverse, where um, someone's making an external request uh, and trying to make um, the server um, serve something, this is coming from the inside, and then you're setting the policy and you're saying, hey, you know what? Uh, we, we don't want anyone to make external requests uh, if it's not to our own domain. Uh, another goal is uh, content that comes from our site plus the trusted subdomains, right? So like, let's say, for example, that you want to load, uh, I don't know, Google Analytics, right? So at that point, you, 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 know, you might want to say, okay, I have a lot of content that, yeah, that most of the resources come from me. But like, let's say you're using a CDN and you want to load stuff from the externally from the CDN because you're caching, or you want to load it in Google Analytics. Well, at that point, that's not the same origin. So how 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 do we fix uh, fix that with uh, CSP? Well, the way to fix that is um, you add a star and then you get to uh, add um, any um, trusted subdomains, right? So you get to have like a whitelist essentially of uh, of domains that you want to trust, right? Now, one thing I want to caution you before deploying CSP, it sounds great, right? And like, now we have this uh, way to mitigate uh, XSS attacks, uh, but now, again, we have a problem. So how do we figure out what the policy should be, right? Because like, at, at any point, um, it, it's very fragile, right? Like, what if we're missing something, right? Then at that point, we can, like, if you just apply uh, the policy right now, and like, let's say you had uh, Google Analytics running, then that will break your Google Analytics, right? That will break your CDN. So there are many things that you have to consider when applying CSP that uh, might make it fragile and might make it not worth the time, uh, although it does stop XSS attacks and, and it is a great policy. So what's the solution? So this, the solution is, there's there's a few solutions. So the first one is we can deploy it in report only mode, right? So that's again, another header called content security policy and then add uh, report only and then the policy. Uh, so what this would do is, it won't necessarily stop it, but what it will allow you to do is uh, it will allow you to get a report every time um, con like so an external request is being made. And then uh, at that point, you can decide what to do. So over time, what you will see is, you know, in instead of like making guesses in like in kind of a, in, in, in a vacuum, uh, this way, as you build up your report, your report will tell you all the external requests that are going out. And then this way you get to see what's, what's happening. And, um, and then that way you can make a, a pretty robust, uh, CSP, um, policy that actually covers your, your use case. So again, uh, now that's one way to detect, uh, XSS attacks. So how do we catch XSS attacks that are CSP blocks so we can fix the root issue, right? The solution is enable policy violation reports. So not just can you uh, enable it in report only mode, right? So, and this is the way to do it. Uh, you can put uh, the default source to self, okay? And then pass it in a URL or a URI that um, 
that the report can post to. Okay, and then this could be in your own server, and then you can save it to your database. Like this is what I would suggest. All you do at the beginning, and this is the way to set that um the the report only on your content security policy. Uh, you, you set the default to self, and then you give it a report URI, and uh, that's what you include in your response header. And then this way, uh, you will um, get a report every time, and then you can you know you can decide what to do with that report at that time. So if it's like Google Analytics, then you can add that to your whitelist, and um, and then there's no issues, right? Now um, here again, so C CSV is it's actually pretty in depth, and uh, it's pretty um, like involved. But uh, I, I just want to go over some of like we don't have time to go over every single one. But I just want to make you aware that like this is how complex the this is how like yeah complex the policy you can make it right. So you can make it as uh, unique as your use case is. Okay, so the default source um this is the kind of the default thing that serves as a fallback for for the other directives. So if you include none of the other directives and you just include default source, it'll kind of stop like, ev everything. You know. Uh, but there is also a connect source. Uh, this restricts sources from script interfaces, uh, font source. So if you're like, you know, if you're making a an, a request to load in fonts, uh, you can create a whitelist of fonts. The frame source. Uh, this restricts sources for, for nested browsing context. So iframes and things like that. The image source. Um, you know, if if you're making um, an image request to an ex to to an external site. Then that's um, you know you can set the policy to not allow that or allow that and uh, provide it a whitelist media source. So again, this is for audio and video. So you know again, it's like I said, it is pretty uh, involved. But uh, probably the most important one, it's this one, which is script source, and uh, this restricts sources uh, for script elements. Okay, uh, so that's you know again re read into CSP. Um, it's it's a great policy. It it is a way to stop XSS attacks, but it is kind of um. You know, it, it, it is kind of fragile in the sense that if you miss something, right, you can be breaking something inside that you didn't intend to and has nothing to do with XSS, right? Because it, it is so uh, restrictive, okay? Now, the other thing that um, that it does is that script SRC blocks inline scripts. So it doesn't just um, block someone from loading in uh, a script tag from the outside, right? And that's, that's kind of what we were expecting, but because uh, what it when this header was created, the the purpose was to um to stop XSS attacks. Then, if there is an inline JavaScript, okay, injected into the website, uh, by the mere fact that it's inline, then uh, script SRC, uh, this CSP policy would actually also block all inline scripts. Okay, um, so the better solution uh, for this would be to move the code instead of uh, writing it inline. Um, move it to you know to a file that's hosted on your site and then load it in that way. Uh, that way it doesn't get blocked just because it's inline. But again, this is something you have to know. Be aware of it. Uh, there's a lot of like gotchas and caveats when it comes to CSP. Um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, now because of all these caveats, uh, there are like you know and like since since this has been implemented, there's a lot of breaking changes. So a lot of people are sh shying away essentially from uh, using CSP. As a way to uh, to do it, but uh, but there there's a better way that that we can accomplish um, kind of the to to uh, to stop access attacks, but at the same time uh, make it dynamic enough so that like let's say we're trying to load uh, Google Analytics, right? But then Google Analytics has other scripts that it's loading from like let's say other servers that they have, but you didn't include that in your whitelist, right? So now again. It, you go back to the point that it's you know it's it's great when it works, but it's very fragile because you have to take into account all these edge cases, right? So it's like the question is then, is there a way that we can mitigate, okay, so that we can propagate? Um, once we say we we trust the domain, like anything that domain uh, loads, then we're gonna trust it as well, right? So it's it's kind of like a blanket statement. Once we say we're gonna trust one origin, then anything coming from that origin, you know, images, scripts, whatever, uh, we're gonna trust it as well, right? So um, it, this this allows us not to have to specify all of these whitelists and to uh, to not have all these edge cases. And uh, the, the way to do this is uh, on, after your script SRC, uh, you pass in uh, strict dynamic, and then you set a nonce. Okay, uh, and the nonce uh, essentially what it is is it's a dynamic value that you can set, and any script tag okay that uh, that you in include um, on your site later on that you're loading. As long as it has that nonce value, then uh, it'll be allowed. Okay, and then that that way, 
that that's that's kind of um that that kind of sets it so that you don't have to set the whitelist anymore right so no need to specify that uh the nonce like I, like i said it's a dynamic value so although right here in the example i'm showing nonce a b c one two three uh again like th this could be randomly generated and we've talked about how to like do secure random generation uh in previous uh lessons so if, if you forgot how to do that then go back but you can essentially generate a random nonce uh and then uh on the client side uh, any script that has that nonce um, would would get whitelisted um, implicitly, right? Like you, you you do not have to do it on the server side. Uh, all you have to do is uh, pass in strict dynamic, pass the nonce and the value of the nonce, and then on the client side, include that nonce with every script that you yourself want to um, allow. So if an attacker actually does get some code into the um, into the into a user website or into a user context. Uh, because the attacker won't know what that nonce is because it's been randomly generated and it's, you know, if you do that correctly, it'll be very uh, hard to brute force that and like guess that. Then uh, that way we, we kind of get, um, you know, we, we kind of get the best of both worlds. We can stop the XSS attacks while at the same time uh, not have to deal with all the edge cases that come with our CSP. Okay, so here I, I went ahead and look at uh, and, and got for you kind of a, a starting boilerplate. So if you, if you don't know where to start with a CSP, here's a here's a good policy uh, to start. But again, remember every use case is different. So uh, and yeah, of course with uh, with this course, uh, all the slides are included. But you know, so you don't need to just copy it; just get it from the slides. Uh, but this is a good starter. You know, this is a good uh, starter um, CSP header, and I say reasonable because I mean this is crazy, and it just gives you. It just kind of gives you an idea how like complex CSP is, uh, but this is a good one though. Like you know, this this is one you can uh, if if you don't know where to start, use this one, and then as uh, other edge cases um, arise, then deal with them then. Okay, but uh, this is a great one to um, to use uh, for yourself. So um, feature policy HTTP header. So um, so th there are other policy that um, which is uh, there's another header that you can set which is called feature policy. Uh, as as your response, so again, th this one's like not as um, th this one also stops XSS attacks, but it stops other type of attacks that I think are going to become more prevalent. Again, this one's pretty new, so I, I just want to make you aware of it. It's called feature policy. Look into it. Uh, but what it does is it selectively uh, disables browser features. Okay, so things like autoplay, geolocation, picture in picture, uh, vertical scroll. So these are things that, again, these are more in-depth attacks that can happen not be like with XSS. Uh, but again, this is like pretty nuanced. And again, if someone is, is doing this to your website, it's um, at that point, you know, maybe you should look into, uh, you know, just look into the feature policy header, okay? Because it's also pretty in-depth. But as new devices, um, more and more devices, right? IoT and things like that, you can imagine that uh, and as these devices are connected to the internet and as we want to provide uh, APIs, yeah, security is going to become kind of an issue. So we're, we're, we're kind of in this like middle point now. Okay. But at least I want to make you aware that these things do exist. Um, so again, what I, what I suggest is, uh, follow the links. I'm going to provide links, um, here under the video. So click on those links. It, it'll give you kind of, um, you know, a better understanding of like these more in-depth subjects. I, I suggest again, if you're getting into security that, you know, you become acquainted with this uh, because it's going to become more and more uh, useful. Again, if your company deals with security or if you want to start a company that deals with security, uh, like these are things you should know anyways. And uh, it allows you to, you know, create value for your users. And, you know, beyond being uh, just a developer, I think if you're going into like pen testing, um, yeah, these are things that are going to become uh, way more, uh, way more useful and uh, way more um important in the future. So final thoughts on XSS, um, just to wrap up here. So XSS vulnerabilities are pervasive in the real world. Okay. Uh, they're, you know, pr pretty much, um, w even with all these policies that we have, XSS is still a problem. There's still, you know, probably over half, uh, over 50% of websites on the internet have some type of XSS vulnerability. Uh, so again, it's still an issue. Um, but you know, th th these are like some ways that you can mitigate this and, Remember, as you layer these things on, um, you 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 increase your chances that uh, you won't become vulnerable to one of these attacks, right? So remember the philosophies that we talked about in depth, okay? Like layer your your security, uh, use more than one technique. That way, the um, that the attacker can't just like you know attack one vector. They have to go through many things in order to uh, gain access to you know and like make a system vulnerable.
Okay, be aware of the context you're including, uh, you're using data in. So if, if you do want to include, so for example, like let's say you're using React or Angular or something, uh, like be aware, okay, that someone can actually run JavaScript within those languages and it'll get rendered as JavaScript uh, simply because of the way that templating language is set up. And that's, again, that's the expected behavior that you do expect. But when we're thinking from a security standpoint, uh, just be aware, okay, that uh, someone can run JavaScript because it's already running JavaScript, right? So the templating language itself, although it looks like HTML, it's actually uh, like, for example, like if we're talking about JSX or something, which is uh, the React um, templating language, um, right? That That's JavaScript, okay? It looks like HTML, but it's not, it's, it's JavaScript. So again, just be aware of the context you're using uh, and you're including your user data in, right? And uh, and then one last thing, UCSP. Um, that that I think you know will will cover most of the use cases. It will um you know if if it's if an attacker is just phishing and just trying to uh, uh attack a wide range of for like websites that are vulnerable, at least yours you know will become harder and maybe they you know will just move away and uh, not not deal with it because you have all these things in place. Okay. Uh. So anyways, hope you like this uh this part of the course on XSS. I think it's super important. Again, because so many websites are vulnerable to this and it, it is hard to stop unless you know the defenses. Uh, now that you do, uh, use them and I think it'll put your, your site um, and your users uh, in a place that makes them a lot more, uh, more safe, okay? So anyways, hope you enjoy. See you in the next video. All right, so now we're at the end of the first part of the course and uh, we're gonna co cover uh, denial of service attacks, phishing attacks, and some final thoughts I wanna leave you before we finish the client side uh, part of web security. In the second part of the course, uh, what we're going to cover is the server side. But for now, um, you know, we've seen most of the attacks and most of the things that we need to be aware of when it comes to client side uh, web security. And then in the second part, we'll cover everything that we need to be aware of on the server side. So let's get into uh, denial of service and phishing. Um, I'm going to show you some examples. I think this will be a fun class. It, it'll be, uh, I'll try to keep it short uh, because I think we've already covered uh, some of the most important things. So let's get into it. The first thing I want to um, bring your attention to is tab nabbing. So I don't know if you ever heard of tab nabbing, but tab nabbing pretty much is, let's say you're on a forum or a message board or whatever, and uh, you know, an, an attacker posts a link. Now the link has this, um, this property that, uh, that says target blank. And um, I think uh, we saw this before, but if you don't remember, target blank is what allows you to open up a new tab, right? So an attacker, post this link, the link looks completely normal. Uh, that's not actually where the attack uh, takes place, but it has this property that says target blank and then the user, once they open it, they kind of go to this uh, to this other page. So let me just show you what the example is uh, first, and then I'm gonna explain to you how it is that, uh, that it happens. So let's open up that link. Okay, and let me close this. All right, so let's open up that link. And let me put this uh, full screen. And then I just want you to watch what's happening on the screen over here. All right, so they're gonna make a link and then they're just gonna post. So the link looks completely normal. Now here's the thing. So as you can see, they're on Reddit right now, okay? So now someone else is gonna come and click that link completely normal. Now, the thing is that Reddit doesn't want people to leave their site. So what Reddit will do for them is Reddit would actually open up a new, uh, open up a new tab for them, right? But now behind the scenes, okay? I don't know, if, like, let me just rewind this so like you're aware of uh, what's going on. So behind the scenes, if you look over here, this site is changing, okay? And now, let's pause it for a second. You see that instead of saying Reddit, there's like an added D to it. So they've actually, what they've done is, while the users on the other tab, they've, they had a reference to that other window, right? The Reddit window, right? So if, if you remember what we talked about, uh, once, once we open up a new, uh, link to a new tab, now we have a reference. It's like an iframe. Okay. So anytime we have a reference to another window, we can control that window. And what they've done is they changed the URL in that window to somewhere else. And now what they're doing is the user is trying to sign into Reddit, but of course this is not Reddit, right? So it says incorrect password. Now over here, we see that what's been going on is when they enter that information, that information went to the attacker server, right? And now the attacker has that user's username and password. And again, this is very tricky, right? This is this is actually very hard. I would say if, you know, like this is an attack that, uh, and I'm aware of the, the this, um, you know, like these type of attacks. And this is something that would be very hard to catch even for someone like me, right? So this is uh, this is what tab nabbing is. I just want to make you aware of it. 
it's a very difficult attack to catch uh but again it's out there and i just wanted to show it to you um so that you're aware and that we cover all our bases uh okay so let me move up here all right so again uh this is kind of how how the attack would take place so if you just want uh, to have the code as reference uh, we're pretty much opening up a new window and then we're checking if the parent location if if we're still on the same uh, If we're not on the parent uh, tab, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna change it And if we are uh, on it, then we're not gonna change it because we know that the victim now has been on our um, that, that the victim now is on our own uh, URL that we wanted them to uh, to be on anyways So that's uh that's tab nabbing. Okay, so that's that's a pretty crazy one and uh, it's pretty hard So there you go. So what what's the defense for this? So whenever um especially as, uh, as we're developing, uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, you can add a new uh, property to your link tags and uh, call rel. So the rel, uh, just set the rel to no open opener. Uh, and what this will do is well, this will allow all the links with the target blank to prevent, uh, to, to have that attack, okay? So it, it won't allow uh, anything, so it, it won't allow it essentially for that user to get a reference to that window, okay? So it won't be, uh, it won't be binded to the window, right? So the open window uh, sites uh, will be null, so there won't be any um, anything that that the attacker can use in order to to get um, access to that other tab, okay? And uh, there's also uh, kind of you know um, rumors of a new uh, HTTP header that uh, browsers want to include um, or introduce, and it's called cross origin uh, opener policy. Um, so again, I think you know we don't know when this is going to come online or if it is at all. But anyways, it's it's something that. Uh, um, browsers have been talking about including in the spec um, you know if it comes great if not you know it's just it's a hard attack and uh, yeah I just want to make you aware of it um, another thing I wanted to make you aware of it oh actually uh, I think I skipped over this so one of the things that I also want to talk about which is where we left off in the last uh, court in the last lecture is um, as we've seen throughout this course as as we want more and more uh, powerful browsers okay then uh, what what's what happens is that inevitably we have to uh, allow the browser to have uh, different levels to the API, right? So the browser is going to have access to a camera, for example, which at the beginning it wasn't that way, right? Uh, the browser can have access to your file system. The browser can have access to all these things uh, in the API. And uh, I wanted to show you kind of the levels of API and the levels, uh, the way they're divided up here is kind of uh, dependent on whether a like an attacker can just actually execute the attack without any intervention to all the way to level three where a prompt comes up on the browser so for example if you're trying to use a, a user's uh, camera a prompt will show up and say hey do you want uh do you want to access do you want to let the site uh, have access to your camera right so that's level three uh level zero are all the attacks that can be implemented or all the apis that okay so let's not call them attacks because these apis uh although they they can be abused that's not what they're meant for so, but you know, browsers have come to the realization that they do get, get abused. So depending on that, you know, they'll execute some type of prompt or it, it'll take some type of user behavior in order for that uh, part of the API to be, uh, to, to become active, right? So all level zero APIs are APIs that kind of have no restrictions, right? The API can be used immediately uh, without any uh, behavior kind of on the user side, right? So these are DOM, CSS, uh, window.move, uh, file download. So yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty crazy one, but, uh, uh, pretty much anyone um, can download a file without you uh, actually clicking on the download link. Uh, and there are good use cases for this, but anyways, uh, that it's it's part of a level zero API access. And uh, and the house uh, move uh, mouse cursor. This is also level zero, and it makes sense because uh, this this can be implemented just simply on CSS with the CSS property. But in any case, uh, if someone hides like the cursor mouse and then uh, other attacks can be implemented because uh, through JavaScript, they can, um, they can make a new cursor that looks like the old cursor, but it's not. It's being actually uh, controlled by JavaScript, right? And then that's, uh, that's a way that uh, an attack can be implemented. Uh, another, uh, the level one APIs, um, the user interaction is required. So the API cannot be uh, used uh, except in response to a user's activation. So example, like a click or a key press. So when you click on something, uh, you know, someone can allow for a prompt to happen or something, you know, once a user clicks on, on a link um, or on a button or something on a page, for example, then maybe we can load a, a video or maybe, for example, we can uh, give them access to the camera or anything like that, right? Uh, and some examples of these are uh, request full screen, uh, navigator.vibrate, um, 
copy text to clipboard, speech uh, synthesizer, uh, window.open. So all these are kind of, again, it's still pretty low level. So it's not like it takes an incredible amount of user interaction, right? It's not like a prompt is gonna show up in order for these APIs to, um, to become uh, active, but it still like at least requires that the user moves the mouse or does something, right? Like they, they need to actually interact with the page themselves uh, before the attack can uh, can even happen or before this API can can be engaged. Uh, level two on um, API levels, uh, it, yeah, level two access, uh, it's it's required that the user does engage uh, in a more meaningful way. So the API cannot be used until the user demonstrates high engagement, okay? And again, yeah, this is a moving target, uh, but yeah, they need to demonstrate some type of engagement with the website. So for example, autoplay sound, right? So now by default, uh, websites won't autoplay sound. So the user actually has to click on, um, you know, that they want the sound to be active, right? So that's, that's, that's a, although it's not a prompt, it, it's definitely a, um, th the user is explicitly saying, hey, I want this to happen, right? And at that point, yeah, uh, then the API becomes available. Uh, prompt to install a website uh, to the home screen. Uh, again, this is something that the user ha actually has to go out of their way, right? And say, yeah, I want this to happen, right? And these are level two uh, API access. And then level three, which uh, the user permission is definitely required. This is not just engagement, but the user has to, for example, click on a button and then a prompt to show up. And then they still have to say, yes, I want this to happen, right? So it's that kind of level of, uh, of um, interaction. And uh, the APIs that fall under this category are camera, microphone, geolocation, USB, uh, MIDI device access. So, you know, pretty much anything that has uh, like pretty low level access uh, to computer resources or things like that, that's kind of the level three uh, API access. So again, as we've been talking through uh, some of the attacks, I also wanted to, because I know we left off on in the last course um, talking about um, APIs and all, all the API uh, that are available through the browser. And we've been talking about that since the beginning of the class. So I kind of wanted to categorize them for you and show you kind of where they fall within, uh, within this uh, level uh, of categorization, okay? So now you have an idea. And again, I, I suggest, Go ahead and uh, read up on some of these uh, you know, documentation. I'm gonna put some links up as well, so you can uh, so you can actually get uh, a more in depth, um, you know, some more information on all this. Uh, the next thing I want to show you it's uh, this great paper. It's called uh, "Most Websites Don't Need to Vibrate," and uh, again, I, I I thought it was a pretty interesting paper. Uh, it was brought to my attention by a good friend of mine, but um, it's uh, it's a cost benefit approach to improving browser security. So again, the um, it's a paper that was brought in and they're, they're kind of analyzing whether, you know, are all these things pretty necessary, right? Like, do we need to have all these, uh, do we need to like allow the browser to have all these API level access in order to deliver a good experience on the web? And, uh, and if the answer is yes, then, you know, like where, how, how should we move forward with this? Right. And I think this is uh this is, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. But uh, it's something, especially if you're getting into security, I put a link up here uh, for you to check out this paper. Uh, but if yeah, if you're getting into security, uh, and especially web security, uh, re read this paper. It's a pretty interesting read. It's a good read. Uh, and I think you get a lot out of it. Um, and then I uh, one last thing I wanted to show you, which is a phishing example. So let's see here. So and and again, I, I, after this, I want to show you, um, I want to leave you with the final, some final thoughts uh, before we part. So this, this fishing example, again, this is like one of those things that's pretty hard to catch. So let me just play this video and see if you guys can, uh, can figure out what's going on here. All right. So a, a person comes to a page, okay, and now they're scrolling up and down. But you see, as soon as they scroll down, this URL, I don't know if you caught that, right? So they, they're first on this regular URL, and then it changes to a bank URL because they scroll down. So what the attacker is doing is they've kind of iframed uh, their their website within um, the user's uh, profile. And as they start scrolling, what then the attacker is gonna do behind the scenes is going to change the frame URL, but at the same time, it's gonna keep the, the uh, on, on top of that frame, the same, um, the same website that was there before. So from the user's perspective, visually, right? Uh, it looks like they have nothing's happened, right? But if we look at the URL up here, then uh, we can certainly see that the, now the user has been navigated to their banking URL. And of course, at this point, um, anything is fair game, you know, and we've already looked into some of the attacks that can happen uh, over here. But again, cookie hijacking, session hijacking, 
uh, cross-site scripting, uh, like, you know, can become a vulnerability at this point. And, you know, the, the attacker pretty much has, has full control. And at this point they can, uh, do almost anything. Okay. So again, I'm going to leave a link up for this. Uh, this is a great article. I think you should check it out. Um, but yeah, that's a phishing example. And, uh, it leads us to one last quote I want to leave you with for this part of the, uh, for this part of the course. And it goes like this, like, as we've been talking about, right? Security solutions. Um, and this is a quote by, uh, Bruce Shiner. Um, security solutions have a technological component. They do. And as we've seen, um, you know, that's kind of what we've been covering throughout all this, what the attacks look like, how they, they're implemented, what are the defenses we can, uh, we can execute against them to cover, uh, ourselves and our users. Uh, but essentially security is fundamentally a people problem, right? And that's, you know, specifically, um, especially phishing really showcases this, that at the end of the day, um, like, you know, anything can happen if, if an attacker can get access to, uh, not just a computer, right. But a user themselves, right. So it, it's people error that can sometimes cause the biggest, uh, vulnerabilities and not so much, um, the, the securities or the APIs that the browser might have or anything like that. Right. So if a person makes a mistake, uh, which usually it's what happens, that's where a lot of vulnerabilities are going to come in. And, you know, as you go further in your career as a pen tester and, uh, or as a developer, uh, it's important to keep that in mind, right? Users are, um, you know, users are, are, are not predictable. Okay. And no matter how, you know, much we want to make the web a safe place, the mere fact that, uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be users using the web and people using the web, uh, then, you know, vulnerabilities are always going to be, um, a, a presence. Okay. And, uh, I, I, it's, it's my, you know, it's, it's my belief that, uh, we shouldn't, you know, it's not that we shouldn't uh, work towards making a safer web. We should, but we should be very uh, careful to about how we think about this, right? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, if we lock our, if we put ourselves in a position where the web becomes this place where nothing can be trusted and, um, you know, we, we lose this ability to communicate and to communicate freely and to, um, share resources. And, you know, I think the web is only getting better as time goes on. Although, you know, you can see that it does bring, uh, with it its own caveats. Uh, I think the benefits far outweigh the, um, the, um, you know, any, any repercussions or any of the problems that we're seeing on the web. And again, that's just my belief. Uh, you know, anybody can have their own opinion. I, I just want to show you, and I just want to, you know, uh, show you from my perspective, what I think. And one more thing, uh, thank you so much for watching the course up to this point. I hope you've gotten uh, a good education. I hope you're, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know where you were at the beginning, but I hope by now you at least have a good grasp of some of the attacks that are the most prevalent that, that you should, uh, defend against. And now that you have uh, some of those skills, uh, I think the second part of the course, you're also going to love it, which we're going to cover uh, now all the server side part of web security. Okay. So thank you so much for uh, watching up to this point. Uh, please, you know, leave me some feedback. Uh, um, you know, if, if you have any, I'll try to come uh, back, update the course as I get some feedback. But uh, in any case, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you on the next uh, course. Take care. All right. In this lecture, let's uh, start going over uh, server side uh, attacks. Now, the first thing we want to go over is, uh, code injections, uh, specifically SQL injections. Now SQL injections are, um, very, uh, still just like XSS, uh, attacks. Uh, there's a lot of servers that are vulnerable to these type of, uh, attacks. And again, there's a lot of books and resources, uh, when it comes to, uh, SQL injections, SQL injections have been around since pretty much forever. Um, and pretty much what people, uh, have found out is that because of the way forms are, and we're not even talking about the web at this point. All we're talking about is clients and servers. Okay. Uh, now on the server side, because usually the way code is written and, uh, sometimes since it's not sanitized, remember we talked about, uh, about this in previous videos, uh, the same, uh, the server is kind of vulnerable to the same attacks that we were discussing previously on the, on the web client. Okay. Now the difference is that if you can execute or if an attacker can execute some type of code on the server side, um, there, it's a lot more dangerous because you actually do have access to the shell and to the terminal, right? Uh, because you're just already on the server. So there is not going to be, um, if an attacker be, if, if an attacker is able to execute code on the server, then at that point, there is not all the security features that the web has, right? Because, um, it's kind of implied that if you're writing code on the terminal or, um, on the shell, then at that point that you have access to that server. Okay. So again, that's kind of why, um, XSS, uh, attacks versus, um, code injection on the server side, which is like SQL queries. And, and again, remember this is stored. Um, this is the difference also between stored XSS 
and uh, and reflected XSS. Um, but in this uh, in this lecture, what we're going to be going over uh, the attacks are more when something gets uh, executed right on the server. Okay, so let me just show you something really quick. I'm going to come over here and uh, we're still working on the same server. Okay, I added uh, kind of a, a new script down here. And uh, all this, all this is going to do is it's going to concatenate uh, a file. So I've created a file over here that's just um, some lorem ipsum, nothing really special. So let's go ahead and see um, what happens when we output that file. So again, what we get, uh, it's uh, the echo back on the um, on the server, okay? And that's what we get on the terminal here. Now, as we can see here, we're just uh, doing this pretty naively. And what we are uh, doing is we're saying, hey, uh, whatever that um, as the second input, whatever we're getting as a second input, uh, then serve it. But let's go ahead and see, uh, let's say that the user input, remember we're, we've been talking about user input and um, the way we should think about it is that pretty much the user can input anything into any form, okay? And especially if there's a form or if there's something that's going to get sent to an endpoint on a server, then uh, we can expect that the user is always going to behave uh, as expected, okay? So we kind of have to define again all these things. So what I'm gonna do is imagine if a user put in not just file.txt, but then uh, they also typed in ls, okay? And then what we're gonna get now is actually output it, uh, the whole um, folder structure of the server. And that's, you know, that 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 could be uh, pretty detrimental because it's not just um, that they can do that, but they can do things like RMRF uh, and then delete the whole um, website, the whole database. Uh, let's also, let's just do something fun here. So if you really wanna freak people out, um, here's a good one, uh, say hello world. Um, hello world. So there you go. Um, and again, it spits out just, it, uh, it spits out the, the regular file.txt, uh, txt, but then um, the attacker uh, executed another command, okay? So this is kind of uh, what we wanna go over in this lecture, uh, these type of attacks that uh, are executed on the server side, okay? Now I'm gonna go ahead and um, close this, and then I'm gonna start up a server. So we're gonna go back to the client now, and uh, let's begin over here with, um, with this same type of attack, and let's see how it can affect uh, us on the browser side, okay? So if, if, like I said, what we're gonna do is the same thing here. Uh, and actually I want to, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, for now, let's go ahead and um, do the same thing, but we're going to send back to the user the output, okay? All right, uh, let me see, do I need to actually, yes, I'm gonna comment this out because then I'm gonna show you the defense against this. Uh, but first we're just gonna execute the attack now on the, uh, server side, I mean on the client side, okay? So let's go ahead and let's just start the node server. Perfect, and then let's go to, uh, let's go to this endpoint over here that I made. All right, so now we have a file viewer, okay? Uh, so let's say that um, we, we kind of have the same thing that we were doing before. Now the only difference is, so we're gonna get a, a query coming in on the file name. Uh, and then the standard out um, that we're gonna get is we're gonna get a, a child process and we're gonna execute that same command. So essentially, imagine that uh, the user is having this, uh, imagine we have uh, something like Dropbox or something, right? But we're doing this pretty naively. And then the way that uh, we, um, and then the way that we wrote that code on the server side was just to output uh, whatever the, um, whatever the file that the user uh, looks for, then we just wanna uh, give that a uh, file back to them, right? So we just wanna show them that file. So let's go ahead and do that and let's see what uh, what we get back. So I'm gonna put here file.txt and uh, what we should get is the same thing, right? So now again, it's just the same thing we're running on the server, but again, uh, now on the client side. I'm gonna refresh this and then let's see if we can actually access from the client all the server files, uh, and then see if that server actually outputs the whole uh, file structure. Instead of just doing ls, let's go ahead and uh, write on the file viewer um, with the flag r, so that way it's recursive. And let's see if we can actually get a whole file uh, structure. So like pretty much the whole buffer uh, should get filled out here. And there you go. That's kind of our whole application, right? So if someone can get access to this, uh, and again, you know, as, as far as we know, uh, there's still a lot of sites that are vulnerable to this type of attacks. And this is, you know, one of the best ways to check against this stuff is just knowing uh, what the SQL commands uh, that can be executed on that uh, server are. 
And you know, if you're a developer or if you're a pen uh, penetration tester, then these are the type of stuff that you need to be uh, guarding against, okay? So as you can tell, um, an attacker was able to execute a command on the client side and the server kind of gave them. So what we expected was a user just to put in uh, a file that they wanted back, right? But uh, again, since we allowed that user to just type in anything in the input, at that point, we're kind of um, opening up ourselves to all these type of attacks. And you know, an attacker now can see kind of our whole uh, directory structure. And again, if you have any uh, any files here, like a database or something, then the attacker can, at that point, know where your database is located. Knowing where your database is located can also uh, give the attacker then access to um, you know doing different types of attacks. So now they can target your database. They can target some information. And you know, again, it's just it's a it's an entry point, but it's an entry point that um, exposes uh, the um, the server to pretty much any other attack that the that the, the attacker can uh, can execute at that point. Okay. So all right. So now we have that. Now let's go to the bank application. Okay. And I'm going to. Oh, be now before we get uh before we move on to the to the next uh, exercise, I want to show you one last thing uh which is the defense for this. So what you want to do is uh one of the ways to defend against this, especially on the server side, it's um so let's see here. So we are going to we're gonna do the same thing, right? So instead of um child process and uh, executing it synchronously, what we're gonna do is we're gonna spawn sync. Okay, which is again on in every uh, single uh, in every language, this will be a different command. So just uh, figure out which one it is we're writing in JavaScript. So we're gonna spin up a new, uh, we're gonna spawn uh, up a new process, and we're gonna say, hey, we want to run these two things separately. Okay, on one end, we're gonna specify what it is that we want to run, so the command, and then on the other end, we want to say this is what you should run through that. Okay, uh, so again, now what we want to see is what what. How does this defense um, guard us against the attack? Okay, so let's try that same attack again. Okay, I'm gonna refresh it just to make sure, and then I'm gonna try the same attack. Okay, and now what we get back is cat file text uh, lsr uh, no such file or, or directory, right? So what are we doing? So we're saying, hey, this cat command is gonna get run, but then it's gonna concatenate kind of the whole thing. So you so you see what we're saying? We're getting a no uh, directory error because this whole thing gets uh, sanitized together, okay? So it's it's kind of saying, this thing called cat file.txt uh, lsr, that, that doesn't exist, okay? Because again, it really doesn't, because it's running uh, the two commands separately. So at this point, uh, then uh, we get the expected behavior, okay? And someone couldn't just um, string along uh, um, many commands and, um, and then execute uh, arbitrary code on our server. But still, if we just type in one uh, the expected uh, file.txt, then it'll spit out the correct output. And uh, that's exactly what we expect, okay? So again, this is just a way that someone couldn't just string along, right? So they couldn't terminate our process, and then after they terminate the process, then run another command, right? That's kind of what we want to guard against. And then um, that's that's kind of defense. So what we want to do is, again, uh, on, on JavaScript, is uh, we're going to spin up a new process. And then what we're going to do is, since we have two processes kind of running, we're gonna say on one end what the command is that we want to run, and then on the other end, kind of the files uh, where what the input is. Okay, and now in, in this case, we're getting the input yes from a form, but you can um, you can imagine this can come from anywhere. Okay, but uh, at least it um, it guards against uh, like I said, uh, being able to um, string along uh, many commands and then having the server naively just executing these commands. Uh, and again, it just exposes us to um, to a lot of vulnerabilities when someone can just execute arbitrary commands on the on the shell or the terminal. Okay, all right. So let's uh, let's move on. I'm gonna start the server on uh, port four thousand. Okay, let's leave it there. And now what we want to do is uh, I'm gonna we're gonna start up a uh, SQL light database. Okay, and now we are going to go over uh, SQL uh, attacks. Now. SQL attacks are uh, very similar to what we just um, what we just um, reviewed. Okay, so we've already seen again on the client side, we've already seen cross-site scripting attacks, and this is again very similar, simply because we're allowing a user to have input, and anytime we do that, again, we open up ourselves up to uh, these type of vulnerabilities. Okay, so you know it's not that user data can be trusted; it's just we have to guard against uh, the behavior that we want to see, and not just open up ourselves completely 
to uh, just running arbitrary code, okay? So the code that the interpreter processes is a mix of instru instructions written by the programmer and then the data supplied by the user, right? That's kind of how our programs work, right? It's some of it, it's uh, static, but then also some of it is dynamic. And uh, that's a good thing, right? We want dynamic websites because we do want um, to create those tailored experiences that everybody likes. Uh, we kind of want to have, um, you know, be able to create uh, websites that can be, um, can, can take in user input and based on that user input, you know, spit out different uh, outputs. But again, so, so our websites are a mix of, um, you know, these inputs that are static and then these inputs that are dynamic. Okay. So we just have to kind of deal with that. Um, now when the attacker supplies input, uh, that breaks out of, uh, the, the data context, that's kind of, uh, what gets us, uh, what gets, um, what can get us in trouble. Okay. It's, and that's usually how these attacks will happen, right? They'll, they'll try to break out of the, the context itself. Uh, and like you saw, they, they have to, um, for this example, uh, in this attack, what uh, what we did is we we terminated the process. So once we terminate that process, again we're kind of uh, going outside the scope, and uh, and then we're starting a new uh, a new command, right? So we're terminating one command and then uh, starting a new one, and that allows us to end the execution of one thing and then continue the execution of the next thing, right? So that's uh that's kind of how that attack is run. So again, the attacker input gets uh, interpreted as uh, as program instructions, right? So because we're we're, we're writing uh, directly to the server now, right? So this is uh, directly on the shell or, or the terminal. And uh, at this point, you know, any t anything that the data attacker can do, if it's not sanitized correctly, then it it will run. Okay, it will run on your terminal. It's just again, it's just a server. It's like being again at that point, it's uh it's complete access, right? Uh, and and this is normal. Like sometimes we do expect this behavior. If you're if you're um tunneling over SSH, then that's exactly what the behavior that you expect. But it's you know it's only when we we give access to the user input and then we, we're not getting the behavior that we expect um these are the attacks that we can uh, open up ourselves to if we don't sanitize uh, the code correctly so command injections the goal of, of these attacks usually are just to execute arbitrary commands on the host operating system via vulnerable application so again it could, this could be in, in the form of a form uh this could be we've seen it through xss attacks um again it's but that's kind of the goal okay so the command injection attacks are possible when an application uh, passes unsafe user supply data. So again, through forms, cookies, HTTP headers, anything uh, to the system shell, okay? And this could be even stored on uh, XSS, right? So if it's stored at some point and then uh, at some other point, it's going to get queried back, uh, but be, um, but it's gonna be processed first and foremost by the server, then um, given to the client. Then at that point, uh, when it's uh, actually uh, being uh, rendered and parsed by the, by the server, uh, at that point, it, it, it can become vulnerable, right? Uh, okay, so command injections. That's uh, kind of the, the what we just went over, right? This, this is the attack, and this is kind of the naive way of doing it, which is just, again, just run the whole thing as it comes in. And uh, although we're interpol interpolating here uh, this data, and we what we expect is the user to just, um, you know, put one file at a time, that is the expected behavior, we can see that they can obviously write as uh, as many commands as they feel like, uh, and and each process, and then call another process, and uh, there's really nothing uh, stopping them. So again, the way we the way we stop against those attacks is we're gonna spawn two two processes, and in one we're gonna specify the command that we wanna run, and the other the inputs, right? So now because we have these two things separately, we're gonna run one on one side, and then the other one, and then uh, kind of merge them. But we're not gonna merge them. Like we're not gonna run it all at once. We're gonna merge them, okay? Instead of running it all, all kind of like in uh in successions. So that's uh that's kind of the defense against that, okay? So SQL. Let's talk a little bit more about SQL uh, injections. Pretty much, this is um we're gonna write a query like this, okay? Again, it's pretty similar to what we just uh did. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite our um uh, our bank application that we've been working on. Um, we're gonna query it, okay? But now we're gonna be querying from a real database and we're gonna be using SQLite instead of the object databases that we've been uh, using. So I can showcase some of the attacks and how they can be performed. And uh, again, how to guard against some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, so let's say we have this type of code written in our server. Select all from the users table where username is username, right? That's kind of the template that we're gonna go with. And then we're going to uh, kind of show all the attacks against this template, how this one single line of SQL can become um can be um uh, become a, a vulnerability and a vector space for for attacks. Okay, and then we're gonna um, parse the results and then we're gonna return the results. Okay, uh, now let's let's go over a few examples and then we're gonna see it live. Right. So this is again this is the template that we're gonna be using. So let's say the user just inputs uh something regular right in the in the bank application. If you remember, let me go back to it. 
So now that we're in the bank application, again, we expect the user in this form just to input user and then uh, their password, right? That's kind of the expected behavior. So they can just put in John. Uh, and then again, we can see that this is working. Uh, let's just let's just log in into Alice's account for a minute. Um, and then we're gonna submit this. So everything is working uh, as before, right? So we can uh, we can log in, we can log out. Uh, and, and but the difference being is uh, now we've changed our um, our login endpoint uh, so that in order um, in, instead of uh, getting the username uh, from from this object that we created here, we actually created a um, an SQL database. Okay, so now we're actually going to be um, querying a real database. Okay, and then we're gonna see that the attacks that can happen once uh, we have stored our uh, data on this database. Right. So okay, let's go back. So now again, the, the expected input is just the, the username, right? And then from that username, we're just gonna say, hey, select from the users table that we just created, uh, the username that matches um, John, right? And then and then the database will return to us uh, kind of uh, that user, all right? Now, let's look at some of the things that we become vulnerable to. And again, this is, gonna, this is going to sound very similar to XSS, but now remember, this is kind of more uh, a stored approach and uh, these things can kind of um, be executed in real time as well. Okay, so now what happens if the user doesn't just put in John, but they put in John and then uh, the double quote, okay? So what's gonna happen is that um, this is one way to end an execute command, right? So this is one way that uh, that the attacker can end the process and then run extra commands after that uh, double quote. So, right, because it's, they're kind of, um, so at this point, if you remember, we're, in this template, this is the first uh, double quote. So then our code is gonna run here and then they're going to early terminate the process and then they can run kind of anything after this, okay? So that's kind of the vulnerability right there, right? So if we're just kind of have this template, it opens us up to a double quote uh, ending the, the process early and then running multiple attacks, um, multiple commands at the same time and then that's uh, this an attack vector that, um, that we have to guard against. So let's say, again, same template, right? But now they don't just put in uh, username John, they put John double quote and then I'll double dash. So in SQL, this is a comment, right? So what we're gonna say is, you know, anything after this, we kind of don't wanna look at it. Okay, so again, this is the, the way that we uh, tell um, in SQL, the way we write comments uh, is this. And, you know, we, we kind of saw some of this stuff in the, XSL, uh, in the XSS videos, okay? So the resulting query is gonna be something along these lines. Select from the users table where username equals John, double quote, and then um, a double dash, okay? And then the double dash it kind of uh, opens us up to uh, multiple, um, to multiple process being run at, uh, at the same time. So then let's look at a real uh, attack vector that can happen. So again, same template, right? But now what are we doing? So imagine this is the, the input that the user puts in. The username is John. Okay, early termination. So we see an early ter termination here. And then in SQL, they write or, so uh, if you don't find anything with uh, the name John, then uh, find something where it equals uh, one equals one. So it's, it's essentially like writing John or true. Right. So, of course, it's either going to find John if, if that exists or not. It doesn't really matter because the next um, the next command, it's or true. So it's like it's, it's like running a while true loop uh, loop on the on the client side. Right. So if we write on JavaScript a while loop that uh, that's just a true loop, then someone can uh, DDoS your server. Right. Because then that never terminates. Uh, this is kind of the same thing, but in SQL. Right. So it's going to say run. You know, try to find a user called John, and if you don't find it, then uh, then see if anything uh, is true. And then, of course, we're gonna pass it uh, the the value true, which is does one equal one, and of course that will always equal true. So then that will pass, and then we're gonna say uh, this is an SQL comment, so that way we don't have any other issues with um with terminating the process early, and then the resulting query from that uh from this input will be the following. Select from the user's name, anything that's John or something that equals true. And of course we passed it, that input ourselves. So of course it's gonna equal true. Okay, and then that uh, that way uh, we can see here that they don't even have to actually include the, the name. They can just put early termination or true and, uh, and then the comments. And of course one is always equal to one. Uh, so that's always true. So that will pass and then uh, it will, then they have kind of access to the database at that point um, as well, okay? And then let's see here, there's uh, another one. Um, so yeah, we'll go over this one, but let's let's try to see how this uh, attack works. So let me come over here and uh, let's let's try a few things. So first, let's try to just log in as, um, so remember, we, we have to type Alice. And again, if we input a wrong password, 
Okay, we're gonna get a fail. So everything is working as expected, okay? So now let's see what happens if we type in uh, Bob, early termination, uh, and then um, double dash, okay? So let's see here. And then I'm not gonna type in any password, okay? So we're just gonna submit this. And there you go, right? Now we are inside of uh, Bob's account, and we can kind of see, you know, kind of uh, their whole account, right? So at this point, they can do a transfer, they can do whatever they want, uh, but essentially they're, uh, they're inside, right? So at this point, you kind of screwed. Uh, so there you go. That's that's one attack, uh, and that's what we uh, that's what we were looking at before. Which is um, again, we wrote the username, right? Then we terminate it because of the way that uh, that uh, that this uh, query, it's uh, it's written. So I'm you know it's it's written uh, pretty naively, and uh, so I'm saying, hey, select from the users table where username is username. So whatever that username is, right? That uh, that they put in this form, that's what I wanted to match. Uh, and password equals whatever the password is, right? But we're never gonna get to we're never gonna get to this part of it, right? Because I'm gonna terminate it early in the in the attack, right? I, I did an early termination, and then I did a double dash. So I'm saying, hey, just ignore the rest, uh, right? Uh, and then that's kind of what I'm uh, the 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 query that's gonna be executed on the database itself. It's gonna say, hey, just find me something that's uh, called Bob, right? Uh, and then this rest of the query is not gonna run. So even though it's written on the server, uh, because of the way that the um, user input was written, then that's never going to run. So it doesn't matter that it's there on the server, and that's kind of what uh, what this attack is showcasing. Okay. Uh, now let's write the or attack. Okay. So now we saw that uh, we included Bob. So that's great. That's great if the uh, attacker knows the actual username. But what if they don't? Okay. C can they actually get into any uh, any uh, account? Well, this attack will show that they can. Okay. So now we're showing. Uh, you know what? Match whatever which is really nothing, okay? So match no username or one, right? So we don't even have to know the username. Let's see if we can get in uh, into the database at this point. Well, there you go. Now we're in Alice's account. So what it's gonna do actually, uh, if we, so because of the way this query is written, so when we do db.get, uh, the get command on uh, SQL returns kind of the first user. So again, that's just kind of uh, the draw of the luck, uh, essentially, um, but, you know, at this point, it's just going to return the, the first user, but still, we're able to get into a user's account without knowing even a username, right? That's pretty scary. Uh, but again, this is what happens uh, if we don't sanitize our um, our code correctly. Let's also, uh, so let's see that. Um, let's see if we can do something a little bit more uh, mischievous here. So now we're not even again, we're not going to input any username because we don't, we really don't know anyone in this uh, in this database. But we do know what we're interested in, right? So what are we interested in? Hey, let's see if uh, in this database, uh, try to find me anyone, right? So first and foremost, since we know it's going to ask for a username, we're saying find a username or, right? Or, I mean, we're not even gonna input anything. We're gonna do an early termination or an account that has a balance over you know, a certain number, okay? At, at this point, what we wanna do is we wanna enter an account that has um, a large balance, right? So large balance. So let's go ahead and submit that. And uh, all of a sudden, we are inside of uh, an account with uh, that has millions of dollars, and uh, you know the attacker at this point can just uh, start doing a transfer, and you're pretty much screwed, right? So this um, this server at this point is kind of uh, it's kind of screwed, and the attacker has owned it. Okay, uh, so again, you know that's uh, kind of running uh, arbitrary SQL commands on on the um, on the server. But uh, here's another thing. So let's let's try another attack here. So we're gonna do an early termination, okay? But then we're going to write uh, to the actual database. So imagine this. So imagine now we're gonna update the users table, okay? Update the users table and set the password uh, to root where the username equals Bob, right? So imagine if first and foremost where we're gonna find out, right? So imagine if we ran the previous command first and then we find out that uh, that uh, accounts uh, holder was named uh, Charlie. Okay, let's let's just figure that out, uh, and then we're gonna say, hey, we're that account because we already know that, right? So the attacker was able to get in; they were able to see the um, that they got another piece of data. Now, with that next piece of data, what they're gonna do is they're gonna update because now that they know that this server is vulnerable, then they're gonna update the server, right? Because now they they know they own the server. But imagine if the the user has this um, so imagine if the server has another vulnerability. So I'm gonna, which is the execute uh, vulnerability that I showed you for. And, uh, and again, there's no sanitiz uh, sanitization on it. So they're pretty much going to, let's say they have an audit um, log. So like they have some audit server, 
where pretty much they, uh, they're auditing all their SQL commands. So sometimes we do this just to figure out what are the functions that are running on uh, that are taking the longest. If you have, uh, you know, a lot of things like, especially like with machine learning and things like that, you want to optimize kind of those, um, those functions, right? So sometimes you just have an audit server and what that audit server does, it's, it's just kind of a uh, times when, uh, when a process starts and kind of when it finishes, right? And then that way you can kind of see, Hey, what's taking the longest. And uh, once you know that, then you can optimize it in any way that, that you see fit. Okay. Uh, or whatever, but it's just a way to see kind of, uh, either you need a new architecture or to optimize it, the function itself or any of those things. So this is, this is actually quite normal uh, just to have an audit server, especially uh, for bigger systems, right? So imagine that um, that this uh, command here, and uh, again, what we're gonna say is, hey, insert into the logs uh, database uh, the values uh, for login attempts. So anytime someone tries to uh, log in, uh, we want to have that uh, being logged into uh, the server that we're kind of like having as a um, as an audit server. Okay, and I'm I'm gonna go ahead and submit this. Okay, so we got a we got a um, we got an error, right? So we're not able to submit it. But let's see what ran on the server side. And on the server side, although we got a fail, right? So on the client side, and maybe the attacker knows this. So like the attacker is not necessarily interested in getting in at this point, but they're interested in in updating a record in one of the databases. Okay, so like I'm just trying to show you kind of what are the what are the some of the vulnerabilities and then how to defend against these attacks okay so that's the vulnerability the vulnerability in this case is that uh because of the way that the execution function is written over here uh we kind of have given um the attacker arbitrary uh, access to to our server okay now they can again just because we have access to one of the databases we can see that through there we gain access to the other database okay and then although we got to fill on the client side let's go back now Okay, and now uh, let's try to log in. Okay, now this time I saw uh, another as uh, that other user that we just changed our password. And now uh, let's uh, log in with the password that uh, we just changed it into. And let's see if we can uh, log in. All right, so now I'm just going to try to log in into this account um, with the new password that we just created, right? We just updated that table. So uh, let's see if we can get in. And there you go. Just like that, we were able to update that table. Um, and again, uh, remember the first command we ran uh got us access to the to the um account holders uh name and then once we had the account holders name uh we were able to change the um, the table to whatever password we wanted and uh at that point we were just able to get in right so that's uh again uh pretty um pretty vulnerable so that's uh those are sql injection attacks uh and then in the next lecture i'm going to show you the defenses against this how to sanitize them and uh, you know how to protect yourself uh, from these things because again, although it would suck for sure, especially if you have a bank application that uh, that someone can do this. But again, this can happen in any other um, in any other uh, type of uh, account. And uh, because again, as as more of our identities are uh, online, then uh, when when someone has access to one of our accounts, uh, it could potentially uh, open us up to them having access to many other accounts. Okay. Uh, and that's why, again, you want to use maybe a password manager. Uh, that's probably a great defense uh, because then, then the user won't be able to um, so easy, um, you know, get get into if, if they get into one account and maybe that account is vulnerable, then they won't be able to get into every other account. Right. So, and a password manager allows you to create um, really uh, protective passwords without you having to remember them all. OK, but even if you do. Um, but but let's say you're the developer. Then what I want to show you is I want to show you how to defense again, uh, defend yourself against these attacks and defend your users against these attacks because um many times again like this can happen for any number of reasons and it's not that uh maybe we have malicious users but this could even come uh sometimes as mistakes and things like that okay so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen uh because stuff like this can also happen and this could be a huge um like you know it's really hard to recover some sometimes uh this data if you don't have any backups or anything like that but you can just run this command and then drop the table users completely so i'm gonna run it uh on that and although it failed Let's uh let's see over here. So we just dropped that uh that users table. So as you can see, when uh when I open up my uh my SQL database now, if I try to see uh, how many tables I got, that uh that that users table that completely got dropped, right? So that completely got deleted, and uh that that sometimes can be even worse uh if you don't have a backup of uh, of your table. I'm gonna go ahead and also drop from within the client side um the logs table. Let's uh let's come over here. Yeah. So I'm so I'm gonna I'm gonna drop again the the logs table. And then just delete it, right? So an attacker can actually, um, you know, 
let's just submit this and then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, check over here so if we come back and uh, we refresh we see that now we have nothing in our database right so like it's been completely wiped out uh, so again that sucks uh, so if, if we open up ourselves you know we can see how like little by little uh, an attacker can um, from something very simple right like we were uh, like we started with from a file viewer right they can then just run uh, arbitrary commands so again let, let me just make it vulnerable again uh, because now we have uh, that defense, but imagine that uh, that it was written in this other manner where just it's not sanitized correctly and then uh, code is being allowed to run uh, arbitrarily, then the attacker can essentially um, get a whole, uh, get a full picture of uh, kind of, of of the server, right? That's kind of it, right? And then in here, we, we, we can probably see that there is a uh, file called DB, Right, uh, and then all these files, uh, and then they can just start uh, performing the db .file uh right here, right? So they can definitely see that we have uh, a database. And then after that, uh, we can see all the commands that they were able to run um, in this database from, again, from simple commands like getting into, um, well, I just dropped all the tables, so there's no users. Uh, let, me, uh, let me go ahead and, uh, and remove that. And then let's, uh, Let's restart the, the database. Okay, let's open it back up. And then we should see that in the, so now now we got our users back, okay? Uh, so we, we saw, you know, simple attacks from, again, now they the first attack, they were able to get access to a, a first piece of data, which is just kind of our whole uh, directory structure. Okay, uh, and then they're kind of able to just log in into arbitrary accounts without um, really knowing passwords at all. They can run uh, attacks that target uh, special accounts, uh, specific accounts that have a certain balance, uh, all these things, right? Like they can pretty much own our own whole server. Uh, so again, one way is again, you, you wanna have a, a password manager, you wanna have um, like sufficiently uh, double layered defenses. And I'm gonna show you in the next le uh, lecture how to guard against uh, these XQL commands on the server side uh, once an attacker can potentially uh, run uh, shell, uh, shell commands or terminal commands, all right? So that's, uh, that's gonna be important. So anyway, stick around and I'll see you in the next lecture.